I wish good things to you who's watching this. Deseo buenas co cosas buenas a ti que está viendo esta transmisión. Desejo cos cosas buenas a você que está assistindo essa transmissão. This is Copa America, the tournament, most anticipated tournament in the Western Hemisphere that will decide who the strongest country in the Americas is. We will have nine participants. That's Brazil, Chile, Colombia, United States, Guatemala, Cuba, and Argentina. And I must have missed somebody. Well, you can see all the flags on the thumbnail on the stream if you were starting. And I am your host, Alexei. We will be starting with the match between the two strongest teams, in my view, strongest teams, Chile and Brazil. They both have strong lineups and uh, rich history. Of course, I missed Mexico. How could I have missed Mexico and Guatemala? Did I say Guatemala? Yes, I did. Um, yeah. Of course, Mexico is also playing. Anyway, nine countries, <laughs> uh, one prize, and here's how it's gonna work. We will be watching the group stage now, all of the group stage matches. Every two hours there's gonna be a new match, so we'll be taking a half an hour break every one and a half hours. And tomorrow, at the same time, we're gonna start with the semi-finals and finals of the tournament. Hi KRC Games, hi Ash. Do let me know who you will be rooting for, whether it's gonna be Brazil or Chile, and who you will be rooting for in the tournament in general. So, the game will start in a couple of minutes. Uh, oh, Peru, of course, Peru is participating as well. Yeah, how could I possibly uh, forget. And here's the, how the format works. There are two groups in Group A. There's Cuba, USA, Guatemala, Argentina, and Mexico. And in Group B, there are uh, Chile, Brazil, Peru, and Colombia. So if you're in Group A, it should be a little bit harder to qualify for you. So this means that we're up for four rounds of the group stage, which means that we are here for like seven hours. So, uh, buckle up, buckle up. Hopefully you don't have any particular plans for tonight. That is all that I have to say. We will be starting in three minutes. Uh, now you can see the lineups for the Brazil versus uh, Chile match uh, on the right. So, some interesting things here. I've noticed, of course... The first duel, Claudio Jorquera versus Vinny Lessa. That's a pretty interesting one. Uh, both very experienced players, I think, rated above 600. Then Chile brought their absolute A game. Adan Lajeras, uh, Diego Acevedo, GDLK, who has been to the World Championship in Germany. Um, Vainiria, that's Jorimeya, who has also been to the World Championship in Germany. Uh, Tito Arce. So basically the five highest rated players in Chile, I think. Uh, some surprises in Brazil, some strong players not playing, and some newcomers. I don't think I've ever seen Kelvin Gabriel or, Fe or Felcera uh, Gradiado play before. So very, be, be very, I'll be very curious about how they are gonna do. Yeah, I see everybody is. <laughs> is uh, rooting for Brazil. Yes, my Spanish and Portuguese is still a work in progress. I uh... <laughs> Thanks for being honest, Edgar. Um, hi, Pichan. Hi, Ramses. Hi, Melvin. So I'm going to start with um, Vinny Lessa versus Claudio Jorquera. But if you... Um, find anything interesting uh, if there's a particular jewel that you want to follow then of course we can always do that instead all right 
Let me just open something up. Alrighty. Let's go. So many Brazilian flags in our chat. Do we have at least one Chilean? That would be nice. Anyway, Vinny. Huh. Yeah, there we go. I'm not sure if they're the captain this year. At the very least, the former captain, Vinny Lessa, is not playing just yet, but soon will be. Oh yeah, and the format of the matches themselves for... Uh, those of you who aren't familiar with these types of tournaments, it's basically the same as the World Cup of Carcassonne or the World Team Carcassonne Online Championships. And most of the rules are derived from the World Team Carcassonne Online Championships. It's going to be five on five matches, so five parallel one on one duels. Each duel is a best of three, and whichever team has more of their players win their respective duels, that team wins the match. Oh, thank you for clarifying. So, Kevin Gabriel and Felzera are both uh, for uh, from the Young Talents Project in Brazil. That's right. There is there is such a thing, and there is also Carcassonne in some schools in Brazil. So, this country is really taking this Carcassonne seriously. Let's see if it pays off in um, the result of this tournament. But I think it's also it doesn't matter if it pays off or not. It's just a wonderful thing in its own right. I was kind of thinking, like, the way how they have chess at school in our in countries like Armenia and Azerbaijan, and then now there is going to be Carcassonne in schools, like, uh, in countries like Brazil, maybe throughout South America, that would be nice. Right, so Vinyalese really refused to start playing. So we might as well start from a different duel. Okay, there we go. Hi, Mar Mauricio. Hi, Vika. And good to see that somebody's rooting for Chile as well. So it's going to be at the very least fair. Okay, finally, there we go. Vinalesa against Claudio Jorquera. Both players very high rated, above 600, very experienced. I assume we've played with each other a bunch of times. You do let me know how the sound is doing because I'm paranoid. So, Claudio with the green meeples is the first one to go, takes four points and the lead in this game. Vinny starts a new road. Claudio takes another four points. Sometimes the start of a game like this, your opponent draws two city caps and there's nothing that you can do about this. So, the player with the red meeples has some coming back to do. Now, they are most likely going to continue their road and drop a farmer, or indirectly continue their road and drop a farmer. Yeah, this is precisely the move that you expect from uh, South American Carcassonne, especially Brazilian Carcassonne players, these early farmers trying to drop one, two, three farmers, develop that field. Yeah, look at this. So, Vinny wants to continue his road and at the same time, uh, start a new city, and then, in all likelihood, probably he's going to drop a second farmer once he finishes that city. Let's see if that happens, but he's not finishing any cities, as Claudio Horquera has finished a third city for 14 points on the scoreboard, so not many city cap tiles for Vinny, just one. And he's trying to mitigate uh, this advantage of the Chilean player as far as possible. So look at this, Claudio is trying to start a new uh, a new city, restricting a red's field and bl and trying to block two meeples at once. But Vinny draws a fantastic tile, the best possible tile in the deck in this situation. Now this farmer looks very beautiful at nine points. Uh, Lindo Fazendeira as uh, Fazendeiro, as um, I'm pretty sure uh, Vinny is thinking to himself and now 13 points on the scoreboard completely equalized. Claudio does not get a very good tile so he started a new city over here but will Vinny be able to attack and yes he will. I do however have some doubts over this farmer over here. Uh, it does not seem to have 
a lot of potential for expansion unless of course Vinny gets a curve a curve and another curve and manages to expand his field like this and now it is absolutely his plan because look at what he's doing he is starting a new city in his own field and he also ex uh, plans to build a ring road like this score four points for this road and have these two farmers combined and have uh, total control of all the grasslands in this game hi Glovier, hi Elias Edgar is saying I hope someday Chile will have new young players yes I hope so too I mean Chile of course has many, many very good players but I've seen most <laughs> oh, I've seen most of them I've seen most of them already for a few years on the scene. Whereas just Brazil keeps having a regular influx of talent. So look at what Claudio is doing. Claudio is actually preventing the merging of the two fields. And I think his idea that it will make it easier for him to equalize and fight for the fields. Claudio now gets a fantastic tile, monastery tile, has to be meepled, of course. Soon he'll get a city tile, get his meepled back, plus five on the scoreboard for the play with the green meeples and two monasteries. It's a really, really substantial advantage here for the Chilean. And Vinny just keeps dropping farmers like they're not no tomorrow. I agree with him, but, 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 but... Uh, now that he has committed substantially on this field, maybe Claudio can win without really having to fight for this field. Because at the moment, okay, this farm is worth 12 points and it's controlled by two meeples. So it's really worth only six points per meeple. There is now one big monastery spot over here. And I believe if Claudio is the first one to draw the next monastery, this tile will go over here and this will be almost game over here for the player with the red meeples because it's very very hard to come back from a situation where your opponent has a lot of monasteries like these farmers have just not enough compensation in them at the moment and Claudia is very careful to not give Vinny any new squares because look at this there isn't really a good place to start a new city except for one place oh this is beautiful beautiful so look at this Vinny finds the only available free green square in the deck uh, not in the deck but in the whole field and drops a city cap doesn't meeple it because he doesn't have to because he knows because he knows that Claudio cannot meeple this city cap because Claudio does not have any uh, meeples himself and now Claudio is getting a bit impatient. I think it was not worth doing that. So you see, Claudio finished his road and he used this monastery tile to finish his road and get a meeple back. But he gave in return to his opponent so many green squares that I don't think it was simply worth the trade-off. I think really green here had to be patient and not finish his road, as counterintuitive as it may seem. So now, I think, with all these new green squares and an ironclad control on the field, well, Vinny has a lot of ways how he can uh, develop this field and maybe equalize these two monasteries eventually. Claudio now nine points ahead on the scoreboard. Vinny Lessa makes it seven by taking a two point road. Claudio now getting a great, lovely, lovely triple road tile with a city cap. Presumably, is going to go over here, start a new road, possibly going to opt for quick points instead. I quite like this move over here, uh, but he needs to, of course, be aware of the remaining tiles first and. Um, I just think a little bit more carefully where exactly to deploy this tile. Ooh, I like this move even better. This is really strong. I mean, this is beautiful. This is really strong. So first of all, start a new city. That's great. 
Then second, restricts the field sub substantially, taking the last green square available for simple cities. And third, pre-building a four-point road that sticks into his city. And given that there are two triple city tiles with a road available, Claudia Jorquera is waiting for payoff big time of six points like this. Two points for the city and four points for the road and a future potential to maybe finish that city. Alrighty, so Vinny Lesser draws a monastery tile in such a way that gives him eight immediate points and also a chance to even get this meeple back. And now it is Vinny who gets a city tile and he uses it to get his road meeple back instead of uh, using it as a city tile, which makes perfect sense. Now this uh, three-point city by Claudio does not look particularly appetizing. Vinny now gets a fantastic tile, splitter tile, gets four points for the city, three points for the land, pre-build the city that he's gonna use next. So this is looking good, but look at what Claudio is building upstairs. With this triple city tile, Vinny tried to block the city, but now it has developed into a six tile city, which will give um, Green a lot of points if it is successfully completed. All Claudio needs is draw one city cap. In the meantime, we have equalized on the scoreboard. Claudio is trying to harass Red City at the top and Cloud is the first one to draw the city cap. Not only does he finish the city, he also gets uh, 16 points on the scoreboard, gets a meeple back and I was going to say he creates a vulnerability next to Red's monastery but Vinny just in time drew the tile to get his monastery meeple back, does not meeple the city and now Claudio can actually do a world of hurt. He can basically meeple the city and try finishing it which is totally, totally doable given the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 2 Doritos still remaining uh, with 21 tiles still remaining and of course loads of triple city tiles still uh, 3 triple city tiles and 1 quadruple city still remaining in the deck so if you go over here, meeple the city, there's still plenty of ways to continue it and possibly even finish it an alternative that Claudio is considering is something like this but I'm not a huge fan of it uh, the, re the reason I'm not a huge fan of it is because this piece of city will remain up for grabs and if Vinny draws a Dorito, then Vinny will be sure to meeple this part of city. So that's why I'm a bit concerned about Claudia's move here. Again, very interesting. So will he will we see a quick point move for three points over here with his dagger tile? Or will Claudio go here and drop a farmer and try to connect to this little farm out from the outside like this, gaining uh, nine points for this little field in the future? Or will he do something else entirely? So in my mind, it's kind of really has to be one of the two moves. If Claudio thinks he's really ahead, then he can go over here simply to block the city completely so that neither of these two players get this. So, he does not drop a farm, right? It's quite interesting to me. I would, and you know why? Because there's still two road Doritos, which means that Vinny can draw a road Dorito and drop a farmer for six points and then try to connect to this field. I do think that Claudio's being a bit stingy with meeples. Now... Ah, Vinny has a tricky, tricky tile to play. So the problem is that he can't really meeple the city because it's not possible to finish the city. Well, it technically is. But uh, 
there are no regular Doritos remaining. It was very, very difficult. And wait, 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 wait. Claudio does not even bother finishing this shared city and dropping a farmer. He just takes three quick points. I think he is relying on his scoreboard lead to win this game. But look at this. A, the uh, Brazilian player is the first one to win the coin flip for this beautiful monastery in the center. Worth already eight points and very easy to get the meeple back. This is nine points in two moves. We're probably going to see. So... Now the Brazilian player is looking uh, more hopeful. Hmm. Claudia with a curve, still thinking. And rightfully so, I'm not really sure what we can do with this. Yeah, so he chooses to simply create a block and platform against Vinny's city. Vinny gets a fantastic tile, easy to continue his city. Claudio probably going to do some sort of blocking attack, which is not a very strong blocking attack, given that there's still one vanilla cap remaining and it will be possible to finish the city regardless. What else does Claudio do, though? Well, one thing that Claudio should do is uh, try and check the game situation. So now he is at plus 21. Ah, and he chooses to maybe fight for this big field. I don't think it's a real field fight. I think it's more of an attempt to... It's a much, much more... How do you say subtle move than one might think at first. By the way, Claudio wins the coin flip for the vanilla city cap, which of course Vinny would have loved over here. But I think the idea is this. So this farmer is happy to be there with three points, but... Huh. <laughs> well, this is an interesting move. So I think the idea of Claudio is something like this. If Vinny finishes his monastery, He's forced to let the green farmer into the field and then this will open the road for the second green farmer that will equalize all these field points. Okay, this is a mistake, I think. Because now what's going to happen... Uh... Claudio's idea of tying this field is neat, but I'm not sure if it's necessary to win him the game because now Vinny can go over here and make sure that no tiles fit into the square. This is exactly what this does. Excellent and very quick tile counting on the part of Bra the Bra Brazilian player. And now, if he wants, Vinny can finish this monastery guilt-free because he knows that this green meeple is not getting into the field. But the question is, is some other meeple getting into the field? And the answer is, I don't think so. I don't really see any good connection spot for any other green meeples. Well, it's possible to put something here and connect through the outside of a curve. But uh, this connection would be easily blockable as something can be put here to separate that connection. So Vinny finishes his monastery, puts a meeple on the road, and now this farmer is completely irrelevant because it is only one against two. Mob rule is the rule for farmers. 18 field points will go for Vinny, and now... Uh, mm -hmm. Now Vinny's in the lead. Yeah, Vinny's in the lead, and Claudio wasted two meeples for zero points. Well, of course, Vinny's not in the lead on the scoreboard, but Vinny is only minus 10, controls an 18-point field that puts him at plus 8, plus 4 for the road, that's plus 12, minus 1 in this city battle, that's plus 11, minus 7 because of the monastery, that's plus 4, uh, minus 3. No, I did something... Okay, I, yeah, 11, yeah, uh, plus 4, and then because of this, plus 1, and then because of this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, plus 8. So Vinny is now at plus 8, 
And Claudio managed to connect into the field. This is wow. He found the one way to connect that would get him blocked. And even though there were blocking tiles remaining, Vinny drew the one tile with which he could not accomplish a block. The one tile with which he couldn't accomplish a block. Wow. And then Vinny can't do anything. The best that he can do is like uh, score three points for the field. And I think this should put him at like minus four, something like this. Uh, no, minus seven, minus seven. Let's see if I was correct, but what an interesting idea here by Claudio. So first of all, I kind of had doubt in him as he was as he was uh, essentially burning two meeples. But again, as Vinny got a little bit greedy, and uh, rightfully so, or rightfully so, if I would say, trying to eat up this green meeple, this guy somehow found a way to sneak in through the outside of a curve against the odds. And it will be the Chilean player to win plus seven. So... Grab the counting rights. I'm doing my commentator's job. Uh, so, congratulations to Chile for the first little points. Let's see how this duel progresses. So one point for Claudio. How are we doing in the other games? Let's have a look real quick. So who else is playing GDLK? GDLK, ooh, won the first game with a one point difference. So that's interesting. Let's actually have a look at how they're doing against Mejuto. Well, now Fernando with the uh, Red Meeples is enjoying a massive scoreboard advantage. A Meeple advantage for the Chilean player. And now they use that Meeple advantage to drop a Farmer. This is looks like an interesting enough board for us to pay some attention to. Wait, it was GDLK who won the first one. I think I got that right. I'm not going to recheck right now. Yes, beautiful field connection indeed. I completely agree. I mean, has to... Like, if I were Vinny less in that last game, I have to be a bit salty about this, just simply because uh, it was... Yeah, just simply because Vinny was so close to the victory after having a difficult game. Uh, well, here... What are we having? GDLK is getting closer to Mejuto's point count and furthering his meeple lead as Fernando puts his last meeple in the city cap. Now, of course, gets his meeple back, more points. So what are we having here? Two farmers about to get tied together as the black farmer joins the red farmer or will join the red farmer as the red road meeple continues or finishes his road over here. We have two almost equal monasteries in very precarious positions. But if I'm not mistaken, this guy is completely blocked. There are no tiles that fit into this square because all the daggers have already been used out. Whereas this guy technically can still get out alive. So certainly black has the advantage here. And Red has a blocked city meeple for four points over here. That is a bit unfortunate if you're the player with the green meeples. If you're the player with the red meeples. Uh, and uh, this extra meeple advantage is used by GDLK in his attempt to attack and take over this big city ruin for about 12 points. What a move from Diego. Look at this. 
This is some mastery. So here's what happened with this curvy tile. Fernando threatened the blocking of the Black Monastery and the Black City at the same time. And now Diego made his Black City more vulnerable on purpose, but he did that simply so that he can guarantee or almost guarantee the completion of his monastery because he can now either continue this complete this monastery with two back-to-back -back road monasteries or with a straight line plus curve combination and neither of the mm, approaches are blockable one two three four five six seven there's still two curves remaining and uh one two well basically loads of straight lines remaining so GDLK actually will manage to complete this monastery in all likelihood. However, it looks like it is gonna cost him this city meeple because there is now only the one tile that fits into this square. And in fact, it will be quite easy for the player with the red meeples to finish this block. So um, this very often happens like that with blocking that you try to save one meeple, but then your other meeple gets blocked. Ooh, what a move from... Mejuto trying to block this connection instead of um, possibly connecting to the ruin himself. And I have to say, I rather like Mejuto's move because one, two, three, four, there are only, there's only one Dorito. No, there's actually zero Doritos with the road that left into the square. And the only tile remaining that fit into the square is a cow is a horse tile like this so the triple city with a road without a shield and now gdlk needs this tile in two places he needs it here and he needs it here and of course if and that's a big if gdlk draws this tile he will of course put it over here where it's going to be worth a lot of points which means that he will not put it over here which means that this meeple is indeed truly trapped so that's Excellent recognition here on Fernando's part. Diego now trying to draw some city caps, trying to get more points and get himself closer to the scoreboard. Mijuto being a bit impatient, I think, over here. I think he could have either completed the block or he could have placed this tall over here trying to get his meeple back like this, but he chose to play it safely. Uh, GD. Now, Drew, one of the curves, got his meeple back. So, this move that restricted the Black City had a payoff, after all. He was able to continue his monastery. Hi, Victor. Hi, Christian. I see we have more Chilean fans. Regardless whether you're rooting for Brazil or Chile, do meeple the like button on this video so that more people find out about Copa America and competitive Carcassonne in general. And in case you're here, subscribe to this channel for more content like this. It actually matters for the algorithm too and for the host's ego boost. That's an interesting move by Majuto and I have to say I rather like it. So the idea is that he wants to slightly protect this city from the block and at the same time he actually wants to protect the blocking square and here's the idea there's still one curve in the deck and if Mejuto draws that curve he will be able to put it over here and make sure that nothing fits into this square so this the prospect of these people are now not that great because Here's one of the two things can happen. Either Mejuto simply draws the one tile that fits into the square, in which case no luck for this black meeple, or uh, Diego draws the tile that fits over here, but before that Mejuto draws the last remaining curve and puts it over here. And what uh, Mejuto did over here, he made sure that this second scenario is at the very least possible. GDLK dropped a farmer for six points. No really prospects for that farmer because there's no tile that fits into this square. So it looks like this meeple is trying to join, but this will not be successful.
Well, Diego's thinking here. He decides to close up his ruin, which makes sense. And now Mejuto makes takes care of the block and sacrifices a boatload of points. So he chooses not to take four points over here, allow four points to his opponent, just for the sake of completing this block. And now there's no tile that fits into the square, no tile at all. And I'm thinking, is that going to be enough to win? And the answer is maybe. So GDLK choosing to score three points for the road instead of four for the sake of creating a blocking platform next to Red City. I mean, Reds, of course, will be unperturbed, probably go over here. Red won the coin flip anyway, so this block wasn't even necessary. But it's just Fernando trying to be clean. Okay. You can't be serious. Like, both players ha have blind spots on this road. Are they nervous or something? So, like, I can understand why Diego didn't take the upper road. He just wanted to take fewer points but create the blocking platform. And actually, it now worked because this red meeple is now trapped. So, well done, Diego. But why Fernando's not taking this four-point road is completely beyond me. Hi, Manarori. Maybe they are... I don't know, nervous. That's the only explanation that I see. Or maybe the Brazilian player has seen something that I don't. Well, now, of course, GDLK will score four points. And he does, but wait a second. Oh, yeah, yeah, there are no daggers remaining. So there are no tall that go into this square. And maybe now Mejuta noticed, oh, like... Yeah, so this mistake cost Mejuto not two points, but it actually cost him three points. Because not only did he sacrifice two points for the road, he also allowed GTLK to take a four-point road instead of a three-point road at the bottom. So a three-point mistake for the Brazilian. Let's see if that's going to cost them the game or not. I don't think that it should. Because he's slightly... Wait, no, he's not ahead. Uh, yes, he's slightly ahead. He's slightly ahead. Look at this. Minus two on the scoreboard, but eight points for minus two versus two points for, for the farmer. So this is like, this stuff cancels out. But he has four points for this block city, two points for this block city, that's six. And now this guy has only three points for the block city. So basically, at the moment... I think Mejuta will be winning because GDLK is now ahead, but Mejuta was able to s score quick points for the road. GDLK now with a beautiful 7-point monastery, but I don't think it's going to be enough. GDLK, oh, that's a, such a beautiful field connection. Not field connection, but city connection. I think now GDLK is again ahead and... And Mejuta will not be able... to score many points. The max that he can do is four over here. And I do not believe that this is enough. Wait, let me think. I don't remember. Is that a tie? Might be a tie. I wasn't quick enough. No, no, I think red might be at plus one. But like very dramatic events, events and both players played through this endgame so, so quickly. How can they calculate this quickly? Hi, Krish. I do think red's going to be at plus one. If I got this correctly. No, plus three after all. So I must have missed a couple of city points somewhere, somewhere or... Um, but... Wow, that's incredible. So both uh, very close games between Majuto and GDLK and both end up with the winner having 91 points. And uh, all of that thanks to, I would say, Fernando's precision. That was a lovely move, recognizing his small lead, blocking the square completely, making sure that Diego is not able to connect to the big ruin, and then just simply holding on to this tiny, tiny advantage despite all of the blocked meeples and having just cold-hearted, no, cold-hearted, uh, cold-blooded, something cold, basically, with no stress.
with no anxiety he was able to cruise through this endgame. Ah, this is an excellent point, Melvin. So he, so Mejuto chose, oh, that's lovely. He chose not to score a four-point road at the top because he wanted to avoid the situation where red goes over, or where black goes over here, drops a farmer and connects to the farm for 12 points, which actually would have given GDLK the win. Uh, so, well, or not really. It's, it's a bit complicated to calculate, but certainly there might have been spatial reasons, in which case I'm absolutely impressed at the speed of calculation of these players. So, let's now... Uh, update the results and actually have a look at their decider because it's just way, way, way too interesting to not follow that. But do let me go know somebody who can, how are other players doing? We will, of course, have a brief look at other players a little bit later. Whew. Wow, so this is something. Like, we just clicked on that. Players made loads of moves I wasn't be able to follow. There's 11 versus 6. This is like a typical South American Carcassonne game which, where things happen very fast on the board, both in terms of number of points and complete features and actual seconds spent. And unconventional move here from GDLK, which I rather like, actually. So he didn't use the city cap to finish his city, but instead he dropped a farmer and then pre-built a six or an eight point city with a Dor uh, so he's waiting for a Dorito basically with one of the 10 Doritos. Here comes the Dorito. Mejuto now equalizing this black city at the expense of the safety of his own, own road. So this point is now quite sensitive and Mejuto just keeps hammering onto this spot denied by GDLK who now unifies these two cities. Mejuto now drops a farmer, but I think that's a mistake. I think Mejuto needed to go over here and drop a farmer so that he also protects his road at the same time. And now GDLK, of course, takes advantage of that and makes it much harder for Mejuto to continue his road. So I think it was a bit of an oversight. And also, with this farmer, had the play with the Red Beeples placed the curve over here, Red could have pre-built a long road like this. And now, if the play with the Red Meeples even manages to draw the tile to continue his road, this road will be much, much shorter. So I do think it is an oversight on the part of the Brazilian, but let's see um, if he can still prevent the Chilean player from having an advantage. I do believe that the Chilean player is having an advantage, but Mejuto discards a Mamish, which I think is... Not brave enough, you gotta meeple monasteries if you ask me. As risky as they are. But maybe Mejuto wants to save meeples for something else. Diego with the starting tile, one of the first three starting tiles that Mejuto would have loved for this square. And he's now creating so many vulnerabilities. He's attacking this square, he's attacking this square and... Nothing much that uh, Mejuto can really do about that. So GDLK is starting a new city. Mejuto finds a lovely move, harassing this new city and at the same time indirectly protecting his city, making it much harder for GDLK to block this square. Oh, why no farmer? A farmer would have been fun. Yeah, honestly, like, why no farmer? I mean, why not? Like... I, th I think the reason why Mejuto didn't drop a farmer here is just because he played this move instantly. But like, if you think this through, and if you want to draw this tile, you can just put a farmer over here, and then once you draw this tile, you go over here and you connect two farmers with one move. I think that's an opportunity that was missed there by Fernando. Mm. Well, GDLK must be quite happy about that. They are now continuing their road in such a way that it will soon turn into an 8-point loop, just not yet. And of course, now, if you're GDLK, 
yeah, you're gonna pre-block this road. So even if Mejuto draws the starting tile, this road will be staring into nothingness and this meeple, this meeple over here will not see the light of day. So if Mejuto loses, this could be due to that meeple advantage. Now scores three points for the road and GDLK now uh, pre-builds his giant loop and at the same time, threatens the integrity of Mejuto's monastery, so just in time with this crossroad, uh, Mejuto is able to protect it. And when he draws one of the three remaining curves, he's going to go over here, score three for the ruins, three points for the road, nine points for the monastery, so he's not doing too bad for himself. GDLK continue his city, Fernando now faced with a dilemma, he chooses not to continue his own city at the bottom, but simply to prevent Diego from finishing the city, equalizes, I like this approach, just keep your opponent chasing, and Red can have patience, Red can wait for one of the many Doritos to go over here, and continue his city. Well, unfortunately for Fernando, GDLK is the first one to draw a Dorito. So now the stock of, of uh, Doritos in the deck is getting slightly depleted. It's probably going to go over here, maybe pointing upwards. Oh, he chooses not to do that. He chooses to protect his road. I think it's not worth doing that, but uh, uh, again, I'm not playing in the tournament, so he knows better. And in the meantime, Fernando draws one of the curves that I was talking about earlier, gets the extra 12 points on the scoreboard, and now Fernando's in the lead. Fernando also dr draws the next Dorito. So look at this. The patience with the city cap is being reward rewarded. The threat of completing this red city here at the bottom is quite huge, and... Diego will need to address the th this threat very soon. However, it is positioned in such a way that it is quite difficult to gain access to that city. Mejuto equalizes Diego's city. Diego now probably either going to take three quick points, which I rather like, or an alternative was to start and uh, create some attacking platform against this city. Mejuto now will probably go over here, block the city cap, or maybe he could also go over here, make it harder to attack this city. Now, uh, he actually chooses the move to block the city cap, recognizing that he is now in the slightly better position, so he wants to make sure that there is no variance on the board remaining, no easy four points that could be grabbed by the player with the black meeples, and now, Diego, what do we do, what do we do? He chooses to start a new city in such a way that creates a vulnerability next to Mejuto's city. So honestly, if you're Mejuto, a move that you could seriously consider is going over here. And what this does is that it's kind of restricts your own city. And it leaves you only two Doritos remaining. But it also starts to compromise the safety of this little city meeple by GDLK. Well, Mejuto draws the Dorito of the road anyway without the need to restrict himself and now with 44 points on the scoreboard and excellent demonstration of patience, he is now in the driver's seat for this game. Because, yeah, like seven points is an uncomfortable advantage. Because you can't really, I guess, okay, you can drop like a farmer for six points over here if you draw a curve. But this position is fairly close. There's not really a good way to score seven points. Well, I can see two monasteries still remaining. So maybe that's how. And maybe the idea is to somehow find a field connection and win this nine point field in the center. This field is fairly closed. However, there are still tiles that can allow a field connection. Mejuto's playing with fire here. I think the idea of him continuing his road is just not appropriate for this uh, part of the game. He needs to do something else. And if I were Mejuto, I would have started a new city, and I think this might cost the Brazilian player. However... Let's see what happens now. Diego now decides to use a splitter tile to separate the two cities, score the highest scoring city, and drop a farmer. And look at this. 
He also now created another field for nine points, and Majuta cannot drop a farmer there, and this is quite unfortunate for the Brazilian player. And what's he gonna do? I think maybe he could go over here and drop a farmer and try to connect like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's still one crossroads remaining, so it might be worth doing actually. Or he might go over here and drop a farmer like this. Basically trying to pre-connect to this farm in advance. It's a very, very tricky situation. But it's a well-known tactic. Oh yeah, so he goes for the farmer like this. This is nice. It's a strong move. GDLK now, of course, will go over here and drop a farmer for 9 points. And he will control 15 points in the field with just 2 meeples. That's... Are we going to see Diego turn this game around? I don't know, maybe. Oh, we're just saying to zoom out. Okay, okay I guess that was earlier. Because now I'm properly zoomed out. Alright, so both players are accomplishing their objectives. GDLK does drop the farmer where I am where I anticipated 15 point combo, but Red plays an 11 co point combo in response, drops a farmer, connects to the field, and actually even pre-finishes his road, and I believe there's still one starting tile remaining. And this meeple might actually see the light of day again, and he does that. He's gonna go over here and drop a farmer maybe even. So that's a way to score like 7 points instantly. Well, I would have dropped a farmer maybe just simply because uh, there are not enough moves remaining in the game. But yeah, plus 10 on the scoreboard for the Brazilian player. And uh, plus 5 overall and an extra meeple. I do believe that Fernando is going to pull the upset and believe who in, in my view is the strongest player in Chile. Although Jorim Meia might disagree. And possibly Claudio Jorquera. But if Mejuto manages to pull this off, then it will mean a lot for Team Brazil. So, GDLK with a Dorito tile. What does he do? He chooses to simply gain one point by connecting the two cities at the bottom. Mejuto now simply needs to hammer on point scoring. Probably gonna go over here, start a new city, at least this is what I see. I believe there's still city caps in stock, so he needs to create this threat. At the very least, to prevent his opponent from scoring points. And more importantly, he needs to use his time, calculate the number of remaining tiles. Four points is the lead of the play with the Red Meeple at the moment. Four points and an extra Meeple. He's gonna go over here, he's gonna be at plus eight. I don't think this real coming back from... Oh, he chooses to meeple a ruin, a five-point ruin instead. Okay. Well, what's GD gonna do? I think we might see some sort of farming move over here. Yes, look, he's gonna go over here, drop a farmer, then hope for vanilla city cap and finish a shared city for the sake of getting three points for this farmer and three points for this farmer. So this is a way to score six points for GD. Still, Mejuto now 9 points ahead, and what exactly does the Chilean player do with that? I'm not sure at all. So, GD. What are you going to do? Think. It's a good idea to think. I think what GD can do is to utilize the fact that there's still a road monster remaining. Maybe some sort of cunning combo. Like we go over here, drop a farmer, and then just pray that the next title is the monastery with the road, in which case we can go over here, score four points for the road, and sneak in a farm into the main field like this. That would be a 13-point sequence for the price of one meeple, and this actually could be enough to turn this game around. 
but is that the right time that is the question maybe it's not the right time just yet okay so he chooses to meeple a road okay okay this is interesting Actually, Mejuto can, you know, he, he can do this. Uh, he's he had a, had a plus, plus, plus five points. He can go here and meeple a farmer. That'll be a six point move. I think, again, maybe missing some chances, but sure. Oh, is GDLK giving up? Because he just meeples a monastery, but uh, uh -huh. there isn't really that he can do, all that much that he can do. I think Majuro has a winning sequence if he goes over here and drops a farmer, if I calculate this correctly. No, he chooses to do that in a different place. Yeah, and, and GDLK now draws a monastery. which he could have used to connect to this field. I don't know, it does seem to me that the Chilean gave up too early. Too early. GG saying Mejuta. And I have to say, he deserved this one. He was very precise. Of course, got himself into a bit of trouble with this blocked road, but later managed to find an excellent field connection and just the right tiles to not only finish the road, but win this nine-point field at the bottom. So this was an excellent way to deal with uh, the not-so-great tile draw for red that prevented red from meepling this nine-point field. So yes, congratulations to team brazil for this one let's see what the final score is only five points win from majuta i thought it was a little bit more i guess i forgot to count in that monastery point but oh check this out three games and in all three games the winner had 91 points in one of them it was gdlk and in the other two games it was majuta so congratulations to fernando let's quickly jump to other games So what's... Okay, so what's with Claudio? Claudio won 2-0 and the second one was very tight. Finished 11 minutes ago. How is... How are the others? Adan Las Eras. Oh, look at this. And this is where the Brazilian newcomer managed to defeat the um, experienced Chilean player. Nice. Oh, look at this. Uh, from the Young Talents program, already an expert. Certainly most impressive. That's a pity we didn't get a chance to view any of their games. But certainly unexpected. And how's the 2023 Mindsports Olympia champion Vineria doing. Well, Vineria indeed defeated 2-0. The other Brazilian young talent, so still experience wins here. And finally, Tito Arce. Yeah, and here experience wins again. So Chile, despite the valiant effort of the Brazilian newcomers, managed to defeat Brazil 3-2. Of course, very tight games, and uh, I think we managed to view the tightest ones. And we have to congratulate Chile. 
and wish best of luck to uh, the Brazilian fans in the future. Okay, now, I need to know which of this finished very quickly. There must be other matches which are still going on. So let's have a look at... Okay, so what's happening now is Cuba versus USA and Guatemala versus Argentina. Uh, certainly would be interesting to look at Cuba versus USA. Let's see if they're still playing. <laughs> I won't have the time to change the scoreboard, but let's have a look. Aha, uh -huh, so the captain or former captain of Team USA, I'm not sure who that is now, Mingo Requeet, r defeated Mercury Ring. What is... We need to watch something that's still going on. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's... I'm just gonna try... All the possible United States players. Unfortunately, I am not familiar with the Cubans ones just yet, so... Uh-huh. Admitted won his duel against Pharaoh CU, so that's 2-0 for the United States. What else is going on? Then... Sturgeon and Arab, right? Let's have a look. Third United States player also defeated the Cuban newcomer Yoni Stark, so that's already 3-0 for the United States, which means that the United States win their match against Cuba, but let's have a look at other results. And then again, looks like it's about to be a clean sweep for the United States as Turgeon defeats Do H C. And finally, ah, Wizard Chess, so that was the that's the reigning United States champion. And the reigning United States champion proved why they are like this. So a 5-0 win for the United States. Let's actually... <laughs> I was actually write this down just in case somebody is joining us. So what? So USA 5-0 versus Cuba. And then obviously Chile... 3-2 against Brazil. All right, so other matches. What's going on? We have Guatemala versus Argentina. So let's have a look at how they are doing. So Werner Bush is still playing. Finally, somebody who's still playing. Okay, so playing against uh, King Oscar of Guatemala. It is 1-1. They have the decider. So this is... Argentina, Guatemala, or as I like to call it, sideways Argentina, if we look at the flag. Or if uh, maybe Argentina is sideways Guatemala, depending on how you like to look at this. Okay. So, Werner Bush against uh, a Guatemalan player with the screen name King Oscar. Guatemala with the green meeples. And two extra points on the scoreboard. Verna with 12 points on the scoreboard and five red meeples. And this position now looks a bit more favorable from for Green, despite the fact that Green has this meeple blocked here for two points. And despite the fact that Red is now attacking a shared ruin and possibly is gonna win it. What I like here for Green is the fact that this monastery is about to get completed soon and it's worth like eight points and also this road looks pretty good like curve straight line road monasteries lots of point scoring potential for the player with the green meeples but verna draws a monastery to counter that beautiful five point monastery now really not that much what the what uh, the um green player can do other than continue his road Verna gets a road tile variety of options, could go over here to make the square more vulnerable, but this also makes his zone city more vulnerable, so that's a bit of a trade-off. 
And look at this, King Oscar immediately draws the tile. And I think he, she should be pull the six point road. The road is just too good. And then you get the road, you get a Dorito, you get an eight point loop, and he meeples the road and gets nine points on the scoreboard plus 11 for the Argentinian player. Vicky is asking, why are all the matches happening at the same time? Uh, the idea of all the matches happening at the same time is just so that we can cram all the matches in one day. But now that I think about this, I think... Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Note to organize it for future years. So you see, like, both Group A and Group B matches uh, started at 1600 UTC. It could be, I think, maybe better for everybody, for both the organizers and the spectators, if different groups started, started at staggered time. So let's say if one group starts at 1600, 1800, 2000 UTC, and another group starts at 1700, 1900, uh, 2100 UTC. Then, as spectators, we get non-stop actions, and organizers have more time to process the results from each round, instead of getting the influx of results um, basically before every single, um, after every single, uh, like in a, in a particular point in time. But back to the game, not much that has happened except for the fact that Werner quite wisely chose to use the shielded tile not for connecting the city, he figured he could do this later, but for simply making his little city less vulnerable and adding a couple of points over here. And um, this farmer looks a bit excessively ambitious and King Oscar now going very aggressive, neutralizing this guy and at the same time trying to take over this ruin with this guy and saying, you know what, 11 point lead is not enough. I don't care that you're the reigning champion of Argentina. I don't care that you've been to Germany to the world championship. I want to win this and I want to win this hard. Edgar is saying, first time Chile win <laughs> when Alexei is streaming. Really? Am I such a bad luck for Chile? <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, but this is not on purpose. Not on purpose at all. I have streamed plenty of matches of Chile, and was it really so that every case when I stream Chile loses? That's interesting. Well, anyway, both players are starting to play a little bit slower. I'm actually going to let uh, them continue their road at the top. Werner now draws a monastery tile. Use it as a monastery. Don't be afraid. Meeple it, meeple it, meeple it. Let's go, 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 go. Do it, do it. Yes. He's not afraid. He's going to get some of his meeples back eventually. There's a city cap at the bottom from from, where, from which he can get a meeple back. And no! What a big mistake here from King Oscar. That's the first mistake that we've seen. And Verna does not take advantage of that. This is crazy. Like, is everybody ignoring this? Green is about to take over the city. And Green doesn't matter creating a blocking platform for himself. And then Red does not care about using said blocking platform. And then Green... <laughs> It does not care about defending this. I mean... Both players are playing like there is no tomorrow. Like, this feature over here is so, so important. If green connect, this is basically a win for green. And Werner really can't do much because if he places it over here, he kind of has to place a meeple there. Because there's still one tile remaining that the green player can use to connect. And this means that the green player basically has a 50% chance of winning, if you ask me. Because if the green player connects, I mean, it's just too much. It's just too many points. Especially given the fact that he already has the lead on the scoreboard. King Oscar gets the tile that would have fit into that square. So he's not able to use that, but 
he's able to use that productively still blocking or making it much harder for for Werner to complete his city uh green now continues his own city Werner now probably going to finish his city at the bottom and hmm let me see i think there's still one tile that's left into the square i can see one dagger here one dagger here the third dagger still in the deck so let's see how the guatemalan player takes care of this threat of red still continuing his city not just yet as green draws a city cap adds another 10 points to his scoreboard to give him plus 12 lead Werner now decides not to defend that square instead to continue his monastery and king oscar now should go over here and block if i'm not mistaken yeah i do think that there's one tile still remaining there both players seem not to care about this let's see where this leads us as Werner finishes a four point city and gets a second meeple back comes a little bit closer now king oscar also gets a second meeple back probably going to start a new city as well plus 14 on the scoreboard for the play with the green meeples Vena draws a city cap well maybe it's time to farm the move that seems appealing to me is go over here score a nine point field in such a way that also leaves a city cap into in your field that allows to claim it later or you could also go over here and try to equalize this ruin but honestly at this point i don't think that red should red should probably hope that red draws this triple city tile because red really can't afford to spend a meeple over here he, he has just so much catching up to do on the scoreboard Werner decides to start a city in a different place as king oscar wins the coin flip for the tile that could have gone over here but won't so now this red meeple is permanently trapped king oscar with four extra points on the scoreboard and a meeple advantage and now Werner wins the coin flip so now this tile will not belong to green this meeple will not get connected to the city which means that the argentinian still has a chance king oscar possibly doesn't know it he just uh, makes a zero point move hoping to maybe finish the city later but of course this won't be possible as you and i all very well know Werner makes a hugely important move that gives me two points to the road and also gives this farmer some breathing room as this farmer is now controlling this city and this city for six points king oscar drops an excellent farmer for nine points and is still in the lead Werner now has to make a decision between getting a meeple back which he chooses or claiming the other nine point field so now King Oscar, will King Oscar get a tile that allows him to farm at the bottom? And he does. He should go over here and drop a nine point farmer. But will he notice this? Or will he do something else instead? He should not be afraid to drop his last meeple. This nine point field is too important, but he does not go over here. Instead, he makes a decent move spatially. He prevents Red from attacking this farm and, and at the same time he attacks Red City. But I do believe that the farmer was hugely important because now Werner is able to take that farmer for nine points and King Oscar has now some catching up to do. Well, he still is technically ahead on the scoreboard four points, but Werner has six extra points on the fields. Well, King Oscar's now got six points for the farmer. Could have gotten nine. I don't know why he chose six. Okay, good to know, Elias, that uh, my suggestion about the format of the tournament was noted. Maybe next year we can see something like that. Uh, thanks, Ali, for making... for. Uh, telling us that us versus cuba is finished okay so as Werner is thinking as he absolutely should probably he thinks about how to attack this field maybe from here from here from here so many options depending on the on the exact tiles remaining let's see how he navigates that problem i'm gonna zoom out just a little bit I'm going to put 0-0 zero, zero for now for Guatemala, Argentina.
then we will look up the actual score later. Okay, so Werner found a field attacking spot. Presumably there's a road tile still remaining. The Guatemalan player is now looking to do something about that field connection, but it's not really possible because there are two connections. So he can block it from one side, but there's still access from the other side. King Oscar gets a meeple back, very crucially. I mean, sorry, Werner gets a meeple back. And look at this, the double block. What a sequence here by the Guatemalan, preventing this farmer from getting a boatload of points. Is that it? I actually, I think that no matter what Werner does here, it will be in fact the Argent the Guatemalan player, not the Argentinian player who will be taking this down. By just a couple of points, because of this extra five point road over here. Still thinking. And deciding to take three points for the road, which I believe will be just, just short. This shared city scores 16 points for both sides and a little three point piece for King Oscar at the bottom. Three point road for Werner and now only the farmers remain. Six points for the farmer in the middle, nine for the farmer at the bottom for Werner. And many more points for King Oscar. And it was gonna be only a four point difference, I believe four point difference and the Guatemalan I have to say sensationally upsets the reigning champion of Argentina so everybody if you have Guatemalans in the chat do let us know if you're here you have to you're obliged to experience positive emotion because of this so for now I'm gonna put one zero for Guatemala and then we're gonna look at other games between Argentina and Guatemala So uh, let's have a look real quick. So that was Werner. Let's see how JNZR is doing. This is a very interesting screen name. I actually haven't played with that player before. And look at this. They already finished both of their games and they lost quite convincingly to Arlock 94. So already 2-0 for Guatemala. This is something. Again, I did not expect that, given that Argentina was by far the favorite, given their performance at the World Team Carcassonne Online Championships. They qualified for the playoffs last time. So Guatemala is really surprising. Okay, so uh, Lord Trooper from Argentina was playing against Lacos. Lacos, the captain of Guatemala, or I think the strongest player in Guatemala, at least considered to be. And here, actually, the Argentinian did win two against one, had to make a bit of a comeback, so uh, Argentina is getting at least a point, so it is 2-1 Guatemala versus Argentina, so who actually ended up winning it? So Academia 47 versus Dexter 99 Academia 47, one against Dexter 99. Again, two against one, so very tight duels. As we can see, it is the Guatemalan who won the first game. So it is 2-2. Two, two. Don't tell me who won the last one. We will find out that in due course. So 2-2 two, two, Guatemala versus Argentina.
Guatemala versus Argentina, and now Nico with a bunch of O's, 95. It's so inconvenient against Illusions. Wait, was that a win on time? I think there was a win on time. It is one versus zero. This means it's a win on time. So, Illusions won under mysterious circumstances. We'll find out that in a second. And, um... No, it's not a win on time. It's like a no shot. I don't know what that even is. That's so weird. Do let me know, somebody in the chat, what happens in this game. But in any case, the result is over and it is three against two. Guatemala pu pulls off a stunning upset against Argentina. We will have a brief look at that game in a second. We just want to review that and see what exactly happened there. But we do have, we had a fourth match going on. Wait. Oh, that's group A. Let's just have a look at... Schedule group B. Oh, results group B. So what do we have? No, that's too complicated. Oh yeah, so Colombia against Peru. Colombia against Peru was the was the fourth match. Uh, so Tinta Purora against Nari two one. So that's a point for. Colombia, Sedatrisa, 1 against 2 for Fleet Power. That's a point for Peru, so that's 1-1. One, one. Uh, I think... El Talivan of Colombia, 1 against Sparkle Horse, 2-0. That's actually the one against the strongest player in Peru. And... Nyosoryok, I'm not sure how exactly you pronounce that, one against RBVS, two versus zero. So it's in fact, I think four against one, no? No, three against two. Or is there something underway? Okay, I need to double check. There's still one game which I believe is underway. At least I can't see the result for that. And this is this Peruvian player. Oh, so thank you for specifying this. So it's a bit anticlimactic win for Guatemala as Illusions beat Nico by default due to a lost internet connection. So this is a bit unfortunate. Ah, so yeah, so we can see that Spakun won against Uela. So it is it was in fact close. So Colombia against Peru is three versus two not four versus one. So let's actually put that as well. Three versus two against Peru. So these are results convincing win for the United States and nail biters in all the other matches. So the next round starts in 43 minutes and I don't really want to make the break this long. I'd rather just maybe watch a game from one of the round one matches and just do a quick game analysis for those of you who are really, really into this. Uh, I will wait a minute. Do give me some game suggestions. Which games were interesting? Like, shall we look at one of the Guatemala-Argentina games? Shall we look at one of the Colombia Peru games? Or shall we look at somebody else from um, Chile versus Brazil? I would probably prefer looking at one of the nail biter matches. Oh, thanks for confirming, Ignacio. So actually, Nico's light went out and he couldn't play. This is as anticlimactic as it gets. Like, if you you have a power outage. And then you lose the match for the entire team. This is certainly unfortunate, but... Or you could say, you know, it's the same part of the luck. Because if Carcassonne involves luck... Like, you could get back tiles... Or you, you could get bad tiles, or you could get your power cut off. It's basically the same thing. At least, like, this is how I would process 
the unpleasant loss from a power outage. It's it's the same as, as if I were to draw bad tiles. This is also how I like process wherever something bad happens in life. Okay, drew a bad tile. Unless I drew a good tile and misplaced it. So then you start thinking. Was it the tiles or was it me? And then 90% you realize that it wasn't the tiles, it was you. Okay, that's um, too much of a tangent. The craft giraffe is saying, oh no, the games are over. Well, first of all, don't worry, the games are not over. There's still many, many rounds to follow as we are here for at least seven hours. <laughs> but I think I'll do a quick game analysis of... Let me pick just a Colombia versus Peru duel. And specifically, I want to look at how the strongest Colombian player was defeated. Okay, the highest rated Colombian player was defeated. Oh, look at this. So, oh, I played against them recently. Actually, very, very recently. Uh, so, they're playing against El Taliban, which actually is a Colombian player who is unfamiliar to me. And I'm just going to do a quick game review from the perspective of the winner. So for those of you who are just joining, we're just recapping round one encounter between uh, Sparkle Horsey and uh, El Taliban of Colombia. That, you could say, basically decided the fate of the match. But like, it was a three versus two win, so obviously any of the games could have been decisive. So far, natural moves. Well, some city caps for the Colombian player. Actually, let me add this. <clears throat> and Sparkle Horse starts a new city, and El Taliban also starts a new city. Both players making natural moves, trying to build efficiently. <laughs> yes, grabbing a, new, a few snacks is a great, great idea. Yeah, both players making natural moves so far. Sparkle Horse managed to finish the road and Il Taliban managed to finish yet another beautiful city. So advantage here for the Colombian player as Sparkle Horse tries to start a new road on the right at the same time restricting his opponent's city and Il Taliban responds in kind. Also, when you're playing against higher rated opponents and if you don't know what to do, you just gotta copy your opponent. Your opponent tries to block you, you block him. Your opponent tries to build a city, you build a city. Very easy. Sparkle Horsey continues his city and unfortunate tile for the play with the blue meeples as he's forced to add extra points to red because there was no other legal place for this quadruple city tile. Sparkle Horse now gets a triangle and I'm very interesting move. Can't say I'm a huge fan of it. I actually prefer going with a triangle over here and then like maintaining the threat of getting triangle, triple city, triangle, triangle. Like basically trying to create the threat of completing a gigantic city or um, at, or at the very least create the threat of doing so and force some concessions and awkward moves out of your opponent. Instead, Sparkle Horsey here goes for a different idea, but I think this idea doesn't work that often given that there is a boatload of tiles that still fit into this vulnerable, or sort of kind of vulnerable square. El Taliban attacks the city, now defends his city, and look what happens. Now Sparkle Horsey here with a very, very vulnerable cities. Like, it's super awkward, actually. Because as soon as he adds something over here, this square becomes vulnerable. Or as soon as he adds something on the right, this square will become vulnerable over here. Uh -huh, I see Colombian flags in the chat. By the end of the tournament, I want to see the flags of every participating country.
El Taliban is starting a new city. At the same time, of course, attacking Sparkle Horsey over here. Oh, so this I think is a mistake kind of move that doesn't really do anything. I would have preferred starting a new road. So a bit of an imprecision for the play with the blue meeples. Sparkle Horsey continues his city and El Taliban starts a new road. Mm, not a fan of this farmer at all. I think it's a bit of a waste of a city cap. So... This is something that you see quite often at 500, 600 level plays, sometimes being a little bit less efficient with the tiles than they should. Also, now, I'm surprised that Red did not use this tile to accomplish something. At the very least, this tile could have gone over here to protect the city, or over here to um, attack this road and harass the city at the bottom. So, I think... Um, the Peruvian uh, has been showing a bit less precision than they normally were. Okay, that's... I think I zoomed out too far. And El Taliban was able to... Finish the row 12 points ahead on the scoreboard. Okay, Sparkle Horse starts a new monastery. El Taliban picks up the city points as they should hmm interesting move so sparkle here chooses to start in city in the field instead of gaining quick points at the top certainly makes sense now El Taliban continues their city of their own and also makes the city of red vulnerable if only blue draws one of the triple city tiles or the Doritos, they can put it over here and they can block this meeple completely. So both players drawing a lot of quick point tiles, getting quick points, except that it is the Colombian who is getting more of that transferred on his scoreboard. Sparkle Horse evades a block with the Dorito tile and El Talavan just calmly starts a new city. So this is what you should very often do. Just not engage in field fights and preserve a lead by gaining points elsewhere. Fantastic monastery tile for the play with the blue meeples. Sparkle Horse chooses not to drop a second Farmer simply finishes a city, wants to be efficient. El Taliban also finishes his city, which has been waiting there for quite some time. And look at this. The horsey wants to draw two out of three Doritos and create the threat of finishing the city. So I actually rather like this move. It is a bit annoying to deal with. El Taliban connect, tries connecting to a field and now the horsey can immediately go over here, drop a farmer, and um, respond. Ooh, they respond differently, which is also very interesting. This is not what I would have done. Because they now allow Blue another invasion platform for the field. Still, all is not lost for the play with the Red Meeples, as they quite masterfully managed to block the entry point of blue. Blue is now trying to enter the field into it in a different way. The horsey is building up their city on the left and El Taliban manages to get their meeple back without giving a meeple back to red. The horsey, I think, Misses an opportunity. I would I would have placed the monastery over here for seven points or like or somewhere else. It seems that uh, they really really need the points to come back as El Taliban tries to fight for the ruin. So far successfully, 
drawing all the Doritos that Red needed for the city on the right, so the idea of finishing this city and jumping back into the game like this is no longer possible. As the horsey gets a beautiful curvy tile that allows him to get four points and nearly finish this monastery. Let's see what comes out of that. And with no shame whatsoever, the Colombian out of nowhere creates an even bigger ruin and tries to steal it. And it's actually very hard to block. And there's still four tiles that fit into this square. So that's a very nice spot here by the um, Colombian. As the Peruvian finishes this monastery but chooses not to drop uh, six points on the farm. With so few tiles remaining, I would have probably farmed this, but... I presume they had some sort of different idea. Oh, interesting move. So blue create puts this tile over here simply to prevent an opportunity of... Uh, simply to prevent red from having a connection platform because blue is anticipating that eventually he's going to draw one of the four tiles. The chances are astronomical that this is going to happen. Not astronomical, but like big enough. Okay, so the monastery goes in. Now, a good move for the play with the blue meeples would be to... Actually, there are several good moves. One, you could go over here, connect the farms, and try to gain a small majority on the farm over here. Or a second idea, you could go over here and protect your city connection. Leave three tiles that fit into that square. Let's see what blue does. Blue chooses to gain immediate benefits. And the horsey, of course, goes over here, tries to start a new city and at the same time make it so that there, there's only one tile that fits into this square. Well, well, well. And what is the play with the blue meeples going to do? They choose to meeple a monastery. I can always empathize with that. They they have no need of like doing something over here, creating a big field. No, no, they, they don't need that. They realize that they could have just enough points for winning and a lot of points if they get the tile that fit into this square. The horsey finishes a four-point city, gets a meeple back, and El Talivan would have connected to the city except it's a wrong tile so presumably we're going to see one of two moves either a field connection over here or a defensive move going over here preventing uh red from having a complete block actually i really like going over here as the play with the blue meeples because this will leave the square completely unblockable and you will maintain the 50 percent chance of drawing this tile drawing this triangle tile going over here and winning this big ruin and a boatload of points, and Red will be not able to do anything about this. Instead, he chooses a field connection, and wisely so. Maybe he knew that he was going to lose the coin for the Dorito tile anyway, as the horsey is the one to draw the Dorito tile. Gets one point for the city. El Talivan scores four quick points for the road. And those might have been actually essential for the game, given how close it was. The horsey drops a farmer. El Talivan makes something weird, which they... <laughs> I don't know. I think it's weird. Um, Like... It's a move that just blocks this city cap. I guess it prevents your opponent from scoring seven points, but it doesn't block this city cap. So if I'm gonna be the um, play with the blue meeples, I'm probably going over here to take four points and, uh, or maybe I'm going here and take four points. And then later I want to use this tile uh, like, use the square either as a field attacking platform or just leave it alone and then go over here and score a six point field myself. 
Ah, so the Peruvian chooses to gain a nine point field, which makes perfect sense, trying to connect over here. And El Taliban's probably going to claim a four point field, uh, no, no, a six point field at the bottom, which is exactly what they do. The horsey gets his field connection for nine points. El Talivam gets one extra point for the ruin, and this proves to be enough. So quite a back and forth in this game, but mostly we witness just the Colombian gaining an early lead with uh, cities and just simply staying away from big fights. Well, with the couple of exception, of course, we can we saw the Ruin on the left, but even with the Ruin on the left, the Colombian realized that they had so many points that they sort of just like gave up on that Ruin and they forced Red to try and spend tiles on blocking that Ruin. And uh, as a result, the Colombian kept it small and allowed the Peruvian to make the point difference a little bit smaller but in the end kept it plus two well quite an entertaining game i think it would have been nice to watch that live but at least we get a glimpse of what it was like to be team colombia in these moments again the result of the first round you see on the screen and now i will make a 20 minute break and during that i will set up everything for the second round and we will see each other a few minutes before the second round at let's say 1757 UTC so I'm gonna see you all in about 22 minutes
I wish good things to you who is still watching this. I'm Alexi and we are about to start round two of the group stage of Copa America. Uh, so round two, only two matches. USA versus Guatemala and Argentina versus Mexico. And the reason for the fact that there are going to be two matches is uh, very simple. Uh, there are four teams in uh, group B. So that's Chile, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, which means that only three matches are required. And in group A, there are five teams, which means that five rounds are required because uh, each team needs to play all the four other teams. Plus, there's uh, because of an odd number of teams, each team has one round to sit out. And in round two, only the group A teams will be playing. So we're going to have USA versus Guatemala. Both USA and Guatemala are now in the lead. Um, they won their respective round one encounters, as you can see from the standings on the screen. USA convincingly won against Cuba. And Guatemala narrowly won against Argentina due to a power outage in one of the players. So the score was tied 2-2 and then... Uh, one of the Argentinian players lost access to the internet and uh, the Guatemalan player got awarded the technical win. So luck in Carcassonne is not just about the tiles that you draw. It is about uh, <laughs> the um, access to electricity, I guess, as well. And uh, Argentina and Cuba lost the encounters and Mexico was the one to sit out. And we will see how Mexico gets into this tournament when they play against Argentina. Very strong lineup for Mexico and for Argentina as well. So uh, three interesting encounters. Marco Rivas of Mexico, who I think is in the hottest form against Fugaza from Argentina, who showed a strong performance at the World Team Carcassonne Online Championship 2023. Uh, Ale Rosario against Elias Mochan on table four. And we're going to start with, I think, the dessert. Mm. Santiago Iniguez with the screen name Santi Blader versus Daniel Ayala from Mexico, who, by the way, is, uh, I think... No, yeah, he was, for sure, the United States champion, because he lives in the United States, uh, in, like, two years ago, three years ago, I don't remember when exactly, I think it was two years ago. Let me just make my light slightly less bright, and then I'll be right back with you. Yeah, I think it's like it's a bit nicer when it's darker, because in Europe, where I am, we're approaching evening, and just want to make the atmosphere appropriate for my European viewers. Hi, Rene. Hi, Juxtapose. Uh, hi, Gabriel. So... Uh, and then Sidmo versus Big Nacho. The reason why I highlighted Big Nacho for Argentina is he showed a quite a strong performance reaching the playoffs of um, the Carcassonne Champions League. He was the Argentina player to represent Argentina in the Carcassonne Champions League last month. Um, and then Herchu versus P Chai 19. I think also quite an evenly matched pairing. We'll try to have a look at that. Um, soon enough whereas us versus guatemala i'll maybe we'll walk through the lineups a little bit later but the idea with us versus guatemala is that i think the us is going to be a favorite there however guatemala pulled one upset they might as well pull another one so i'm going to remove the standings the group standings from the screen and the thing the break thing and we're going to jump to santi blader versus daniel ayala Uh, Craft Giraffe is saying, wait, so in a few days time, two different Nikos lost on time due to connection problems. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Nico Vellemans lost uh, a in a friendly match uh, of Belgium versus Croatia, I think. No, Belgium versus Spain. That was Belgium versus Spain. Uh, the captain of Team Belgium due to a poor uh, internet connection. So yeah. Invest in a good internet provider, I guess. But, I mean, nobody's protected. So, Santi Blader. I also just realized that I might be I might accidentally have put a one-minute delay on the stream. I didn't intend to, but uh, 
in case I respond to your messages late, this is why. All right, so the players just started playing Daniel Ayala with the rating of 588. Uh, is the first player to move with the blue meeple start a juicy city and of course immediately sandy player with the red meeples equalizes that interestingly that um santiago has quite a low rating at 442 but at at some point i think he was above 700 that's a very very strong player so don't be mistaken maybe they're in rough shape i don't know maybe they're playing expansions of something not sure why their rating was this slow and also i believe that daniel ayala also had a higher rating as well possibly above 700 too so both players i'd say underrated and uh, that's still a very very even match i expect the tightest possible clash as both players exchange quick points sani blade with a uh, on the board with three road points as daniela ayala is also on the board with two road points so a city cap goes to the play with the red meeples And a city is being constructed in a relatively safe location, I would say. Oh wait, did I forget to get to get rid of the thing? Yeah, I forgot to get rid of the thing. There we go. <laughs> well, <laughs> what an extravagant move. I actually quite like this. So Daniel Ayala starting a new road, but starting a new road indirectly, intending to put a curve here later, and the purpose of this move was to create an attacking platform against the city. Didn't quite work out, as Sani Blader drew a tile to extend the city and now to finish the city. So the chasing around idea by Daniel is not going to quite work out, and Sani Blader will in fact gain his extra six points on the scoreboard. I presume he's going to finish the city unless he wants to get creative which he could, we never know. So, Sandy Blader still thinking now, finishing his city for six points. Nine versus two advantage, certainly the more favorable opening for the Argentinian. The North American gets two extra road points has a road open, has a city cap open, only a slight advantage for reds, and neither of the side has drawn a monastery just yet. Sani Blader equalizes the road, places a meeple on the right, and Daniel Ayala finishes his city, gets four points at the scoreboard, and starts a new one. And there we go, the first monastery of the game for Sani Blader. Uh, I can see there is a spot which is just designed for that. So this one, six points, so lovely. Six points and another monastery spot next to it. But if he wants to get creative, he might want to go over here with the purpose of eliminating um, another uh, monastery spot. He chooses the most lucrative location. I have to agree with the play with the red meeples here. Daniel, city cap move. Now, let's see how greedy you are. I, in this situation, I would never finish this city. I prefer either starting a new one with the city cap facing to the right, or we could also go over here and start two cities next to each other with the intent of blocking this square, and then maybe drawing a divider, getting eight points for the city, and then trapping this meeple of red. The problem with a move like this is that sometimes these two meeples get blocked and then <laughs> blue could lose the game and this happened to me in quite a famous game but what a move by daniel i'm loving it it's really really strong so it starts a city like a weird place but uh, this is quite a safe square because there's still many tiles that fit into that square. He's also looking forward to getting a city cap and then dropping a farmer. So he's pre-building a field. And most importantly, he's just putting a thorn into Sandy Blader's monastery. Because now, a regular monastery is not possible to use here. 
And then Sandy Blader now needs to draw a curve or a road monastery before he can even think about putting anything into these squares because if he puts something into this square, then this square gets blocked. Just excellent, excellent move by the Mexican. So as I told you, these both guys are underrated at the moment. Don't look at the elo just much. Sandy Blader with a Dorito tile goes to equalize blue city at the bottom plays the strongest move if you ask me daniel ayala presumably will use the monastery as a monastery over here seems a logical spot even though it's slightly vulnerable i wouldn't be too worried about this because blue could draw one of the six remaining crossroads and go over here and equalize this road but he chooses a different plan he chooses to take fewer points but in such a way that makes the city sort of kind of slightly safer and uh, also controls this city cap. So it's a double-edged move. I have to say I rather like it. But there is a problem that if red chooses to block the square and if red is successful, then blue will lose not one but two meeples. The good news for blue is that the loss of these two meeples is something that actually doesn't happen very often because... It looks vulnerable, but blocking is easy, easier said than done. If Santa Blader wants to block, there are two options. Otherwise, either Santa Blader has to put something over here, which is unappealing because this would mean giving a point to your opponent. Or Santa Blader would, Santa Blader would need to put something over here, which is also unappealing. <coughs> because, because, because... The, if you put something over here, this creates a block platform against this monastery. And Santa Blader choose to become, I would say, extremely creative. He wants he starts a new city and then he plans to draw a city tile with a road to block these two meeples at once and at the same time continue his own city, which is why Daniel is not gonna let him. He continues his city, continues his monastery, and is about to merge these two cities. Santa Blader now merges the city at the top, which makes, makes sense. It prevents the idea that I told uh, you earlier, right? The idea where blue draws a splitter tile, gets eight points for the city, and then blocks the red meeple. And now this tile makes sure that the fates of these two meeples are tied. Either they both Ba make back safely to their owner's hand or they stay trapped there forever. Interesting choice for Sandy Blader. So look at this. Daniel Ayala is starting another monastery. And now this one city cap is basically controlling these two monasteries. But Sandy Blader chooses to finish his city anyway just to have the immediate meeple advantage. And then, as a result, Daniel gets two extra points as compensation. And Daniel also now draws a crossroads and gets a meeple back from a four-point road and is the first one on the field. And also, this road by red is slightly vulnerable. So blue would have loved to have this tile, the one that, le that red has. Let's say if blue draws this tile, blue, of course, is looking forward to putting this over here and making it almost impossible for red to continue this road. But it is not Drew Blue who drew this tile, it is Red who drew this tile. And Red, of course, is going to use it differently. Red is now building up the city at the bottom, trying to make this square vulnerable, this square vulnerable. And the idea of Red is try to block at least one of these two monastery meeples. So Daniel, I presume, is going to go here with the city cap, just drop it empty uh, without a meeple because he he gets two monastery points he gets a, an empty city cap into his field and he, and if he's the first one to draw another city cap then he'll score points for the city points for the monastery points for the field all with one move it's certainly something he's hoping for now daniel here with a straight line has a choice could either continue his monastery like this or like this, or he could go over here 
and prevent Red from easily completing this road, but he chooses to do nothing. This cannot be correct. You don't ever discard a tile in Carcassonne. You have to do something with this. And this seems to be the natural, like if you're not gonna get the one monastery point that at the very least bother your opponent's road, because it takes away so many tiles. Like if you if you put the straight line over here, that you're making sure that your opponent cannot get a road end with a city or a road end with a city cap and or back to back curves. So I have to disagree here with the Mexican strongly. So now presumably we're gonna see a curve place like this, preparing to finish a monastery with another monastery. Or he might place the curve like this, simply hoping to get another road tile quickly and just get his meeples back. As Sani Blader is trying to start a new city, Daniel is not able to bother him because of this nice protection buffer over here. Great tile for Sani Blader. He's now probably debating whether to finish his road and start a new city or finish this city instead. Let's see which one he chooses. Craft Giraffe is saying that you would have placed this Dorito differently, one square lower. I actually prefer Daniel's move, it's a bit safer. The alternative would have given Red too many points. And look at this, all turned out well for Daniel's Monastery as he got a Meeple back. 19 points of the scoreboard, almost equal to the scoreboard. And now, Sani Blader will probably go over here and will even consider dropping a Farmer. And that's the problem with a move like this. I mean, Daniel had to prevent. Huh, interesting. I was going to say that Daniel had to prevent the development of this road, but Sandy Blader wants to postpone the continuation of that road. He just wants to continue his monastery, which honestly I have to agree with. Because his idea is to get another monastery and then a straight line. And then that would be a boatload of po points. Well, in the meantime, Daniel Ayala gets bailed out by the deck. He draws a row tile with a city. And now, finally, he disrupts the development of the road of this guy. So this meeple is now very awkward. In order to finish this road properly, Daniel would need... No, no, uh... Santiago will need to draw this tile, this tile exactly. There are of course two other tiles, this city cap with a crossroads that goes nicely over here, but it would be a sacrifice of valuable city cap just for the sake of getting a meeple back. So this would not be the ideal scenario for the play with the red meeples. In the meantime, Santiago is getting quite creative with this tile over here. He adds two points to his side of the city with the idea of crawling here in the future, eating up this big part of the ruin, and then blocking this square, leaving the blue guy stranded with just two points. So it looks like there are only two points, but the rationale behind this move is much more sinister than that. Also, because it's possible to connect to this ruin in two different ways. For example, either you get a Dorito plus a Dorito, or you get a uh, extender tile plus a triple city. So you could get one of those and put this one over here as well. In the meantime, Daniel scores two points for the road, uh, whilst at the same time protecting his field. Sand and Blader. What was that noise? Okay. I'm not going to go and check. Sani Blader gets uh, a city cap and gets a meeple back.
Now that I think about this, now that Daniel Ayala has, in fact, a crossroads in his hands, and now that he's thinking, now actually I am going to check what was that noise in my house. Turns out, all is well, <laughs> somebody dropped something, and uh, nobody's fighting, there are no intruders, nobody got hurt, and we can get back to the game. So what happened? Daniel is 8 points in the scoreboard as Daniel managed to complete his monastery, and as planned, Sandy Blader drew another monastery and is about to get even more points on the scoreboard. But what the Mexican has going for him is this field guy. That is beautiful. Nine points on the field. And no better field anywhere. And no access points to the field. No good access points. So I like Sandy Blader's position. And actually, if you're Sandy Blader, you'll get an amazing tile right now. Another monastery. And I think he should use it. Either over here, which gives him immediate 7 points and also pre-builds a nice road next to the monastery. Or over here, which gives him immediate 6 points and pre-builds a 3-point road. I think it's really a choice between these two moves. Anything else would be a bit too weak in my opinion. But he scores a 2-point road and it might cost him the game. Like, it's... It's the dream tile, and you're not going to use it as the dream tile? I'm shocked at this. Not only as a viewer, I mean, like, why? Why? And also, the thing is, like, the reason I want to meeple this monastery is because this square is also kind of vulnerable. Imagine if um, Daniel Ayala draws something like this, and then he's going to go over here and block these two monasteries. I mean, two points with the monastery is like very rarely correct. You only do that in closed positions where... <laughs> you only do that in closed positions. Where you need to save meeples, but... Standard Blader is doing just fine on meeples. He has three meeples and nowhere to use them. Daniel finishes a four-point city at the top. Mmm. And Sunny Blader was attempting to block this connection square at the bottom and proceed with his plan of eating up this upper piece of the ruin. Now, however, Daniel drew... Pretty much the one tile that he needed to connect over here. There's still one more left. There's the quadruple there's the quadruple city tile still left. But the reason why Daniel is not dropping this tile here instantly is because there are other good uses for this tile. For example, he could take two points like this, or he could get greedy and try to take advantage of the shield and continue his city like this. Or he, he could get all blocky 
go over here and try to create a problem on this square. And maybe he has other concerns. Maybe he knows that if he goes over here, this little road piece that's sticking out of the tile will be a connection platform that Red can use to grab a city cap and reconnect to the city. And then instead of having all this plan of eating up this ruin, Red can just straight up draw a couple of city caps and finish the city with a two versus one majority. So Daniel needs to really carefully evaluate the risks. He decides that it's worth the risks. And I still agree with this move. I think it was necessary. But Sandy Blader now in all likelihood will go over here and will try to attack this ruin. It already has a sufficient number of points because it's worth now, what, eight points. When red connects here, it's gonna be worth at least 10 points. And this means that this ruin will be worth more points than this field. So this would allow red to potentially win the game without having to fight for the main field and red would love that because fighting for the main field is kind of hard given that it's so inaccessible oh great point melvin so klaus jürgen vrede once said in an interview uh that uh when he was designing the game of Carcassonne, he considered introducing a rule that two monasteries are not allowed to be to each other because it's just too good. And eventually, for players like me, I'm very happy that he decided not to introduce that rule. But the fact that he was even considering it, it shows how strong two monasteries are next to each other, which why it baffles me why some super strong players sometimes choose not to place this monastery next to this one, but instead take measly two points. On the other hand, San Sandy Blader is doing pretty well for themselves at the moment. They still have two meeples in hand. They now successfully connected to this ruin. It's now worth 11 points and um, Daniel Ayala will have a tough time gaining back these 11 points. The Mexican is now ahead on the scoreboard four points as a result of three point road and he'll probably be ahead four more points after he scores for this city cap but he is thinking he's considering something else. Maybe he's considering simply finishing his city over here or going over here and maybe YOLOing for a 10 point city. There are still tiles that allow him to do that. You go over here, you hope that your opponent doesn't block you like this and then you go over here and you get a city cap. You go over here, you finish the city, you get 10 points and you drop a farmer. Maybe that's his idea. A bit ambitious and probably not worth it, but uh, with uh, some time on the clock, maybe worth considering. As Daniel gets under 30 seconds, he decides to play conservatively and simply gets a meeple back. I can see some of the reasons. Sani Blader gets a straight line, which is an amazing tile for him. Probably gonna go over here. And he might even consider meepling this road. The idea, of course, getting this monastery back in the future. He decides not to meeple it just yet, which also makes sense to me. Maybe his plan is to get a curve and then meeple this road upon completion of this monastery. The danger is in that is that uh, Daniel could draw a curve himself, uh, in, in which case he's going to go over here and pre-meeple this road so that if red completes this monastery, red will force to add points for blue road. None of that is happening because Daniel did not draw a straight line. He drew a curve. I mean, he did not draw, draw a curve. He drew a straight line. Now probably going to go over here and farm for six points. Yeah, I didn't see any other alternatives. Now Sanyablader gets a 
juicy curvy tile. Will he go over here and meeple the road? I think he kind of should. But then, ah, but you see, had he meepled the road before, he would now have been able to go over here and meeple the city cap. So he decides to not even finish his monastery in the first place. He just wants to secure his ruin a little bit. And this is quite interesting. And his idea is as follows. So this is a very smart move. If Daniel draws a city cap or something like this to go over here and attack this ruin, it won't be a very good attack because there are only a couple of Doritos left. And if red draws a Dorito first, red can go like this and block this connection square because there are only, there's zero big tiles remaining for connection. That's the main point. There's zero triple or quadruple city tiles. So Daniel scores four points for the city. Sanu Blader now picks up the empty city piece and will now meeple it shortly. Daniel gets a beautiful tile that he's not able to take advantage of, except we could go over here and meeple the field, actually. That would be quite annoying, I think. Or we might not meeple the field. It's sort of a matter of taste, I guess. But the idea is just to really annoy, annoy. Yes, there we go. Without a farmer, this move is perfectly fine because... Sani Blader now draws a curve, which would have been lovely over here, which would have given him a boatload of points, nine monastery points on the scoreboard, plus a seven point road. This would be just fantastic for the Argentinian, but this tile doesn't fit here anymore. So great find here by the Mexican. So, Sani Blader with a curve, thinking where exactly to use it. I have an idea. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's one straight line remaining. And if Red decides that the scoreboard mandates this, he could go over here, farm, and then try to connect to the farm through either this straight line or this straight line. This wouldn't be the best move statistically, however, because let's say he goes over here. Oh, no, 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 no. This actually is doable. What if we go over here, drop a farmer, and then connect through a curve or a straight line? This still wouldn't work because if your opponent places a curve over here, then both field connections would be blocked. So it's a beautiful spatial idea that might be used on the last turn as in desperation mode but he's not gonna go there just yet and rightfully so as Daniel Ayala would have drawn the blocking tile for this square and now Daniel's trying to harass Sani Blader city now Santiago needs to count tiles very carefully and realize what is the correct defense are there many city caps with a field remaining are there many city caps with a road I don't see many city caps with the road, actually. So I do see a couple of starting tiles. Well, that was a city cap with the road that Daniel Ayala just drew. And now the question is, does Daniel want to go over here and equalize the city? There's still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two Doritos remaining. And I think as Daniel Ayala, you really should. Because you just don't want to give Sani easy eight points and a meeple back you have to go over here you have to meeple this but there's still one divider tile remaining and if sandy blader draws the divider tile he's going to go over here separate the two cities score the eight point city and drop a farmer for six points the most important part however is that as a result of this sequence by daniel ayala Sanya Blader is now not able to take good advantage of the city cap. He is not able to go over here and finish the city. Instead, he chooses to get himself a measly one point. Actually, this is a bit more than one point. Because technically there is a threat of completing this city. Two starting tiles are on the board. So two of these guys, which means that two of them are remaining. 
So back to back starting tiles go over here and over here. And this city can actually get completed. There, there is a real chance of that happening. It's like, I forgot how much it is, but it's like around 20% at this point, if Daniel doesn't do anything about this. Still, 20% is not zero. It adds significant equity to the game. So, Daniel a bit shorter on time than Santiago, approaching the one minute mark. He will get increment, but he needs to do a lot of calculation to find the best possible move. <gasps> oh, and look at this. This was such a brilliant move by Santiago. I didn't realize this. I thought he was just discarding the curve, but in fact, he was limiting this field. So now Daniel is not able to go over here and drop uh, a divider into his field. He dro he's, dropped, he's forced to drop a divider into subpar conditions and Sani Blader draws the penultimate starting tile. I have no doubt it will go over here and create the threat of actually completing the city. I have a feeling this is happening. This city is getting closed. This is exactly what he attempts doing and now Daniel forced to chase that. There's one tile which basically win Sani Blader the game and Daniel Ayala does not want to take such a gamble given that he's 12 points ahead on the scoreboard. He is forced to go over here and try to block the square but the question is how exactly do you do this? How exactly do you rotate the tile in such a way that gives you the best blocking chances? For that you have to be aware of all the five tiles remaining I believe there is one regular Dorito, one road Dorito, one regular monastery. He, he ignores that. I'm so surprised. Can he really afford to ignore that? Did I miscount some tile? I don't think I did. Now I see a really strong move for Sani Blader. Can he find this? Check this out. He can go over here and meeple the city cap and now he will have two tiles that give him a lot of points in a meeple back. So if he goes over here, meeples the city cap, ah, he didn't find it, he didn't find it. Okay, so the idea is that Red could have hoped for this tile and tried to build the city over here. So Daniel Ayala now getting a tile that equalizes the cities. He drops a farmer and Sani Blader gets the tile that finishes him a city. And on top of that, he's going to take a six point road on a six point. Ah, oh, just the cherry on top. So beautiful. Daniel chose to ignore this. Daniel chose to roll the dice and the dice came out with a starting tile on it. Santa Blader sneakily, sneakily, with four city caps, completed a gigantic city. Now plus 18 on the scoreboard and no chances for the Mexican. What a win out of nowhere for the Argentinian 20 year old. Uh, we picked the absolute right duel to watch. Santiago Iniguez takes the first game of the duel in style. Interestingly, Red Hair scores zero field points, but he ain't need no field points. Daniel Ayala can have all the field points he needs and still lose by six points. So I think, of course, it was an amazing find by uh, Santiago just to create the threat of completing this city. That's just beautiful. But um, on top of that, I think it was really the main mistake by Daniel who chose not to even try blocking that city. And that's the main issue that's... I see about it. So yeah, congratulations to all of the Argentinian fans in the chat. Also do make sure to meeple the like button so that as many people as possible find about Copa America and Carcassonne, uh, competitive Carcassonne in general, in general. But we will have a brief look at some other games before 
uh, returning to this jewel. So let's do a quick run through. How's P Chan doing? He's also typically a player who takes his time, and P Chan won his first uh, game against Her Chu. So Mexico is doing not all that bad. Let's do a quick page. So point for P Chan, point for Sani Blader. How is. Sidmo of Mexico. Sid oh, Big Nacho, sort of the racing favorite of Argentina, took down the first one. Uh, Complex V and H, one of the organizers of the tournament, so unfair advantage. Gets punished for organizing the tournament by losing 15 points to Ale Rosario. Oops, the wrong one. So Argentina took three games and will surely man a Rory who is in quite good shape, I'd have to say. Oh, and even Mana Rory loses. Now that's something else. So, I suggest that we actually watch Herchu against Pichan. Simply because that's the first thing that I thought about. They're already in the middle of their second game. Thirty tiles remaining, and it is in fact the Mexican who is ahead again, both in rating and on the board. Oh, nice shape, almost six hundred. They will cross the six hundred threshold if they win this game. So, oh. Oh, crafty, that's a great point from the previous game. Blue could have insurance meepled the road that was sticking into Santiblader City. And this might have been enough for Santiblader to actually win. Uh, for, I mean, for um, Daniel Yala to actually win. But uh, too late now, and of course it's easier for us to notice once the game has been over. Let's have a look at what's happening over here. So, the Mexican player with screen name Pichan19 is playing the green meeples and has two of those, but also he has eight more points than his opponent, whereas Herchu has two more meeples, two more red meeples, and uh, fewer points overall. So, what's happening? We see a field fight. This farmer cancels out this farmer, and on the main field, this farmer cancels out this farmer. Pichan has threats. He's about to con complete the city up top. And he's also... Possibly he might get a starting tile. There's one remaining. That would help him complete... Not complete, but continue this road. Completing two of these monasteries. Both worth eight points. And as I say this, I notice that they are in fact zero starting tiles remaining. All four of them are on the board, which means that this square is blocked, which means that this meeple is permanently trapped with four points. Now, Herchu gets a city tile and chooses to take two points, chooses mistakenly. A better move, I think, was to go over here and block this meeple. Because it seems to me that it's quite the threat that Pichan has. He could finish the city, get 8 points in a meeple back. And the point if Herchu were to place this tile over here, then this meeple would have been trapped because there would have been nothing that fits into this square because all the three dagger tiles are concentrated right here at the bottom of the board. Well, as we speak, I also noticed something else about this position. This red meeple has actually not entered this nine point field which belongs to the blue meeple. To the yellow, uh, to the. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh. Why am I doing this? Green. It's green. To the green meeple. Verde. Uh. And which is why, because this guy did not enter to this field just yet, Green was attempting to block the square 
and as a reaction, Hertu decided to protect the square, make sure that there are still three tiles that fit into the square, and moreover, they want to not only get the crossroads that fit into the square so that their meeple sneaks in, they also want to do it in such a way that gives them a six-point road, so they meeple the road. So a strong sequence here from Hertu. And, uh, whoa, that's interesting. So Pichan chooses not to protect his city up top, which means that, again, Herchu has the chance to grab the tile that goes over here and block this green meeple. Will he notice it? Will he notice this? He should. He really, really should. Yes, so he finally found that. And as you see, Pichan, a bit unfortunate here for the Mexican as he did not recognize the necessity and to bail out this meeple. He gets blocked with just four points. And now suddenly the position of the Mexican is not that great. I mean... He is four points ahead on the scoreboard, and he has eight extra points from these blocked features. But this meeple will eventually join his field, and this road will be eventually completed. Herchu will get at least six more points, if not more, and he will get a meeple back, and, we, and we, he will have the meeple advantage. So long term, long term, I definitely prefer red here in this position, especially considering this city cap at any moment. Herchu could draw a city cap, drop a farmer, get four points on the scoreboard, and then try to sneak in a farmer into the main field like this. It's not going to happen right now. Herchu probably is going to extend his city at the bottom, or will he? One, two, three, four, five. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. What if instead we go over here and drop a farmer like this? hoping for one of the four remaining curves, so great chance to place it over here and sneak in a majority of farmers. So you go over here, you get the majority on the field. You go over, ah, well, he, he, cho he chose the boring move of just simply getting points. But as Hershey, I would have loved this kind of thing. He could still do that theoretically, but uh, of course he now just finishes his city. But you see, this is such an interesting spatial thing because he um, sort of added extra stuff on the city with uh, these extra four points, right? Uh, the idea of meepling a farm upon completion of the city and then sneaking in is no longer possible because this square is just too far away from the main field. So spatially... Red would have benefited from not extending this, sacrificing their four points, and instead going for the field idea. But uh, he has a different idea now, which I also like. He chooses to drop a farmer and then hope for a curve over here. And this will work. Except that Bichan managed to block, or sort of kind of block, the road meeple in a different part of the board. So this is interesting. Now, uh, we see that Herchu immediately draws a tile that uh, connects his farmer into the field. Two versus one farmer majority for one, two, three, four, five completed city. That's 15 field points. However, all is not lost for the Mexican. Because there is this platform over here, which he will be able to use later, just not with this tile. Maybe he can get a row tile, go over here, then get another row tile, go over here, and sneak all the way into the field. But what Pichan did in the previous move over here, he quite severely restricted this square. There are still two T-shaped crossroads remaining, two out of four, but red needs them now in two places. Red needs the T-shaped crossroads over here 
in order to get this farmer into the field and red also needs the crossroads to go over here to get his road meeple back and score the road points and the chances of that happening are uh, less than 25 percent Carol is saying you get green when you mix blue and yellow. I know, I know. I like the color affliction just seems not to go away after two years of streaming. I mean, it went slightly better, like slightly better. But in my early days of streaming, I would just say any meeple colors other than the actual color of the meeples of the players okay so this is interesting oh wow wow this is fascinating look at this pichan try to pre-build the city and try to get some city points and with the tile that hurt you needed her you drew the tile that fit into the square but he chose to use it as a blocking tile just because the threat of green completing the city is too big. And I have to agree with that move because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, uh, they, out of all the 8 tiles that could fit into the square, all of them are in the deck. And Herchu was trying to prevent Pichan from drawing exactly something like this. And he just made sure that this meeple is completely trapped with only 2 points. And if he wants to do something about the square later, he still has the 50 or so percentage uh, chance of getting the last one of these tiles. So there's still one more crossroads remaining. So I would say very nice prioritization and uh, not the most intuitive move uh, on the part of the Argentinian player. Hurtu still thinking here with a Dorito. I see there's a nice six point field here at the right. Possibly a good idea to go over here and meeple the field. On the other hand, given that given that P Chan only has one meeple, maybe he doesn't even have to do that. I actually actually I see another strong move that's possible. You can go over here to create something that I call a pre-blocking platform. It's like mm, so if he goes over here, the idea is this. If Pichan goes over here to attack the field at some point, then with this Dorito on top, Herchu will already have a blocking platform ready so that he can put something over here in this square so that this square can be blocked and a hypothetical green meeple cannot make his way into the field. So that's why I really like this Dorito over here. But can the Argentinian find this move with less than one minute on the clock? That's the question. The reason why this field connection point is so important is because... Well, let's see. Let's see. It's really the only viable field connection point. That's what I mean. And now Herchi is not able to block anything over here. So how will he deal with that? Well, actually, Herchi might just go over here and meeple the farm anyway. But now that Pichan has meepled this farm, we don't really need to spend a move on um, connecting, on, on meepling a farm anytime soon. Because Herchu can just wait for the very, very last tile because he knows that this six point farm cannot really be taken away from him. So a straight line for Herchu, he uses it to, ah, to restrict access to the field. And look at this Pichan, would have loved to use this tile to sneak in, but he wasn't able to. So he's trying to sneak in from the other way, trying to use a curve. And now Herchu draws a curve. So the tile that, that Pichan needed. He now needs to get w at least one of these access points and there are still tiles in the deck that do that but maybe Herchu just draws all of them 
Okay, now the Argentinian just meeples the field. Picha needs to think hard where exactly to discard this tile. Chooses to go over here, and of course her she draws the monastery that Picha needed, and one of these squares. Let's see if there is still if this connection is still live. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No straight line, so nothing fits into this square. And what about the other square? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> and no curves over here. I mean, do you really have to feel sorry for the Mexican here? With such a seemingly safe field connection, he just cannot draw any row tile to finally finish the connection. Herchu gets a city cap. He'll probably score three points somewhere. I don't really see anything better. But this should be enough to hold the lead. This big... F I think so, actually. Because this 15-point field is kind of bad, right? But now that I think about this, green, green has this 9-point field. It's going to be close. It's going to be really close. I think Herchu still has this. Because of this 6-point field over here on the right. But, like, by not a very big number of points. I didn't count this. Let's have a look. Herchu saying GG. Does this mean that P-Chan won? Does not necessarily. Both players are saying GG in the chat. I think Red will have this after all. But let's wait this out. Was it going to be like a four point difference? Something like this? The fields are being scored. Let's not forget the little pieces. And yes, it will be exactly four points for the Argentinian. So very, very narrow win. And uh, it required, I'd say, quite a bit of good fortune. Um, in addition to good prioritization, for example, over here, like preventing P-Chan from finishing this city. That was lovely prioritization here on part of Herchu. And then Herchu got even a bit unlucky that he didn't manage to draw the seven-point field connection. So, a very, very back-and-forth game. Lots of blocked meeples, I just... And lots of tough choices. Uh, loving that. All right, so uh, the Argentinian managed to equalize in the one duel where Mexico was initially ahead. So let's have a real quick look at the scoreboard. How are other players doing? The hottest Argentinian player, uh, Big Nacho, how are they doing? Actually, yeah, so Sidmo is playing... Still the second game, they are about to finish. Look, Big Nacho has such a much, much higher rating than their opponents. Of course, we know that rating isn't everything, but also he has the scoreboard lead and the meeples. Will that be enough? It does look like Red has a massive, massive lead here. Well, not a massive lead. Okay, so this big city is tied. But Red had a bunch of monasteries. And green has some fields. Just by the naked eye of this, I was going to say that red has this, but green managed to finish an 8-point city and get a meeple back. And now green is ahead on the scoreboard, and green will have a meeple back to do something about this. I'm not sure which tiles are remaining, but now that I see this big nacho, will now need to calculate the points, figure out if he even needs to risk and win. And the obvious move that comes to mind is going over here and trying to attack the city. But are there even tiles that allow him to complete the city? And the answer, well, the answer was yes. Because he would have actually managed to complete this. But he went for something different. Big Nacho knew. Somehow he knew that he was going to draw a city cap and not the triangle. And so he went for the correct coin flip. Finished his city at the bottom. 
And, and let's see who won as the city points are counted. Big Nacho gets the ruin and now he's going to get all the monastery points as well and the road points. And then after that, Sid is going to get the field points. Who is going to win? I think it's going to be close again. Every little piece on the board counts. Oh, oh, the city wasn't shared. Oh, never mind. I didn't notice. I didn't notice that there was like a big, big hole inside. Then, duh. Of course, this game goes Big Nacho's way. As I see, I mean, I'm starting getting tired even toward the end of round two of this tournament. I have no idea how these players are going to last five rounds and play for 10 hours. Not 10 hours. Wait. It's not going to be a seven hour stream. We're going to have a nine hour stream. Because there's five rounds, each round is two hours. We're going to have a nine and a half hour stream. Oof. Um, at least, like, I don't know, um, meeple the like button or send me a super thanks. <laughs> I have just enabled that feature. I'm planning to do, like, a little bit more. But the like buttons are most important part. It's just... Um, this actually helps the algorithm. And super thanks. It's for those of you who want to show appreciation and can afford that that would also be much appreciated anyway congratulations to big nacho and team argentina for um asserting dominance and getting on the match scoreboard so points for argentina now let's go back to other players I see we have slightly more Argentinian fans than uh, Mexican fans. Okay, Mana Rory is playing a decider against Fugaza, and it looks like it's very close to being finished. So let's have a look at that. Well, Mana Rory um, is 10 points ahead against Fugaza, however. There are lots of interesting things going on, on the board with five tiles remaining. Let me just update the score real quick before we jump into the position. Manarori equalized. Will he able to pull a comeback win in this duel? So 10 points ahead. Now trying to start a new city with the intention of getting eight further points. Fugaza draws a city cap, probably a city cap that Manarori would have liked. So what else is going on here in this position? This long road for yellow, that's Manarori, and these two monasteries for Fugaza, that's played with the Black Meeples. Also this four-point city over here, which I think cannot be finished anymore because there are no tiles that fit into this square. And of course, on top of that, there is a big field fight. I can see two yellow farmers, and I can see two black farmers, which are desperately trying to equalize. So this farmer, is trying to squeeze in through this square with a straight line and one two three four five six there's actually two straight lines remaining that fit into the square i think one two three four five six seven eight no there's zero straight lines so the only tile that fits into the square is actually a triple crossroads okay so then fugaza really needs almost a miracle here because this farm is also trying to sneak in through a um city cap and I think there's only one of those remaining so Manarori is now trying to block in Fugaza's access so Fugaza will not be able to make it into the field of course he tries to save this connection but Manarori draws the tile anyway and it does look like the more experienced Mexican will take this down so I wonder why Manorori's rating right now is under 500. I think he overall is... Uh, maybe because he plays a lot of casual games, but I think overall he's like the... Well, a, a very strong player. and He has strongly performed in uh, on the international scene and qualified for the playoffs of the World Carcassonne Championships in person in Herny, Germany in 2023. Fugaza draws a city tile 
not a lot of use for that. Just takes three points for a road and the roads are going to count there. Uh, yes, a very hard duel, Manorori is saying good games for Gaza. This is typically what the winner says. Yeah, we can see that yellow is now outscoring black and we haven't even started counting the field. Plus six for yellow. And obviously I was completely... I didn't notice that these were two separate fields, obviously. Which means that even more points go for yellow and plus 21 victory for Mana Rory. I'm gonna really need a break after this. Luckily there are in fact breaks and we're gonna take roughly half an hour break after the end of this round already. So let's update the score and congratulate Marco on this win. Mexico is now... Wait. Ah, I did it wrong. Okay, I think I need... Yeah, there we go. It is 1-1, it is one, one, Argentina versus Mexico. Um, so let's have a look at Complex VNH. Haven't looked at the organizer of the tournament in a while. And they have already finished their game and they lost 2-0 to Ale Rosario. So we know that the organizers of the tournament do not get any unfair advantages. And congratulations to Ale here for defeating the Mexican captain just so convincingly. So two games remaining, Herchu and Sani Blader. So we started with Sani Blader. We might as well have a look at them. Well, they're still on their second game. We're gonna touch that in just a second. I wanna have a look at her too. Did they finish? Aha, uh -huh, so they're still on their third game. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna look at those, and then if we have to, we're going to look at the decider between Sani Blader and... Um, And Daniel Ayala. I think this is the best course of action. Or actually, I could just keep both of them open. Yeah, I mean, why is that so hard? Like, there's... Browsers allow, allow multiple tabs. So it started 23 minutes ago, so I'm pretty sure it's going to end soon. All right, never mind. Never, let's jump into this. It's too interesting. 12 tiles remaining. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 12 tiles remaining. And it does look like Santa Blader is likely to win 2-0 because 23 points on the scoreboard. That's a lot. And a meeple advantage. On the other hand, Daniel has the field. And uh, pretty looking new me uh, blue meeples. So, look at this. Two blue farmers versus one red Argentinian farmers. Also, now I'm thinking that the colors don't make sense because red is on the Mexican flag and blue is on the Argentinian flag. Why is the Mexican playing blue and the Argentinian is playing red? Because it should be the Mexican playing red and the Argentinian playing blue. Rant over. Back to this. So, 23 points for, for Sanya Blader, but fields for the play with the blue meeples. And one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven cities on the field. That's Danny Blader. This, of course, will not necessarily matter as Danny Blader gets an extra quick tile, an extra three points. Oh, thank you, Rene, so much. I think you're the first time ever. You're the first one ever. I'm getting... Um, I have to say that... Uh, <laughs> you're the first one to do this uh, and <laughs> it's embarrassing that I haven't seen the 
currency GTQ. I'm gonna have to look this up, but I I get sent 35 of something, and I do I do I, I do appreciate that. I'll have to brush up on my currencies. Oh, Ches. But uh, thank you, Rene, so much. I do greatly appreciate it. That's a uh, lot of positive emotion that has caused me. Well, and lots of positive emotion is something that the Argentinian players will experience as Sani Blader, despite Daniel's menacing 21-point field and the little 6-point field, convincingly wins with 18 points. 18 points, by the way, that's the price of just one monastery coin flip over here. Some Carcassonne games I just decided by this, and this seems to have been one of them. So congratulations to Sani Blader, who wins two games against Daniel Ayala in style against the former United States champion. We're going to update the score and move to the final game in this match. That's hurt you against P Chan. Oh, look at this, and we don't even need to change tabs. So, 26 tiles remaining, plenty of um, Carcassonne still left to play. And even though the fate of this match has already been decided. Oh, Guat oh, oh Gu Guatemala, nice, nice, nice. <laughs> Gallo. Okay, so, um, Hurt You uh, is having a Dorito tile, thinking where to put this. And by the way, this also still matters because uh, in order to qualify, teams need to win matches, but also they need to win matches that with good tiebreakers. And winning, th losing two against three is better than losing one against four. So uh, it is still possible that both of these teams playing something, both uh, playing uh, for an outcome that still matters. It's not about whether you win or lose, it's also about how you win or lose. Pichan gets a crossroads and is now... Trying to block or at least harass Hertu City over here. Hertu getting a straight line. Trying to harass Peach and City, and Hertu is going to be successful. I think we will see Herman attacking this city or will he choose to finish his own city instead I think that attacking is stronger but does he know it in the meantime let's actually have an analysis of the overall situation Yeah, I heard you predictably and wisely decides to connect to Green City as Green takes two points and impedes the completion of Red City. Hurt you gets a monastery tile, not many good uses for it. I mean you could use it as a monastery at your peril, but he chooses not to do that. As P Chan continues scoring quick points and also further and further menacing this square. But look at this. Red manages to draw the starting tile to finish this city just before uh, he was going to get blocked. P Chan, however, still ahead on the scoreboard, getting three points for the road. Now five points ahead on the scoreboard. Slight lead for Hertu overall, I believe. Because red, that's Hertu has this 8-point road here going on, and Red has two 9-point fields, that's not nothing. Red has a Monastery, Green has a Monastery that's neutral. And then Green has also some blocked features like a 5-point city over here, and a um, 
a six point field over here but these are not that lucrative and as her tree draws the last curve this also means that this monastery by green will not no longer be completed green needed this curve to go over here and there are no other curves remaining so what could red do i guess red could go over here and secure the integrity of his field because at any point p chan could go here drop something and uh, and attack over here What is Pi Chan gonna do? As uh, Her Chu protects his field in the manner which I approve of, <laughs> in the manner which we have predicted, Pi Chan gets a slightly less versatile tile, or should I say versatile, and in chooses to use it to attack a field. I rather like this. Given that they're one, two, three, so there's still, I think, two tiles that fits into this square, and that would enable green to tie this field. But also, there's another option. There's one tile that goes over here, and then in some scenarios, green doesn't connect over here, but instead, green goes <laughs> green goes <laughs> that sounds like something else uh, green goes green space goes <laughs> over here and finishes his city and connects into this field at the top so it's actually a very flexible move but it's not gonna happen because herman drew the tile that would have fit into the square and now this meeple is permanently trapped and if hurt you want, hurt you can go over here. Hurt you can hurt you broom, tss, by blocking this guy. Uh, Pichan scores three points, and he's still ahead on the scoreboard. Hurt is gonna score, gonna score four points, and presumably in such a way that also adds some field points to him I mean you have to feel it for this lonely trap meeple just three points and no prospect of growth but instead Herman chooses to score four points instead of seven points in a different part of the board so he must know something that I don't so I think maybe his main idea is that he wanted to draw something like this and he just wanted to protect the entry points to this nine-point field. And he figured that this would be enough to win. <laughs> yeah. We will have a look at USA versus Guatemala soon enough. So Pichan chooses to attack the field because what other choice does he have? And the Argentinian draws a tile that I think can steal the deal in this game. Yeah, if he places this tile over here, this will actually be a permanent block because I believe there are no daggers remaining. Yeah, there are no daggers remaining, there are no curves remaining, and there are no crossroads remaining. So there's nothing out of the seven, out of the 16 tiles that would have fit into this square. All of them are already on the board, and this meeple is also trapped for zero points. It actually turns out that Pichan needed this tile and this tile exactly in order to connect, and he ain't gonna get it. So, very just cold-hearted sequence by Hurtu. So he chose to take four points instead of seven, chose to take four points over here instead of finishing the city over here, just so that he could entice P-Chan into going over here and then block him. 
I mean, that's just borderline sadistic, if you ask me. Oh, thanks for sharing uh, interesting etymo uh, etymology points, Elias. Although I do think it sounds like a... a f more like a fun story than the actual etymology, but uh, not sure, not sure, not sure. That's just my intuition as a linguist. So Herchu still has two more meeples to just keep chipping away at his advantage. He gets six extra points. Uh, and he's going to get five extra points for the road. This is just... Beautiful if you're Argentinian and painful if you're Mexican. But uh, I wish Team Mexico a speedy recovery in the next round. And Argentina, I forgot whom Argentina is playing in the next round, but I think it actually might be a rest round for them. So they're not going to play in round three. If I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken. Yeah, so Herchu managed to gain more points than green even before the field points are counted. And with the uh, extra field points, of course, it's uh, going to be an even bigger advantage. Good luck in the next games, uh, and we'll see each other in the semifinals. That's what Herchu is saying quite ambitiously. Let's see if this actually turns out to be true. So plus 13 for the Argentinian player. A very strong field performance, blocking performance. And uh, indeed, the player with the screen name Herchu is uh, delivering. So 4-1 for Argentina, the only player to deliver Mexico a point, that was Manarori. So, how is the other match going, USA versus Guatemala? I will need to have a look at the... First of all, update this one over here. And we'll just need to have a look at the tournament discord. So, Wizard Chess won against uh, Folkesterra, that's one for the US. KB won against uh, Arena Bolsara, that's two for the US. Illusions won against Admitted, that's one for Guatemala, and that's like a rank against a really strong player, so that's 2 1. Lakos once against Sturgeon, that's 2 2. And Arab won against Arlock 94, so that is. 3-2 US versus Guatemala. Guatemala really made it close. Uh, delivering a performance today still in the running for the playoffs. So uh, the U US versus Guatemala ended up being closer than Argentina versus Mexico. So who would have thought? Also, if it seems to me that Guatemala has some new players as well. I don't think I have seen... I remember Lacos a lot, but... I don't remember Lucians, I think. Well, anyway, we are watching Guatemala in, uh, in the next round. Or in one of the next rounds, for sure. All oh, right, so Juan Victoria is saying that you play against the US in round three. Let's actually have a look at what's going to go on in round three. I think there is already a schedule. So, no, there isn't a schedule just yet. There isn't. Ah, uh, no, there is. So, Mexico is playing against Cuba. USA is playing against Argentina. And Guatemala is having a rest round. And then I know I'm going to show. 
so uh, Guatemala is playing twice at 2200 UTC they're playing against Mexico and at midnight UTC they're playing against Cuba and actually I would probably want to show that match I definitely planning to show a little bit of every team as for group B what we expect in about half an hour is gonna be Brazil versus Colombia which is just oof. yeah I have to watch that one or and Peru versus Chile I mean it's just two amazing amazing matches I think we're gonna start with Brazil against Colombia and then we'll catch a glimpse of all the others so yeah uh, so congratulations to the US and to Argentina I will be back in half an hour for round three and so far we just gonna We're just going to go on a break. Right. So see y'all guys in 31 minutes. Let's make it like this.
I wish good things to you who is still watching this. I'm still Alexi and we're still in the middle of the marathon stream for Copa America, a tournament where nine countries will decide which one is the dominant Carcassonne force in the Western Hemisphere. Two rounds have so far concluded and you can see both the Group A and Group B standings already on the board. So we witnessed how Argentina defeated Mexico versus two and USA managed to narrowly escape, escape an upset against Argentina three versus two. As a result, in Group A, US is still undefeated with two victories out of two. Argentina and Guatemala are both with one victory. So as you can see, Guatemala will be the one who will be sitting the third round out. And they will be watching as uh, USA will be playing against Argentina for at least temporarily the first place in the group. And I assume Guatemalans will be rooting against Argentina because that will improve their own chances of qualifying for the playoffs. Whereas Mexico will be playing against Cuba, trying to decide which team will be the first one to get uh, a point in the overall tournament table. If Mexico or Cuba wants to qualify, there's still quite a lot of work for them to do. In Group B situations is a bit simpler because there are simply fewer teams. Uh, there are fewer rounds, so that's why we'll be following Group B whenever a Group B is playing, and this will be round three. We'll be following Brazil against uh, Colombia. As you can see, Chile and Colombia have one win each. Peru and Brazil have one loss each. Chile and Peru with a slightly better tiebreakers. So, uh, Brazil and Colombia, you can see all the lineups on the screen. Interestingly, that's new players, at least new players for me, Renan Freire for Brazil and Esceptor for Colombia. I'm not familiar with them at all. So we might actually have... Um, we might actually have to look at them but i think for starters i want to have a look at the brazilians young talent uh, uh, Cera, uh who actually was in round one delivered a strong performance and i think deliver and, and um won against their chilean opponent two against zero if i'm not mistaken and they will be playing against a more experienced colombian player with queen them Salva 3XZ. We're going to start with that duel. And we'll have catch a glimpse at all the others. And maybe we'll even catch a glimpse of <clears throat> some of the group A matches. I'm now going to remove all the tournament standings from the board. And we're going to jump into the games. So, uh, Feltzer has a long screen name, so I'd rather try and find the Colombian player first. They have already started. As you can see, the Colombian player is slightly higher rated, whereas Feltzer here has youth and four points on the scoreboard to help them. Three points for Salva Trace. Strix from a road as they continue their ring road and drop an early farmer. This is, of course, something that you can expect from South American Carcassonne quite a lot. Felcera scores two points for the road, expands their lead on the scoreboard, but Salva Trix is about to complete their loop road, I presume, getting four points on the scoreboard. They're thinking about that. Maybe they think about something else. Maybe they want to start another um, road at the bottom with an attempt to abuse this monastery square. They are indeed trying to start another road. This is pretty interesting. This type of aggressive scoring play we don't see very often from South American players. They tend to be a bit more conservative scoring wise and a bit more aggressive when it comes to field play. 
good to see that you're coming back uh, by the way i see the viewer count is increasing as we're starting our next round just be sure to meeple the like button if you like this video and to subscribe to more com competitive carcassonne content like this if you already have to and of course feel free to make my day by sending a super thanks if you want to show extra appreciation and can afford that salva tricks is not finishing their road again which is interesting okay so they really really want to score efficiently this is something very new and i have a lot of empathy for that so they will now continue with yet another road and look at this they now successfully managed to restrict this square and make it harder for Fertzera to finish his monastery. Uh, still plenty of tiles that go into this square, but it is starting to look quite unpleasant about, around the Black Monastery. Look at this, Salvatrix starting a new city and at the same time trying to create a blocking platform against the monastery, but Fertzera draws a tile that feeds neatly into the square and now Black will be patiently waiting for either one of the two tube extenders and then they can finish the monastery and meeple the new city or for, for, <coughs> for one of the three dividers which would allow them to go like this and score four points for the road in the meantime um salva scores four points for the city and now this farmer looks already quite enticing uh, Feltera now n not only drops a farmer to equalize, but also creates some pressure against this square. But Salva finishes the road, and I presume you have to meeple the city. You have to meeple the city. It's too good. It gets completed unexpectedly quickly. Actually, you go over here, you get a Dorito, and that's it. The city is a threat. I think it's a mistake. I think it's excessive conservatism with 15 points on the scoreboard and three meeples. Feltera, of course finishes his monastery drops the tile very quickly and now um is back again with four points leading the scoreboard well now surely salva is going to take the city a bit unpredictably i thought they would choose a different path and now it's a bit tricky what they're gonna do i think the strongest move is to go over here and to start yet another city but they might be tempted to go here and basically yolo this they might hope that Feltera does not draw a blocking tile, which is quite a big of a hope because any row tile that goes here uh, can block the square in such a way that the red meeple will be stranded here forever, unable to complete this city. But Salva says okay with getting his city blocked. Maybe they want to just keep completing and completing. They want to use this as a ruin. And look at this. They want to protect their other city at the same time also shielding this farmer from the entry into the more lucrative field i'm not sure if that's quite gonna work because imagine if salva draws a triangle finishes the city then Feltera can simply connect using a couple of row tiles it will just take him a little bit longer but salva made their decision now Feltera facing another tricky choice Ooh, they want to try and invade this red city perhaps they're creating a platform f to do so and salva can't really do much about this i guess salva can go over here indirectly protecting their city oh but instead they chose to abandon the city and they want to finish their city on the right and actually i love that idea they don't need all their meeples back they in fact need to complete only one of the cities just to gain that advantage and now especially salva can go over here if he wants that's a great move that's an indirect protection from blocking but not from invasion as of course Feltzera will go over here and try to invade this city, but they don't. Oh, they invade the other city, which also makes perfect sense because Salva was one tile away from completing this city, and this is not what the Brazilian would have liked. In the meantime, this is a great tile for the Colombian player because this is the only blocking tile that the Brazilian has available. So now nothing can go into this square that can trap this red meeple the only bad thing that can happen for red 
is that if black draws something like this and then connects to the city. But even that is not that horrible. Having to share city points is not the worst fate for a meeple and it has an upside of this black meeple being kind of stranded here with only three points on the field, whereas this red meeple has nine points on the field. Salva starts yet another city while the Brazilian finishes yet another city. Five meeples on the board, eight points advantage on the scoreboard. Salva presumably going to... What are they going to do? Are they going to finish the city or are they going to finish the road? Both are possible. And maybe if you're the Brazilian, uh, if you're Colombian, you're kind of tempted to go here so that you drop a city cap in the field and so maybe you get more points for the field. They chose to play conservatively, which I also like in this position, given their number of meeples. And... Um, They simply keep it simple. Now, here comes the true Brazilian field fighting spirit as a black farmer drops with tempo on a tile on the right. And the idea is that eventually Salva is going to need to complete this road. And while Salva completes this road, it will be Salva himself who, le who lets the Brazilian farmer come to the field. So... Salva now drops a counter farmer trying to gain even more on the field and both players are just ignoring the city piece at top so will one of them at least meeple that piece I mean yes exactly you have to meeple the city and uh, honestly if Felsera gets a city cap and another city cap he will be completely fine with Salva finishing this little city because this top city is simply bigger. And on top of that, the Brazilian has the scoreboard lead and the extra... Meeples. Salva has managed to connect to this guy, to this field. So now it actually doesn't matter whether this, whether this road is getting finished so, Salva is choosing to try and block the Brazilian little city with the idea that if he puts something over here, this square will be permanently disabled uh, so that this meeple will be stuck here with six points. In the meantime, of course, um, Red will be looking forward to grabbing a Dorito tile and finishing a city for 10 or 12 points himself. In the meantime, Brazilian field fight continues. Sveltzera goes over here in such a way that would bring his farmer into the field like this. Oh, this is very smart. And this action now really forces Salva to spend a crossroads going here, finishing the road, because... Felzera has a threat of just connecting over here as well. Yeah, exactly. Look at this. It's going to be beautiful. He's going to go over here, leave the square alone, and connect this guy to the farmer from the other side. Or he actually might even postpone this later. He just might go here instead, scoring three points for the monastery, for the road, and one point for the monastery, and delaying the field connection even further. There's something to be said for delayed gratification, both in life and in Carcassonne. Melvin is saying we suffer from something called farm fever in South Americans. <laughs> yes, you European would never understand. I mean, I can certainly see like if you live somewhere in Argentina with all these, with all this territory, all these pampas, then you just feel the luxury that you can just throw around farmers everywhere. Oh, well, we have interesting developments here. As the player with the black meeples gets the Dorito first and makes sure that Red is not able to complete his city on their own. And that's the upside for them. The, do the downside is that this guy, totally stranded with three points. In the meantime, what can Salva do? 
I guess they could go down bottom and build up their bottom ruin. This would bring it up to 10 points, which is quite decent. Would put them in this ever so slight lead. Or they could go over here and block this farmer's axis. And actually, I quite like that idea. Because then, okay, imagine if Salva goes over over here with this tile. Then there will be no tile that can be placed in this square, which means that if Feltzera wants to enter this nine-point field, they will have to put this T-shaped crossroad here and finish the road for red. This will make it sure that black is not able to put the T-shaped crossroads here, score two points, and leave red stranded. Moreover, if the Columbian plays this move and then black goes over here with the T-shaped crossroads, this will finish red's road without yet finishing black's monastery. And so at least temporarily, red will enjoy a meeple advantage and uh, who knows what kind of positive consequences for the Colombian and meeple adva advantage may entail. Salva still thinking 40 seconds on the clock. That's not a lot of seconds while the Brazilian predictably has full time. This is both youth and Brazilianness. This is deadly combination. Then they will be playing like in crazy speeds. I cannot think this fast. Oh, but instead the Colombian goes for the more aggressive approach. They are okay with this farmer connecting they just want to get some points and they'll probably even go over here and continue the city but oh this is devastating Feltzera gets the tile which add points to Salva but breaks his city this is very inconvenient for the Colombian because look at this the Colombian was about to finish their city and get 10 points on the scoreboard and a meeple back and now it looks like the only way to get a meeple back, or well, the only two ways. Okay, there's actually several ways. Let's go through them. First, we could go over here and just simply build up our city with multiple, multiple tiles. Or we could get one of the two, sh two T-shaped crossroads and go over here. But... Since red doesn't have any meeples, when red takes the T-shaped crosses over here, red will not able to will not be able to score these four points for the road. So the risk, noble though it may be, did not pay off. And in the meantime, Feltzera has no shame and no fear, meepling another monastery for eight points with this last meeple, and I can see why. He's three points ahead of the scoreboard. These monasteries give him a whopping 15 points. And red does not have any features on the board which come remotely close in value to these sort of numbers. So as a result, I think Feltzer is perfectly happy with never getting meeples back. As long as Salva never gets meeples back. And probably enough for a win for the Brazilian. Oh... And on top of that, he draws the one and only tile that was remaining that allows him to even get some people back and two extra points. Then this is just spectacular. Salva is desperately trying to do something about this city, but this will be very quickly shut down. As Feltzera, I'm pretty sure he'll find a way. Well, he chooses to be even greedier and connect to their shared city. Now, we get a blocking move. And... Okay, Salva finishes a shared feature, gets both of them a meeple back. Maybe this will allow the Colombians some wiggle room. So actually, I can see what they could do. They could draw. Okay, there's a path back to, for the Colombian. It's possible. If they draw both crossroads to get quick points. Okay, we have quick points. We can take four points for the road. That's something. Only minus eight. And then we could draw some crossroads. And then we can try and reconnect to the big field somehow. So that will be the idea for us. Okay. 
Salva, 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 where do we go? It's a tricky, tricky situation. Hmm, maybe we might, we might go over here. Track to Meeple a road, get some quick points. I'm not sure that's going to be enough. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's not going to be enough. So there is this 12-point field here. How do we get access to that 12-point field? I'm not quite seeing it. I'm not sure what which tiles are remaining. The only thing that I know is that two of them are crossroads. So maybe if we go over here and we have some sort of city tile, we can connect through a crossroads, but it's incredibly, incredibly shaky and an unreliable way to score points. And I don't think it is even going to be enough. All I know is that I need a snack because of this. So the experienced Colombian player is thinking of a way to pull off a miracle. Does not manage to get a good tile as Felcera just decides to score four quick points for the road. He's not afraid at giving a meeple to the Colombian. Salva gets a crossroads. Where does he go with the crossroads? I presume there's really only one way we can go over here, score six field points. Yeah, that works. But unfortunately, for the Colombian, there's not really a good way how we could fight for the big field. Three field points at the end, somewhere at the bottom, is the, is the best we can do. And it looks like the Brazilian teenager will be continuing their perfect record in this tournament. As they get a Dorito tile, which they can probably use to score a three-point road. Or a six-point field, that's even better. That's a nice spot I didn't see. Well, well, come on, oh, come on. Six-point field over here. Don't be sloppy, my friend. I mean, I have to admit I didn't see that myself, but... Uh, With such a lead on the scoreboard, the Brazilian can afford being a little bit loose. And in a few seconds, we're going to see what the final result is. Plus 14 for the Brazilian, just one point short of a neat hundred. And we congratulate Fertzeta for their continuing perfect record. Let's look how the highest rated players are doing. Ed Shamon, who is also was in on World Team Carcassonne Online Championship mm. team is still playing their first game i think huh what's what's that what's that about what's that about yeah so they're playing against the highest rated well actually pechitos and uh salva had the identical rating of 577 at least before before the start of the match so four tiles remaining and the Colombian play with the black meeples is eight points ahead there is a big ruin in the middle where the portuguese speaking player seems to have the upper hand and it looks like this feature should be decisive unless this field 
And this field, which is controlled by the playable the Black Meeples, match or something, but I don't think it does because Ed also controls a field up top, and now he even wants to invade yet another field. Does not sound like something... that seems worth doing. I mean, if I were Ed, I would just go over here, and instead of trying to invade the field myself, I would just tie together the two black fields so that the black player doesn't score for the city twice. Because unless, unless I'm severely mistaken, black, uh, Red has more than enough points in this ruin. I could be severely mistaken. Red gets extra points for the Ruin. It looks like the field is important because uh, Black is trying to protect this field at all costs. And now actually Black could drop a Farmer here. Because, no, there are no monsters remaining and there's uh, one, two, three, four... Oh, there is a Vanilla City Cap remaining, I think? Yeah, there is a Vanilla City Cap remaining, and it does seem to me whoever draws the Vanilla City Cap might win the game. Because the idea is a Vanilla City Cap enables Ed to connect to the field, whereas a Vanilla City Cap enables Pechitos to score a boatload of points. Add a Farmer. Yeah, it does seem that Pechitos should have this. Because they will go over here, they will finish the monastery, and they will finish this city, even though without meeples, it will add points to this guy, to this farmer, and to this farmer, Pachito gets the vanilla city cap. And now Ed will need to ask himself whether it was worth spending his last meeple on invading. I think this field fight might have been unnecessary for... The player with the red meeples, given that uh, their city ruin was worth 19 points. Yeah, look at this. Pechito's winning only plus 5. So, all Ed had to do in order to win the game was just take this tile not spend a meeple, go over here, unify these two farmers, concede the big field, and then um, and then Black would have had six fewer points, simply because Black would not be scoring twice for these cities, and Ed would have had an extra meeple left to work with. So it does seem like an unfortunate, painful loss, an unnecessary loss for Brazil, and also quite an instructive one. The Brazilian player had a very large ruin, which was enough to win, but by trying to achieve both objectives at once, both the ruin and the big field, red came just short of the requisite number of points. So, one goes to Brazil, one goes to Colombia from what we've seen. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at how the newcomers are doing. Renan Freire versus Esceptor. Hmm. So they're not playing. Uh, so Esceptor won the first game against Renan Freire. What is their rating? So 432, solid carcass on rating. Very curious to see how the Brazilian newcomer is going to start. But let's have a look at um, the matchup between Sergio Antolines and Vini Lessa. Sergio... 
won the first game against Finney and they're playing their second and this is what we're gonna watch right now because we make spontaneous decision. They're five minutes in. Oh, it is in fact Sergio who is the highest rated Colombian player at the moment with 600 extra. But they have several strong players. It's not necessarily clear who the strongest one is. And that's not what they care right about right now. They are a team. And actually this match is very important for both teams. Because I believe if Colombia wins this one, they have guaranteed themselves qualification for the playoffs. And if Brazil loses this one, then Brazil is out of the tournament. So... What are we having over here? Vinny Lessa. Six extra, extra points on the scoreboard, but one meeple less. However, Korean looks quite solid in this position. There's this road that will soon get finished as Green draws a curve, and this will add five points for Vinny and a meeple back. This monastery for four points may seem iffy, but actually... We get a road monastery, we get a city tile, and suddenly everything is doing just fine. Vinny gets a uh, curve, decides not to drop a farmer for six points, and I agree there will be a better use of his meeples later. But look at this beautiful, beautiful farmer by Sergio. Dremcads will now go over here, enjoy a two versus one meeple majority on a 12 point field. And this field is so hard to access. So the best Vinny can do is just leave this field alone, enjoy the lead on the scoreboard, and block Red's City Meeple over here. So there's no tile fit into the square, which means that this Red Meeple will be stranded with 5 points. Probably more than 5 points, but there aren't too many big tiles remaining as some of them have been used up so it won't be that easy to continue this city uh, but surely dremcad will get a couple of points out out of this and uh, interesting move here by dremcad so th th he chooses to continue his field which kind of makes sense but i'm having doubts about this maybe it was better to actually keep this field with only 12 points but try to keep it secure. Because now, if Dremcat finishes his city, he'll kind of be forced to drop a third farmer to protect this field. And then suddenly, he's going to have a 15-point field with a plus 2 meeple majority, which is only 7.5. points per meeple but it's not gonna happen as Vinny found a nice tile that allows him to prevent Dremcat from completing a city now the city is not completable with a city cap it's only completable with the one and only remaining splitter and if uh, red draws a splitter then it will be kind of hard for red because red might go over here and get his meeple back but then the green meeple will still be alive which is why I guess Sergio is now trying to restrict this square in fact not only restrict but also block the square really this is what it is there is now zero tile that fit into the square and uh, now Dremcad really 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 hoping to get the splitter so that he can get his meeple back and then trap this green meeple with four points only Dremcat gets a big tile, certainly a decision. Could go over here, trying to develop the development of, trying to impede the development of these monasteries. Honestly, it would be a very strong move if you ask me. Could also go over here, trying to simply complete his ruin, given how few points he has. But honestly, these monasteries are very, very dangerous. I actually prefer the blocking move over this, because Vinny can now go over here. And add two points to his monastery, and then wait for a curve and a straight line that would allow him to get nine points for this guy and a meeple back. And this is exactly what Vinny does. So we're probably going to see some sort of attack from Dremcad, maybe over here, 
trying to block this square to a crossroads or over here trying to put pressure on this square instead let's see which of the two options the colombian decides on it does seem that that it has to be one or the other oh i just huh 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 Notice something weird in the stream settings. Anyway, back to this. The Colombian chooses the block from the top. Which is sort of kind of useful. If I calculated correctly, there are only two tiles remaining that fit into this square. But two is not zero. So he will need to continue the blocking attack. Oh, Vini Lessa makes a beautiful move. So his idea, he wants to connect this guy to his little stranded city piece just on the off chance that red draws the splitter so he wants to prevent the idea from red getting his meeple back at the expense of the captive green meeple and at the same time he drops a farmer and now equalizes this 12 point field so strong sequence by Vinny. dremcad tries to meeple a monastery at the bottom and you got to give him credit for that. He also tries to build it up efficiently because his idea is to draw a tile exactly like this and then continue a ruin in such a way that also gives him a monastery point. I mean, respect where respect is due. Vinny gets a fantastic tile. A splitter could earn him the right to add four points to his scoreboard and he chooses to do that in a very wanton way one that allows dremcad to score quick points i'm not sure what the need was to face the city cap downwards so the play with the red meeple certainly is happy about that but in the meantime huge tall for vinnie four points on the scoreboard plus an extra monastery point this was an all important crossroads Dremcad, thinking hard. They're 17 points behind, and rough, everything's roughly equal on the scoreboard, as the farms has now equalized, and the monastery plus ruin are roughly equals to monasteries. So, Dremcad needs to find 17 points basically out of thin air. So if he chooses to add two points to his ruin at the bottom, he needs something bigger that won't quite be enough. Okay, monastery. This is something like, do we go here and YOLO it? Do we put, uh, do we put uh, a meeple there? Maybe we don't. Maybe we just go here and wait. Because, for example, uh, I think yes, Dramcat, we just go here as, and wait. With the idea that we still need the meeple for quick points. Like, if we draw a crossroad, for example, we could go over here and score four points for the road. And then later, of course, the plan would be this. We go here, we draw um, maybe like a curve, then we draw crossroads, then we score three points for the road, nine points for the monastery. It seems to me that the path to win, as unlikely as it is, lies in quick points for Dremcad. And this monastery gets it completed, something like this. So they rightfully so choose not to meeple the monastery, but Trem but Vinny gets four quick points. Certainly not helpful, but look at this. The curve, which is so much desired by the red player, has been drawn. And red is one tile away from getting his meeple back. So this monastery was very 
very important and the idea is like if only Dremcat could finish his monastery and then somehow meeple this 9 point field at the end no says Vinny I'm gonna meeple the 9 point field but maybe that's okay says Dremcad as he shouldn't meeple anything and now there are a lot of features up for grabs like this little this empty city cap up for grabs now, Dremcad could meeple a road, actually. Or, like, meeple the field, maybe. Or, I don't know, meeple the road, then get to crossroads, then meeple the field. Like, extreme efficiency is required here. Luckily for him, he has two and a five minutes to figure out the remaining tiles. Let's see if we can do this. All I know is that there are two crossroads. I see one vanilla city cap remaining, which means that it is possible to get city points from here. It is possible. So we might go... Okay, here's how I see it. Farmer, right now. Then crossroads, city cap, crossroads. That's gonna be... Uh, what? Both load of po nah, 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 nah. It's not time. No time to block. You need efficiency. How else are you gonna win? Ah, uh, I think. I think it's such. It's so unfortunate. This tile needed to be used over here. Like there is no time for such silliness. Come on. And even though it's only a three-point field, it will become a six-point field as the tile is drawn. Exact. What? What am I talking? About? Like you see, six points completely wasted. Ay ay ay. Dremka, Dremka, you were so close. I well, not really close, but at least like it could have been a try. So the Colombian player could have had six extra points because you see they have two meeples in hand which they will be unable to spend. Actually, the Colombian player will have more. Because look at this. This tile that was added here by Vinny was only possible because Dremcad created a platform for Vinny. So seven more points. This is what the... Um, Colombian would have had. If not for that blocking move. I don't think it quite would have been enough. Yeah, it would have made things close at the very least. So excellent game here by Vinny. Of course, very fortunate with the monasteries, but he protected them very nicely. And even though he ended up finishing them all only, 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 only on the very last move, it's really not the meeples, but the points that matter there. So it is a tight game and we will be headed into the decider. We will uh, get back to the decider in a second. I just want to see how Gustavo Arroda is doing. A very talented uh, Portuguese speaking player. Ah, oh, no, GD Arruda. So, they have already finished their duel and convincingly won against Taryev, a Colombian player whom I was not familiar with. And look at this, plus 70, plus 69. This is just devastating. I wonder, whoa, that, that would have been a fun game to watch. But I have to congratulate Brazil on their first match point. So, who are watching next? I actually kind of want to go back to um, Felcera. It's always interesting to watch uh, younger players because they're so full of energy and creative moves. So they are now about to finish their second game and if that game finishes uh, in a way that uh, favors 
the Colombian, which looks like it is headed that way, then we will probably be sticking around and watching the decider right here. So, what are we having here? Salva, extra 14 points on the scoreboard. Great for them. Extra meeple, great for them. But the Brazilian player has some threats. Well, not anymore as Salva he tries to equalize this city on the left, preventing Black from drawing a Dorito and getting a boatload of points on, points on the scoreboard. So this is certainly something that Fertzera has to be disappointed about. But there are some good things for the Brazilian. One is that one of these tiles that would fit into this square is still available. And this would enable black to finish the city. Another thing that's going well for red is that one tile that goes here is still available. And that would enable Salva to finish this monastery and to score three extra points for the road. And actually, it's such an interesting situation. It basically matters who draws their tile first. Because let's say if red draws their tile first, then they go over here, they score three points, and they kind of leave this four-point road up for grabs for black, if black draws this tile later. But if black draws their critical tile first, then they will have a decision to make. Either they're leaving this four-point road, this four-point route, up for grabs for red if red draws the crossroads or they're meepling their, their their three point road just to neutralize uh, this monastery and preventing red from scoring this road so it's very very interesting game of catch here so what else do we have we have a shared city at the bottom which won't be much of a factor in fact, Salvatrix could just finish the city right now if uh, the goal of the play with the Red Meeples is to get uh, back uh, Meeples for both sides, which I don't think is the goal of the side that, that is ahead 14 points. Then we have this little piece at the bottom, which is good news for Falzera because there's still plenty of city caps that go into that square and this will give four points for Falzera and a meeple back. And knowing that Falzera was likely to get a meeple back, um, Salva decided that he in fact wants to increase the meeple count from both sides. And finishes the shared cities. Now we're going to have a very open classic South American position. 15 tiles remaining and both sides have three meeples. Like how often do you see that? Very often if you're in South America. Not very often if you're in East Asia. So. Felicet is now trying to block Red City on the right. And there was, in fact, one tile remaining that fits into that square. But actually, I'm not a fan of these blocking moves. I rather prefer to wait until my opponent draws the tile. And then, if and only if they draw a tile, then I will still have time to attack this city. And look at this. It proved to, it to be even unnecessary as Felicet won the coin flip. But why would they... Why would they lose so many points and finish the city for their opponents? I think it's a mistake for the play with the Black Meeples. It was a lot of points unnecessarily, con unnecessarily conceded. I know what they were doing. They're trying to kind of stage a field invasion over here. But it's so easy to thwart that. For example, Salva can go over here now and drop a farmer right here. And not only threaten to connect to this field, but also make it harder for Black to connect to this field and especially down 14 points on the scoreboard I don't think we can ever afford to finish a shared city like to make a city where you had six more points ah yeah yeah I do think this is a move that might come back to haunt the Brazilian teenager Salva draws a farmer in a beautiful way 
Their idea is to connect through here, through the T-shaped crossroads, or through something over here, and then draw a tile that fits into this square and basically win everything outright. But look at this, Feltzera is now trying to connect like this, and Red gets perfect timing. Red gets an extra farmer, and the Brazilian should be really, really scared if you ask me. Luckily for them, there's nothing that fits into this square. So actually what Black can do, Black can just choose not to finish the city, but now Salva will probably be the one to finish this city. I think they should, like I think they actually could really do that. Because they really want to share these field points. Or an alternative is to simply go here, take a six-point field, which I believe Feltzera should have taken. Like, Or they could go here, take a six-point field like this. There's just so endless, endless options how to win this. It did seem, seem to me that the Brazilian had chances, but they needed to spend a bit more time to evaluate this complex position. Like this game, this whole game of chicken of who lets whom into the field and who finishes whose city. And so here Salva decided he actually doesn't even need the field. He's going to get another field and um, try to get a boatload of points elsewhere. Well, surely Feltzera will now meeple a farm. Salva can actually go here and threaten the completion of yet another city and this will force... Feltzera to react. Now that I look about this, it will be sort of kind of close. That's what I can say. It will be sort of kind of close score-wise. Because Black will still have their 12-point field over here. Actually, no, it's not that close. Feltzera gets the monastery and oof. Oh, this is painful for the Brazilian as the Colombian manages to find a way to finish a 16-point city out city out of nowhere, like in the end of the game. Like, how do you do how do you do that? Yeah, this is Quite disappointing for the young Brazilian. Well, but let's see how they manage to gather their strength and recuperate mentally and see if they manage to put up a fight in the decider. The incomplete seed features are counted and Salva managed to accomplish 115 points during the game only. It's a lot of points. It's typically more points than in the entire game. And they just managed to accomplish 115 scoreboard points only. But like these high, poor, high point scoring field fest is just... It's, it is the thing that makes South American Carcassonne so entertaining. Over 140 points plus 23 win for Salva. Just a dominant performance in this game. Not without the help of the tile deck, but uh, certainly some very nice field moves too. So we have our equality over here. We're going to persist with the decider. So that's actually, I'm already going to wait until they start. In the meantime, let's see how Ed is doing. Uh, oh! So who actually won here? We have a tie between Pechitos and Ed Shaman. But who was first? Let's look at the game replay. And... Ed Shaman was first, which means that by the rules of the tournament, since it's a tie, they lose this game and the win goes to Pechitos. 
that would have been an interesting game to follow. But all this means is that Colombia is now also on the scoreboard. Brazil won, Colombia won. Okay, so let's see. S. What was their name? Esceptor. Aha, uh -huh, they're still playing their second game. No, Renard Freire managed to get their first win for Team Brazil, so they are also playing another decider. But as I said, a promise is a promise. We will go to uh, Felzer. We will continue watching that match. But they still haven't started, so why don't we check how Vinny's doing? They are in the middle of their decider. Against Sergio Antolines, and it looks like Sergio is not in a very good position, as Vinny is again 13, 15 points ahead on the scoreboard with an equal number of meeples. Well, let's see what's going on there. Well, well, well. I can see a massive hole in the center and a critical tile that is just waiting to happen. So, Red has a uh, six-point road and an eight-point monastery. And if they're going to get the one remaining road monastery, they're going to get extra monastery points. And they're going to get two meeples back. This would be huge. On the other hand... Vinny, the play with the green meeples, has this farmer for six points. And if Dremcat draws the monastery tile, he'll think twice before putting it over here because this will merge all the fields and then green will have a majority on a 15-point field. Which now makes me think. The ideal scenario for Vinny is that like Vinny gets a monastery but very very close to the end of the game preferably like on the penultimate move so that he goes over here or the last move for that matter he goes over here scores the eight monastery points merges the two fields so he gets the field majority and Dremcad gets the two meeples back but doesn't have the time to use them so that's the nightmare scenario here for the Colombian player and not one that is at all unlikely to happen. But even we forget about nightmare scenarios, I mean, how do we overcome 16 points on the scoreboard? Well, we will come back to that a little bit later. I just want to... I just want to have a look at this game too. I'm just experimenting, okay? We're trying to do different streams different in a different way. And um, this time maybe let's just kind of have only a brief look once in a while at this game because we know what the position is. We're just waiting for the monastery to be drawn as um, Dramcad trying to block Vinny Lesser, but Vinny instantly gets a tile which almost liberates his city. I think honestly, like if... If Vinny gets just a couple more points on the scoreboard and a meeple back, it won't even matter who exactly gets the Road Monastery tile. So we're a difficult, difficult position here for Dremcad, despite all the many Monastery plus Road points that they may have. And uh, they're now drawing Monasteries, not many places to put them. So we will now be focusing more attention on this game as... The young Brazilian player plays really fast. Typical Brazilian early farmer. Of course they would drop it over here. Drop an early farmer. And then later expand the field with their monastery. Now it does indeed look like a farm with a lot of potential. Three points for the road. Plus eight points on the scoreboard. And a slight advantage here for the play with the Black Meeples. Salva. Beautiful move. Not finishing his road, but indirectly continuing his road in such a way that also bothers a little bit this square. Felzer makes the only legal move, which is to slightly ruin their city, but also add two more points. And by ruin their city, I mean probably literally turn it into a ruin, an unfinishable city. 
So now as Falceta, exactly very smart move. He's incentivized to understand that this city is unlikely to be completed. So he's trying to make it so that this monastery also won't be completed. So it's even worth spending a move and like adding an extra point to his monastery just to make sure that this trapped city and this trap trap monastery score a roughly even number of points at the end of the game. The monastery is going to be worth 8 points. The city is worth 6 points, but we add a couple of tiles over here. It's going to be 8 or 10 or 12 and possibly even more. Salva finishes a 5-point road, starts a city, almost equalizes on the scoreboard. Felcera gets a fantastic tile for 2 points on the right and also pre-finishing his loop looking to get a curve and get four more points in the future salva gets a city cap will he finish his city he does sounds like a wise move but it creates some volatility in the position as it creates an excellent seven point monastery spot and whoever draws that seven point monastery first will in fact enjoy the advantage felcera finishes the road but does not meeple this piece of shielded city and I don't like it. I know that meepling this shielded city is dangerous because it's sort of kind of easily blockable but I don't like leaving these sort of juicy tiles to your opponent so early in the game. So now Salva can go either here or here and uh, have a very good chance of Finishing the city for eight points and maybe even later dropping a farmer. I would probably go even here. I think it's a strategic mistake. I think this mistake will cost the Colombian player the game. Because he's connecting to a six point ruin way too early. It's not an important feature on the board. And especially, look at this, he would have had his eight point city. So Salva, yeah, this was the game right there. I think the Brazilian player will have it just because of the sequence. This tile could have gone over here and Salva could have gotten eight points and a meeple back and a meeple on the new city. That's just it. You can see that the black player He's using his opportunities. He got the four-point monastery. He used the four-point monastery. The six-point, the eight, the seven-point monastery. Ah, uh, I'm confusing numbers the same as colors. I need to rewatch Sesame Street ASAP. Seven-point monastery. Basically, the Brazilian is using his opportunities, and especially now, look at this. Just because of this one mistake, it has so many consequences. Salva started a city in a subpar position, but now the city became vulnerable as Felcera not only manages to attack the city and reduce its point scoring potential, but also drop a farmer and attack the uh, main field, which is not a big field at the moment, but it has potential. Felzer is now scoring three points and trying to create some vulnerability here. Imagine if this square gets blocked, this would be tragedy for Red. So Red needs to draw some city tiles ASAP. Dorito over here, city cap here, city cap here. Felzera is the one to draw the city cap first, expands his scoreboard lead to up to 10 points, but Salva gets a curve enough to finish his monastery. But this also expands the field. And this is not something that favors the player in the red with the red meeples. Well, first of all, because Felzera has already drawn more farmers. But second, because like overall in the field fight, the player with the long-term meeple majority has the advantage. And speaking of long-term meeple majority, red has two meeples blocked, whereas black has one meeples blocked. And also red has like a vulnerable meeple here as well. There are two tiles remaining that, that, remaining that fit into this square, but it will be some time before Salva draws one of these two tiles. 25% of the time he never draws one of these two tiles. And... Um, Black will, of course, also be attempting to block. Well, the block is unsuccessful. 
But Black still got something out of this because uh, it's too long to explain. Just trust me that like it was a good thing for Black, the sequence. There was a small win there. Well, Salva, at least to their credit now, did their due trying to reduce the impact of the Meeple Disadvantage. They blocked the Black Monastery quite wisely, but another monk is coming back soon to Felzera's hand. Only one curvy tile until Black gets nine more points on the scoreboard and a Meeple back. Well, at the very least, Salva gets a fantastic tile that connects him to the Ruin, to the six-point Ruin that he chose to invest a Meeple into, and with Tempo, he can they can get a farmer, and probably soon enough they will be connecting them to the field. Felzera is a bit conservative here, but not meepling anything, not the city cap, not the road. They decided they can do it later, and now Salva has a choice. Do they go over here and clean up the city cap? They say no, they just decide to get an immediate field connection. But overall, it seems that it's really black who should find a way how to fight for the field so black tries to create an attacking platform against the red city but it's double-edged because on one hand black could get like a curvy tile and really annoy red but if red gets a city cap before that then red's gonna get a uh, city cap get eight points drop a farmer and be one step closer to connecting so the city cap is indeed drawn by not by red but by black and black chooses I think a little bit prematurely is if you ask me to not score four points but instead to try connect to the farm I think it was a bit unnecessary I would have preferred four points over here then another four points over here but instead I mean he spends two city caps just fighting for a nine point field and there are some scenarios where really Salva can win without the field, even though they're currently behind on the scoreboard. They could just finish the city. They could get some city caps. Oh no, they could get a couple of Doritos and finish a city like this. But that's not going to happen because Felter is the one with the Doritos. And I assure you it's going to go right there. A 10-point city is being threatened. And what does the Colombian player do about that? They could ignore it. They could just hope that they draw the Doritos themselves, as there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3 Doritos remaining. So it's really too risky to leave that city alone. As red, we have to attack this at some point. This some point, maybe not now. Uh, maybe instead we would just want to go over here and meeple this 5-point road, and then just try to get back uh, at black on the scoreboard. Honestly, this is doable. If only the Black Meeple stays here long enough, then this might actually be okay for the Colombian. Oh, in the meantime, Vinny won with one point against Dremcad. So, who drew the monastery? I'm not actually quite sure. So, it does seem that we missed something quite spectacular. Uh, and it, it is indeed, it was Vinny who scored this... Uh, 18 15 point field yeah just a beautiful beautiful sequence oh 18 point field and he also drew like dropped an insurance farmer here to get a super majority on the field that gave him all of that so i presume then it must have been dremcad who drew this tile given that it wasn't a complete blowout but congratulations to vinny for winning such an important duel as salva still thinking what to do with that curve i will be updating the score as we speak. If Felzera manages to win this game, and it looks more likely, then Brazil will win this match and will likely and will still stay in contention for um, the semi finals. Two wins. Two wins is basically what most of the teams need. Or one win and good tiebreakers. But in some situations, two wins is not enough. It's like really... Th these tournament tables can get really, really convoluted. And uh, a lot of things are happening. Let me check on the third game in the meantime. So that was Esceptor. 
They are still playing the decider against Renan Freire. Both players equally weighted at slightly over 400. And with 30 tiles remaining, we have a very equal game here. Well, except that the Brazilian has a massive advantage in this little mini battle. Because look at this. Red Meeple blocked for one point. Green Meeple also blocked, but that's for like 10 points. This could be decisive in the end, especially as Renard manages to connect to the main field, or at least in all likelihood they will manage to connect to, main, to the main field. There are two red farmers over here, there will be two green farmers over here, so the number of points on this field won't even matter. So, um, still many things that can happen. As Septor could possibly block this square, block this square, and this is exactly what they're trying to do. And Renard doesn't draw a defense, so they should be a little bit nervous. And wait a second. There are no starting tiles remaining. So, if a Septor draws a city tile, then suddenly this blocked meeple could cause a lot of pain for the Brazilian. In the meantime, Salva decided to drop a farmer in quite a productive, uh, in quite a creative way, I have to say. Scored four points for the city. Still, it looks like it's a massive advantage for the Brazilian because still Dorito tiles here. And whilst there are still Dorito tiles available, when Fertera draws a Dorito tile, it will always be possible to finish the city and drop a farmer and create threats of reconnecting to the field like this or like this. So it's almost like there is no way to win. But Black just chooses to go all in on the field and with perfect timing as he also gets a splitter to get his 8 points for the city back and also some field points. It does seem to me that this game looks like it's going to belong to the Brazilian and then there, there's only so much that Salva can do. Well, actually, I can see what Salva can do. They can score points here. They can draw crossroads and score points here. That's nine. They can draw one of the two tiles that go here. That's also some, some scoreboard points. Then they can go here, drop a farmer, equalize the field and like edge it out by one point or something like this. In the meantime, they're thinking. I don't think they shouldn't. Four points on the scoreboard makes perfect sense. They're in a difficult position. They need to get any point they can get. And Felcera draws one of the two tiles that Red needed and plays, I think, a really strong move. Just tries to create a super majority on the field. Making life exceptionally difficult for Salva. Like, how do you solve this? Because you have to fight for the field, but you have to get now two extra farmers, but you don't even ha you have only one meeple in hand. So maybe you really try like block this square, block this square, block this square, and then somehow connect this guy and then connect somebody else. I don't know. I think there's like a slim 2% chance or something. Let's see if Salva finds a way to create some problems for the Brazilian in this game. In the meantime, we have a very interesting uh, development here with a game, uh, with a critical square in the game with Renard Feire and Esceptor, as Esceptor did not get a tile that goes over here that blocks the square. Instead, they just decided to drop another insurance farmer. But this is all that Renar wanted. Renar can absolutely win without this field. This field is not huge. It's worth 12 points. He has like five points lead on the scoreboard plus this lead on the city point. And this is more than enough. Well, actually, it's just enough to keep the advantage in this game. So it does look like Brazil is almost looking to a clean sweep. In the meantime, in this game, Felcera uses a tile to com connect to the main field. Black now has a 4 versus 3. No, 4 versus 2 majority, actually. So, yeah, so this is like 
classical Brazilian win. Finish some features, get meeples back, and then just drop farmers everywhere. Like, Carcassonne is easy. You just drop farmers everywhere. Lots of agri agriculture, everybody can eat, lots of stuff. And it's and nobody gets obese because it's farming, so it's healthy food. Look at this. Look at how much these um, farmers are producing. I'm going to tell you how much. One, two, three, four, five, six cities are being served. So that's 18 points. Plus this little guy is make sure that the seventh city is taken care of. And this little guy is just there on standoff. Just in case he needs to join. He needs to join. He needs to go here. He needs to... Don't be greedy. How greedy can you be? Well, I mean, this kind of it kind of gives a chance to Salva, like it gives an actual chance to Salva. Like, why would you do this? Because if Salva were to draw the right combination of tiles, then maybe I don't know what's remaining. Maybe there's like a way to go or uh, to uh, tie the field from here. Or maybe there's a way to tie the field from here, actually. Actually, there literally is a way to tie... No, there isn't. One, two, three, four. No, there is... Yeah, there isn't. There isn't. There isn't. I was thinking, like, initially of going over here and dropping a farmer and hoping to connect like this to make sure that there's a four to four parity on the field. There just aren't any tiles remaining to do that. So he just chooses to take the highest point... The highest scoring um, move um, they can get and be okay with a defeat. Point. So this is just being sadistic, like rubbing it in, saying, I have a complete control of the game. I can allow to give you an extra farmer but this will be not enough for you to win, but but you can't win because you have nowhere to get your four farmer into the game. GG, or the long version, good game, saying Salva scoring six points for the road up top. And... Well, actually, wait a second. So, no, it was a mistake, I think. Because there was a way to get into the field. So, uh, Feltzer is playing with fire just for the sake of getting three points. Uh, this does not hurt him as the field majority is just enough to secure an eight point win. Great performance by Feltzer, not only propelling his team to a victory, but also having two victories in two duels in, uh, I, th I believe, their first ever team tournament. Correct me if I'm wrong. So we have to congratulate Team Brazil, and this gives us a lot of intrigue in the tournament situation, because now, as it stands now, I still haven't seen what's happening in the Chile versus Peru match, but Brazil, Colombia, Chile with one win each but there's still one game left which is important for the tiebreakers tie six tiles remaining in Esceptor versus Renan Freire and look at what happened Renan Freire just out of nowhere managed complete to this huge city for like 18 points out of nowhere this is amazing Carcassonne is a game of surprises, and it certainly helps if surprises go your way. As Scriptor scores quick points for the road, it will be nowhere near enough. Even though it looks kind of close-ish, because look at this. Red farmers, three red farmers, versus two green farmers. And this field is mid sized it's like worth 15 points, but 15 points will not be enough. Because in addition to Renar's score lead, they also have this one mini battle. 10 points for a block thrown versus 2 points for a block thrown, and this should just be enough. Red draws a farmer for 6 points. Renar manages to get a beautiful road. Oh, and also equalize the field. Oh, look at this. Look at this. And now this farmer sneaks into the field. 
I mean, the Brazilians and, and their farmers is just so beautiful. As a city dweller, I feel inferior. Like, we all are just work our desk jobs and having bad postures, whereas farming, that's the way to be there out in the sun and win Carcassonne games. As Septor adds two points to the city up top, this will be nowhere near enough. We'll see the exact point difference soon enough. As... One of the debutants for Team Brazil manages to secure a fourth match point for their team. Plus 29. So congratulations to Team Brazil, commiserations to Team Colombia, but all is not lost. It will really matter who is going to win the final game of the group stage, which is going to happen <laughs> at midnight UTC, three hours from now, almost three hours from now. <laughs> Why did I sign up for a stream this long? No, no kidding. I'm enjoying this. I still have energy. Like, the, the 30 minute break helped. Hi Gustavo, hi Ivan Tarakanov. Oh, my... Hmm, interesting, my phone's a little bit... Behind on messages. Alrighty. Uh... Let's go to other matches. Uh, before we do that, just a quick reminder to meeple the like button. It is very important. And also subscribe to this channel if you want more competitive Carcassonne content like this. This also matters. And if you want to show special appreciation, then I've just recently enabled the super thanks button for those of you who can afford it. That, of course, would also be massively, massively appreciated and help with the development of this channel. So, we need to have a look at Peru versus Chile match. Wait, I need to check the lineups first. Just wait a second. Uh, so, how is our tournament Discord doing? Mm. So, Peru versus Chile. Nari versus Claudio Jorquera. Claudio Jorquera won two versus one. So that's one for Chile. RBVS versus Adan Las Eras. Adan Las Eras one, that's two for Chile. Sparkle Horsey versus Telborn. Sparkle Horsey one. Wait, was that an arrangement that there's going to be play three versus three? Uh, I think this was like a weird thing with Peru versus Chile. That they actually, at least that's this is what I see in the lineups. That they actually were going to play three versus three. Yes, indeed. Uh, I would be cu curious to hear from if, if anybody on the tournament organizers uh, who is watching this, why exactly three versus three and not five versus five? I think there was some mutual arrangement that made it difficult for some of the players. But interestingly, so it is in fact Chile that won this encounter two versus one. And uh, I'm going to update the score about that real quick. And we'll have a look at some other matches if they're still ongoing. Wait, where's my score? Up top. So Brazil, Colombia, four versus one. And Peru versus Chile, one against two, with Chile winning. A bit unusual. So three versus three instead of five versus five. So how we're doing Mexico versus Cuba. Mexico, Mexico. I have... 
the results right here. So, Samuel Arocha won against Drew HC, two versus zero. That's one for Mexico. Sidmo won two versus zero against Farrell and CU. That's two for Mexico. Lichi uh, lost two versus one against uh, Deathy Kid nine seven. So that's two one for Q so Cuba got on the scoreboard. Daniel Ayala won against Yoni Stark with a forty point difference twice. So that's three three versus one. So which means that Mexico wins and. Vapula 27 won against Mercury. So that's four Mexico, one Cuba. So Cuba at least managed to win one duel, but so far, Cuba, I think, is the only team in uh, Group A which is not on the scoreboard yet. Hopefully, they manage to put up a fight in the other matches. I do believe it now makes it. Either impossible or very, very difficult for Cuba to qualify. But we are going to try and have a look. So, what's up with USA versus Argentina? The USA Argentina is still in progress. So, Let's have a look Admitted versus Hurtu because Hurtu was playing so well. Probably going to be at entertaining. And they are playing a decider, had two close games. I think we have to look at this. And I have a feeling that this is going to decide the fate of the entire match. And. The winner of this game, so if the US wins, I think they guarantee themselves a spot in the playoffs. And uh, not only Americans, but also Guatemalans will be rooting for the US because if, you, if the United States qualify for the playoffs, then Argentinians get fewer points and then it makes it easier for Guatemalans for qualify. So if you are Guatemalan, you should be reciting the Star Spangled Banner out loud at the moment. Admitted has one fewer points than his Argentinian opponent. Herchu gets a curvy tile that brings his monastery closer to completion. Admitted gets a quick point tile. Let's see how exactly he uses it. I see a fantastic option. So, I'm not sure exactly if he has any other plans. Maybe he's just going to score two points over here. But, how about we go over here and meeple this road and then wait for a curve and then get like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven points for a road and at the same time make it harder for red to complete the city. Like, this is an option for black to go over here and just spend his last meeple. There are some other options as well, so maybe Black is thinking about this move, I was going to say, to use this as a field invasion platform and at the same time sacrifice a couple points from this mini battle where Red had a 5 point city and Black and, uh, no, Black had a 5 point city and Red had a 2 point city, but uh, because this square was tied to Black's monastery, Black is getting 2 meeples back and Red is getting only 1 meeple back. Moreover, Hurtu hurt you is gonna hurt you I mean that's that has to be his catchphrase now although I know like in in Spanish it's probably pronounced hurt you or something like this but if you like say it in English it's like if you just pronounce these letters in normal English pronunciation it it, it pronounces as hurt you Uh, well, so far, it does look like a very damaging move. So he lives up to the English pronunciation of his screen name. Two points for the city and a threat of a seven-point road. So basically, he does the thing that Admitted decided not to do, and maybe for good reason. 
because admitted now is has a super majority on this field Herchu gets an excellent seven point road but will that be enough that scoreboard advantage might not be enough given the fact that admitted has one two three four five six seven eight cities on the field and then if Herchu connects over here this field will grow to nine cities which is like 27 points and even if red gets this meeple into the field red will have a minority of meeples two versus three meeples so red will need to find a way how to get in another meeple into the field but red has like also other things to worry about so for example maybe red just has to forget about the field and then try to go over here and like prevent black from finishing this city because i do believe there's there are plenty of city caps still available and as red uh, you really don't want black to finish yet another city because another possible scenario how red can lose this is red really fight hard for the field gets a curve here and then like gets a tile here connects to the field finishes his monastery but then loses because black simply manages to catch up on the scoreboard by finishing this city. So red went the blocking approach, but I don't think that remotely works. Because one, two, three, there are two more vanilla city caps. So there are at the very least two tiles which give black eight point cities and a meeple back and probably the win in this game I don't know about that wait a second wait a second wait a second let me think of, of something I want to count the Doritos one two three four five six seven eight nine so there's only one Dorito remaining so maybe what hurt you could have done they could have gone over here instead and this would be this would have been more of a block but anyway uh, the Argentinian might know something that I don't, which is honestly very likely. And now, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? I have to see two things. One, of course, is four points. That's a possibility. Another idea is that they go over here, they farm, they get a curve, they connect into the field, they get another curve, and then uh, they go over here, uh, they drop a farmer, and then they go over here, and then they win a 4 versus 3 majority on the field. That's certainly an option. Now, Herchu needs to make a big, big decision. Do they want to win on the scoreboard, or do they want to win with a field? I mean, it seems to me that field, the field is, not, is too big not to fight for. I guess like they kind of have to go here and then maybe drop another farmer but at the same time you want to do so many things with that curve you want to put it in, like five different places you want to go here and block this meeple you want to go here and meeple this road you want to go here and drop a farmer you want to go here and drop a farmer and you or you want to connect here so out of all these purposes red chose the one that blocks blacks meeple just in time because this sequence of finishing an 8-point city and dropping a 6-point farmer would have been devastating. Still, nothing has changed about the fact that black still has a super majority on the field. And red needs some creative ways of catching up and catching up quickly. Hi Sergio, commiserations on that final game, but uh, thanks for watching and putting up a fight. Hi Esteban. Oh, so Elias is saying Peru and Chile were indeed 3 versus 3. <laughs> because Chile had two unavailable players and Peru had two unavailable players. So basically they just <laughs> decided that it cancels out. Ah, Hernan with a silent H. That still make it hurt you in English. And also in some dialects of English, like, H is also silent. Especially on this side of the pond. 
But back to this. So, admitted, finishes monastery, fair. The Argentinian player decided that it's time to fight for the field, and he decided to connect. But now, there are two red meeples, and only... And three black meeples on the field, so black still has the majority of a 30-point field. 30 points. It's an obscene number of points. So, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, red decides to draw third meeple. And to connect over here through a straight line. Which is why, if I'm admitted, I'm going here maybe? And drop in a farmer. Let me see. One, two, three, four. Yes! I'm going here, dropping a farmer, because there's a 50 50 chance of me drawing a city cap and connecting like this. Even though there's only a 50 50 chance, I think you still gotta go there. Because if you don't go there, your opponent's gonna go there. And it's also just like a three point field anyway. Because now it seems that the only way Admitted loses is just by losing this field entirely. He has 13 points extra on the scoreboard and he has little bits and pieces like this 3 point city versus this road. So that's 3 versus 2, that's 1, so that's plus 14. This 5 point road, that's plus 19. This 8 point monastery for red, so that's plus 11. And this 9 point city, so that's actually plus 2. <laughs> This is fun. So if black connects, if red connects to the field, black is only plus two. This is kind of precarious. Now they're going to be equal. Okay, and now as admitted, you have to go here and have to drop a farmer. Or you could go here and drop a farmer if there is a straight line remaining. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But there is no straight line remaining. So this field connection is now possible. However, there's still a crossroads. There's one of these guys. So you could go here, drop a farmer. Or you could go here, drop a farmer. This move seems to be rather weak if you ask me. Because it actually only helps red, given that there's still two tiles that fit into that square, if I'm not mistaken. So that's the uh, vanilla city cap and the Dorito. If I'm, if my city, if my tile counting is not off. Again, if red connects to the field, the game will be dead equal. But the red has not connected yet to the field, and admitted has an extra meeple. Admitted does not need to win the field in order to win, he just needs to preserve parity on this field. Will that happen? Let's find out. 45 seconds for the American. Aladdin is saying the score of Chile Peru was Chile 3 Peru 2. But how does that work? Uh, if there's if there was only a 3 versus 3. Like, do basically for the two missing players, do the sides uh, exchange technical wins? Melvin is saying that Cuba had their first victory ever in an international Carcassonne tournament. Yes, we should not downplay that. That uh, the play with the screen named Deathy Kid 97. Oh. So admitted, decided to drop a farmer. Hoping for a curve. But he did not get a curve. Wow, this is so interesting. I think he's going to have it. 
by um, six points. I was just reading the chat and I and I missed this move. It was so interesting, actually. Because he scored three points and pre-built a six-point city. And he also made it harder to connect. I think he actually... I think this was a sequence that guaranteed him the win. It was a very, very strong endgame by the American there. So the field is tied. But because of these little bits and pieces, the three points at the bottom and the three quick points, it says the American who wins over hurt you. Wow. I mean, the Argentinian did their best to come back and they managed to equalize the field at the very least. But this is what happens when there are too many threats to deal with. I mean, he worked so hard. He like blocked the city, built up a ruin, connected to the field, and yet that was still just not enough well anyway congratulations to admitted does this mean that team usa wins this match or not let's find out in a second ah, okay so i'm going to correct this course so it does indeed seem that chile and peru exchanged exchange technical wins for the two missing players so we know that us versus argentina is at least one versus zero so who else is playing kb versus academia academia 47 which is obvious i think reference to uh, a certain russian invented device and look at this the uh Braz <laughs> wishful thinking sorry argentinian player is the one to come out on top here so that's a point for argentina so it says one one next we have Sturgeon versus Sani Blader, where I think, at least on paper, Santiago should have the advantage. And this is, in fact, what happened. They won, uh, but not easily, two against one. So a point goes to Argentina, which means that Guatemalans, who uh, have certain interests of qualifying, should be a little bit worried. What else are we having? Then we're having Wizard Chess versus Big Nacho 610. And we know that Big Nacho is in a good shape. So let's see if the reigning American champion actually managed to do something about their opponent. And they did. Not only did they manage to defeat their higher rated Argentinian counterpart, but they also did that twice in a row. So uh, that's a great performance there by Andrew Naylor, I'm pretty sure. So it's 2-2, two, two, so we're going to have another nail-biter who won the final game. Ali Yu versus Ale Rosario. It is the Argentinian captain, or former captain, I'm not sure who managed to uh, defeat Ali twice, and much to the sh chagrin of uh, <laughs> our Guatemalan viewers, Argentina is the one that wins this match, narrowly three against two. So... Do the, both the United States and Argentinians have two wins in three matches and Guatemala has one win in two matches but they still have two more matches so they could actually just win twice and qualify
So I think that was it. Brazil against Colombia 4 versus 1, Peru versus Chile 2 against 3, which is a bit of an unusual smaller scale Carcassonne match. Mexico convincingly defeats Cuba, but Cuba first time ever on the scoreboard and a nail biter USA versus Argentina 2 against 3. My voice is starting to get, to get a little bit shaky and I still have about 4 hours worth of talking, so I'm gonna take a 15 minute break. And I'll meet you for round 4 where we'll be following Group A games. Group A games only. Uh, I'm actually gonna tell you in advance who that's gonna be. Wait, 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 lineups A. So, in 18 minutes, it's Argentina versus Cuba and Guatemala versus Mexico. And I think I'm going to start with Mexico versus Guatemala because they share a border, so that makes it interesting. Uh, and then I try to have a look at Argentina versus Cuba because we, we already have seen so many Argentinian games anyway today. Oh, that makes sense. Thank you, Elias, for ex explaining the technical reasons behind the score of the bizarre Chile versus Peru match. And all of you, I'm going to see in 15 minutes, just a reminder to meeple the like button if you enjoy this video and uh, follow, uh, subscribe to this channel for more competitive Carcassonne uh, moment like this. And if you can afford it and you enjoyed this extra, uh, I've enabled the super thanks uh, button for those few of you that will also be much appreciated. All right. Thanks for being with me so far. See y'all in 13 minutes.
I wish good things to you who is still watching this. I am still Alexi and we're now in round four of Copa America, a tournament in which nine countries are going to decide between themselves which one is the dominant Carcasson force in the Western Hemisphere. So in round four for the first time we will be showing uh, Guatemala against Mexico but before that a quick recap in what happened in round three. Brazil won confidently against Colombia four versus one keeping their tournament chances alive and Chile narrowly won against Peru uh, even though four players uh, were unable to show up I mean two players on either side so it ended up being a three versus three um, instead of five out of five, uh, Argentina won a, a nail biter against you in the United States with a minimum possible advantage. As a result, Argentina and USA are the two teams with two wins in Group A. Mexico and Guatemala are the two teams with one win, and Cuba so far with no wins just yet. And uh, in uh, Group B, uh, which is not playing in Round 4, they will be playing in Round 5. So Chile, I think, has basically guaranteed... I'm not sure how this worked. I think or like very close to have guaranteed themselves access to the playoffs. And... Um, with two wins brazil and colombia have one win each and it's probably going to be either brazil or colombia who qualifies so we'll be following one of these countries and peru i think they don't have a chance or maybe they have if they oh no peru has a chance if they win against brazil and if colombia loses badly against chile has, I think Colombia, yeah, Colombia, yeah, if Colombia loses badly against Chile and if Peru wins heavily against Brazil. So this is absolutely possible. So there are all kinds of combinations still possible in the tournament. But what matters for this round is uh, Group A, where Guatemala and Mexico will be looking to join. Uh, I, the U.S. and Argentina uh, as the teams which have two wins. So the U.S. is sitting this one out. And uh, um, let's say if, if Guatemala wins, they will have two wins. If Mexico, Mexico wins, they'll have two wins. So they will be tied for first. And both Mexico and Guatemala will be rooting against Argentina in the encounter of Argentina against Cuba, where Cuba will be looking forward to secure their first match win ever on the international scene after they have already secured their first jewel win ever on the international scene in uh, their match against Mexico. That was a 1-4 loss for Cuba, but the, the player with the screen named Def E19 managed to win against their Mexican opponents. So we will be starting with uh, the, I believe, Guatemalan captain, also the most well-known Guatemalan player with a screen named Lacos, who actually has already participated both in the World Team Carcassonne Online Championships, but also in the Carcassonne Champions League recently as well. So they have been around the block a little bit, and then we'll have a glimpse of other Guatemalan players as well. The game has started, I presume. And they were playing against Marco Rivas of Mexico, who of course is a very well-known player uh they have part been champion of mexico and uh, they're very strong in person they've participated in uh, the world championships of carcassonne in 2023 in essen and uh, reached all the way to the quarterfinals i believe okay so a lot of things has happened and the guatemalan player who's playing the red meeples is showing that they're not afraid of anything as they're now currently trying to attack a big city and they're two tiles away from finishing it if they get a triple city over here and a dorito over here this city will score around 20 points for the uh, play with the red meeples this is this is something of course that man and Rory will try to prevent but at the moment it is the mexican who is the first on the scoreboard has three shiny yellow meeples in hand and uh, 
enjoying the four points from the recently finished city over here and now an extra four points from the little piece of city next to the monastery um lakos in the meantime makes an excellent blocking move there's only one tile remaining that fits into this square and uh and still it's possible to trap this meeple here so an excellent find by the guatemalan also early farmer also making this monastery square a little bit more vulnerable mana rory doesn't seem to care about this city that much instead finishes their city up top and i think the logic of marco here is that he actually doesn't care that much if Leiko successfully finishes his city because he has gained so, so much compensation already. Well, Lakos gets an excellent tile, the quadruple city tile. Not only is he able to get a second meeple in, but also this means that Yellow does not get an attacking platform. So he's very, very close to achieving his objective. And now looks that this achievement of such objective would be necessary as Marco has 25 points on the scoreboard and Lakos has only zero and Mana Rory also not only keeps racking up points, but he also creates an attacking platform against uh, this city by Lakos. And he keeps scoring and scoring and scoring. This is just daunting. Well, finally, the Guatemalan gets on the scoreboard, gets some meeples back. Man and Rory probably going to finish their road, or maybe they can do something more creative, like score two points over here. They just simply choose to finish their road. And start a new city. Why not? Why not just start a new city? Okay, overlay. Of course, thank you for reminding me. Yes, 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 yes. Of course, I forgot to remove all that stuff. This is what I typically do. It's very, very easy to remove. It's just uh, being absent-minded. Well, anyway, you see the game now. Before that, you were enjoying uh, the radio broadcast. And I was saying all along like how Lakos was trying to build all the city. And look at what Marco's doing now. I mean, this is just filthy. Not only he was like 25-0 ahead on the scoreboard, now plus 30-something ahead on the scoreboard, he's now also managed to equalize the city. This is just so painful if you're the Guatemalan play. But if you're Guatemalan play, you should not resign. You still have a field. And you can still draw both tiles that fit into this square. Or technically, technically, you know what can also happen? Let's say Marco gets one of the two triple city tiles and goes over here. Then one of the two players can get a city cap, go over here, and then get a Dorito, go over here, and try to sneak into the city through a tube. And then get a boatload of points with the Meeple majority. Well, uh, Leiko still fighting, trying to build a city on the right. He's now going to get his 8 points for the city on the right. And he also blocked Manarori's city on the right at the same time. Manarori probably going to in respond in kind. There's a move that blocks both of these monasteries. That's very strong. So there are no tiles that fit into this, into this square, which means that these two red meeples are not going to see the light of day. Also, both players are going very fast. This is quite uh, entertaining. But because they're getting quick point tiles and quite... Um, easy tiles to play... Yes, thank you for the roast craft, Yuraf. I, f I f hope everything's okay now, Guillermo. <laughs> yeah, you see, so Lakos kind of plays this move. It looks like it's sort of kind of saving that square, but not really because there are no tiles that fit into that square anymore. I mean, normally there would be, but they all have been used up.
So, Mana Rory. Dropping a Farmer. For 6 points. Strong. Lakos trying to build a 4 point loop. Strong. Lakos gets the tile that I was talking about. Ah, it's a pity, it's a bit too early. It fits nicely over here, and it could have been a platform for like a hypothetical invasion by someone. But it's not just gonna it's not gonna work. Now speaking of invasions, man, I really could actually drop a farmer here. Yeah, I like this. It's very, very efficient. I mean the Mexican has just been so precise in this game. And also I like that he basically ignored the city for such a long time and ended up, well, at least preventing its completion anyway. Okay, so the Guatemalan gets the first of the two tiles that fit into the square. At the very least, they manage to prevent Man and Worry from completing the city easily. So that's something. And they get the second tile and then they get to block the square completely. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. So at the very least, the Guatemala will be enjoying all these points for this ruin and all these points for these monasteries. And the Meeple advantage, and he's gonna drop a farmer here, trying to reconquer this field for 9 points, also creating an opportunity to get 6 points for the city and a Meeple back. Hey, like, this is actually gonna be close. Lakos now reconquers the field, so it's worth 9 points. Mana Rory gets the tile that would have fit into the square, but the Guatemalan has wisely already blocked the square, so it's not going to be relevant anymore. I presume that he's just going to get one point for the city exactly. Hmm. Just a simple tile dumping move by Lake Cause. Yeah, not much they can do. I guess they can just go over here for a six-point field, but that's something. That's not nothing. And there's not going to be a high scoring sequence unless I'm missing something. Well, they thought they found something. Ah, Monastery with the road, that's why. So they can place it over here and score like 7 points for the Monastery. Okay, that's rather wise. So they knew that there were Monastery tiles remaining, that's why they didn't drop Farmers. It is a bit of an unfortunate sequence because maybe if they drew the Monastery before, they could have scored 3 points here, and then if they drew this Monastery instead, they could have scored 8 points, and then if they drew the Curve, they could have gotten a Meeple back, so... There were still chances for the Guatemalan, and I believe that they actually will come reasonably close. Like within 20 points, 15 points, something like that. Well, let's have a look. Oh, actually, it's even closer to 10 points. I mean, very difficult position for the Guatemalan. You have to give them credit for putting up a fight. It was a quick fight, though. 13-point difference. And uh, it is the more experienced player who takes this game. Ah, uh, yes. Screen bigger, of course. Okay. Fernando saying sh to show Lord Troopers game uh, will do at some point. And even if I don't, I'll do that in like, um, yeah, I, I can do that even if they finish early because we can just look at the replay as well. Okay, let's actually ha continue with this duel because this lasted only 12 minutes. I mean, that was so quick. I barely had time to update the score, so one for Mana Rory. Wait. Oh yeah, Lord Troopers playing against... Uh, but that makes sense. Okay. Alright, then we're gonna watch somebody else. I'm too impatient. Let's watch Illusions. 
they're finishing their third game against Pichan 1 9. Because I just want to focus on the. Uh, I just want to focus on the Mexico Guatemala match for starters. Okay. So, two tiles remaining, and it is the Guatemalan player who has 29 points extra on the scoreboard. Uh, she has some zero point farmers which seemed to have failed to enter the main field, but is that even necessary for her? That might be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight cities on the farm. That's a 24 point farm. But that still shouldn't be enough. Because on top of the 29 points on the scoreboard, she has a meeple. Oh, wait. Uh, I kind of forgot whose farm that is. Because it is the Mexican who is green. And he's now onto the farm. I mean, it's so difficult to follow. They're playing so, so quick. Just enjoy the visuals of the map with holes in it. Okay, so I see one, two, three, four red meeple. Four red meeples. And one, two, three, four. And, and four green meeples. Okay, so it's a tied farm. Which means that the Guatemalan player will win by a mile. And even if that weren't a tied farm, she would still win because of this and because of this. I have no idea what happened there, but... Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> 140 points. I mean, this player is on fire today. He's gonna cross the 300 threshold pretty soon. Because they already won their um, duel against... I forgot against whom it was. So. One mini point for Guatemala. And let's go back to Lakos's game. Let's see if they even started. I'm pretty sure they did. They started two minutes ago, which means that the game is probably halfway through, which it is. Like in two minutes, Man and Rory somehow got 24 points, which is um. Yeah, a very, very large number of points for two minutes. That's 12 points per minute. That's a lot. If I were to score 12 points per minute in Carcassonne, I mean, I wouldn't need to practice ever. So, Emmanuel Rory is now getting more points and more points and more points. The play with the Red Meeples made a kind of weird move. I... I wonder why they did that. They must have their reasons. Maybe it has to do something with field blocking, but it doesn't matter as Manorori drops another field. They have 18 points on the board, which is why... Mmm, interesting. So Lakos drops yet another farmer. It looks like it's going to be a big field fight, and this is exactly the Guatemalans player's chance, because... They are 18 points down on the scoreboard, which is like an unpleasant number to be down. But if they can only create enough big features and enough swings in the game, it's a, it's a number that can be easily overcome. Also, one needs to remember that there are all six monasteries still in the game. And there are some juicy monastery spots remaining. Like uh, here, here next to this one so it will be in fact possible for players to score points in such a way that gives a meeple back as well so like us yes let's go over here and meeple the city let's try to let's try to take over the city it didn't work last game it might work this game I am obviously rooting for the Guatemalan player, but only because if the Guatemalan player wins, then, it's, then there's going to be a decider. And if the Mexican player wins, then the duel is going to be over. So, 
Lycos is dropping a monastery, but it's not just dropping. It's actually is a pre-block. This is very, very smart. Look at this. All four starting, starting tiles on the board, which means that the idea of Lycos is to get a Dorito and put it like this so that this meeple becomes permanently trapped because there would be nothing that could go into this square. That is his idea. This is excellent uh, recognition of um, the peculiarities of the tile runouts. Lyco starts another city. Oh man, Rory now is going to make a painful, painful move. I mean, painful for the play with the red meeples. So not only does he get to score four points, but he also it makes it harder for a red to finish the city. There's only one tile left to fit into the square. Red is absolutely looking forward to that tile. But also red needs one of the three tiles that fit into this square. Well, he gets it. Okay, now we're talking. Now it's a game. That was a quick resolution of a coin flip, but I don't think it's going to matter because Minor Rory is already 22 points ahead on the scoreboard. He has a city which builds very nicely upwards and which is very difficult to reach. Lycos has a little bit of something something going in the opposite direction on the board, but it is going to be only an 8 point city when it's completed. Both players have 3 points only on the main field. Man and Rory with a temporary meeple advantage. Lycos is going to get his meeples when he gets the toilet fit into this square, but when will that happen? 12% of the time it will happen never. Maybe sometimes it happens kind of late. Ooh, that's a bit... That's really, really impatient. I mean, he gets to the field, but to sacrifice your last meeple like this, it does seem pretty premature because there will be other entries into the field and in such an open position, you just can't sacrifice your last meeple this easily. Manorori gets a straight line, um, gets a uh, curve. He is going to try and block Lycos, but he does that in uh, a way that allows Lycos to get away with this and get his city tile. And suddenly he's only 14 points behind on the scoreboard. He has the control of the majority of the field. It's not that easy to get into the field. Well, 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 but Mana Rory now finishes the city up top. It's a very, very wet board and complete volatile game. Plus 30 for Mana Rory, but Lakos still has two tiles that fit into this square. If he gets that tile and then somehow manages to disallow field entries, this is an excellent spatial move here. If he manages to disallow field entries, so he now kind of working towards that, scoring four points. If he disallowed field entries, he can actually win this. So Mana Rory, will he now risk it? Will he go for Ninja Farmer? Or will he go for something like this maybe? So that he can have like three point Farmer insurance and then maybe try to connect Actually, like this move is pretty interesting. Well, he doesn't do it. He just goes for the regular ninja. No, he goes for loop. Man and Rory is trying to win without the field. He does not want the farm. He just wants the quick points. And now he gets three points for one round, three points for another round. And again, he's up plus 30. Complete the ruthless aggressive point scoring, but it is now Lycos who gets the critical tile and the big medium-sized city is completed for 20 points. Lycos is only 12 points behind on the scoreboard, but he's ahead on the farm for four versus three. And now Manorori will need to do something about this because the farm is worth one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cities, which is 24 points. But it seems to me that Manorori is going to field this route. He has 12 points extra on the scoreboard. He has 5 points here and 7 for the monastery. So actually, the game is dead even when it comes to scoring. But Lycos has the extra meeple. And if he can manage to use that extra meeple productively, this will be a win for Guatemala. OK, 
Okay, I can't, I, I can't zoom out any further, it seems. Wow, and Mana Rory gets the Monastery and it is huge. It is six extra points and he's going to get a Meeple back. But Lycos gets an extra city on the farm, which gives him extra four points for the cities and three points for the farm. That's seven. It's going to be so, so close. <laughs> Mana Rory is now ahead one point, if I'm not mistaken. Lycos. Should Meeple a four-point road? Excellent choice. And now Mana Rory is trying to connect to the field. Lycos does not get a defense. Instead, he just finishes his road. And will Mana Rory connect to the field? Not yet. So far, he just scores four quick points. That's three for the road, one for the monastery. Okay, now Lycos gets an insurance farmer. I've lost the point count, but it's super close. It is the Mexican who has the meeple advantage. He now needs to decide, can he win without the field? Or does he just need to score quick points? Maybe he can just get two points here and be okay with it. It seems to me that precise tile calculation is necessary. I cannot do that at the moment, I believe. I can only check curves. Okay, he decides to go the fieldless route. Okay, Lycos is going to... No, 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 you have to meeple this! You had you had to meeple this to get two points. You're gonna have a meeple surplus. That is such a huge mistake by the Guatemalan player. And also with 2.55 on the clock, will that cost him the game? This, is well, this might as well cost him the game. This is just saying no to free, free points at no cost whatsoever. Oh, this could be tragic. I didn't count clearly, but I think these two points might have made an actual difference. I need liquid. Three points for the field. For Lycos, one extra city points for Mana Rory. Two extra city points for Mana Rory. And... <sighs> Who is going to win this? I think Narrow leads the Mexican. I think. Four points is the win, and what a game by Mana Rory being behind on the field and then choosing a fake maneuver, kind of dropping a farm but really scoring three points, and threatening to connect to the field, forcing Lycos into some subpar moves, and as a result, they win plus four, and I think the way for Lycos to win this they actually needed to recognize that there were no further curves remaining and instead of connecting the farms they should have simply scored the four point road and this would have been enough for them to win the game because they would have tied and then uh, a tie is enough for the second player to win the game so very, very close, but just a rushed decision with this curve uh, instead of finding this difficult move of just, of just calmly scoring four points for the road, realizing that there was no field connection here available for yellow. This is what have, um, could have kept the Guatemalan player in uh, this duel. Okay, let's have a look at other games and then we're going to congratulate Mexico on their first match point in this encounter.
Uh, we can look at Manorori statistics, actually. I mean, we can do this right now. It's very quickly. Uh, meeples, meeples, meeples. I know he plays very aggressively, but I also think just because these open positions... Um... Wait, wait. So Manorori statistics. Just like a bit of a nerdy distraction. It's not going to be too... 17.8, so just a usual meeple per game placement, really. Well, like a bit on the higher end. The average is like 17.5. Okay, so... Illusions is still playing her second game against P. Chan. And there are nine tiles remaining and she's ahead again. But this time... This time it is not going to be that difficult for... P Chan because Oh Oh you're here just in time. He completes a gigantic city. Gigantic city and I don't think any amount of farmers will compensate something like that. Or wait. Actually, should I take it back? Because red has a monastery and red has this farmer and this farmer and this farmer. I think we need to do some counting. This gets interesting. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cities. That's 24 minus this guy, minus this farmer, minus this farmer. That's like 18, 19 plus 8, 27. So, Technically, against common sense, it is the Guatemalan player who was ahead one point before this move. She is now behind, uh, but she's now ahead again. Which Meeple the road, meeple the road. So we now establish that Guatemalan players have <laughs> the same problem. <laughs> okay, no, no, not, not there, not there, not there, not there. No, they, she had a win. She needed to go over here and meeple the six-point road because it's okay to let this green farmer into the field because this guy is being controlled. This field is being controlled by two farmers. She came so close to actually winning this. And also the fact that, 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 that she left herself with a meeple surplus just like Lycos did. Also in a game which is incredibly close. Oof. Well, P. Chan's gonna go here for three points. And we're going to see who the winner is. I believe it's gonna be still the Mexican by a couple of points. I believe it's again because of having a meeple surplus. A nine points for the field on the right, 21 points for the main field for reds. Yep, it does look to be exactly that move. P-Chan won with four points and uh, all Illusion has to do, I mean there were a couple of options with this tile. She could have gone here and dropped a farmer. That was already six points instead of one so that she would have won the game like this. Or uh, she could have um, for example taken this curve, gone over here, taken six points for the road and also ate up this uh, green farmer, then this green farmer would lose these three points and then she would also win. So a bit unfortunate for the Guatemalan player, but all is not over because it's one versus one in this duel and we're headed for a decider. Hi Manorori, congratulations on the impressive win and the 
completely cold-blooded calculation with uh, the field points. Kravtiroff is saying, yes, this is true. Their captain has some work to do. They, they play well, but they have to think a little bit just to convert sm small losses, narrow losses into narrow victories. Well, anyway, 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 score updates. And let's just have a look quickly at how Rene Bulsara King o and King Oscar is doing. Actually, I changed my mind. I'm too invested in this. Let's find out later. That's it. Focus on the decider. At least like one game, one duel we'll watch from start to end. So, 0-0 zero, zero for both players. Slight advantage for the Guatemalan and an extremely early farmer. Anticipating the completion of these two cities, saying if you complete these two cities, I, the Red Meeple, is going to get two points. And very strong move by Pichan. I was hoping to see that. It is preventing this guy from completing his city. And also doing a pre-block. Look at this. So clinical. Now two Meeples are tied to this one critical score critical square and it will be quite difficult for illusions to finish her city over here so P Chan now neutralizes the city at the bottom illusions has yet to get on the scoreboard has two meeples let's see if she likes monasteries or not I do so how about we meeple a monastery I am... Okay, that makes sense. It's... Um... No, actually, I prefer this move with the monster, with the monk, you know. But maybe the Guatemalan decides that she doesn't have enough meeples to do that, and she may be right. I, mean, I don't care if I have enough meeples, I'm still gonna meeple monasteries. Okay, so Pichan is, uh, draws the first of the three tiles, and here the Guatemalan finds a defense. This is a fantastic tile for her. Now there are two tiles that, that remaining to fit into the square. Still 75% chance, and one Dorito could go over here. Does she get it? No, she doesn't, but she gets a city cap to start a new city. And now Pichan needs to try and do something about this square. I presume green will place this tile like this, trying to make it harder for red to complete this city. Still plenty of Doritos remaining. Ooh, and Pichan just continues the city at the bottom. I was thinking of something else and Illusions draws a Dorito and now all the game, she'll just be waiting for the tile that goes over here. If she gets it soon, she'll get an advantage. If she gets later, then Pichan will get an advantage because he'll have the meeple majority for a longer time and this will enable him to get more quick points more easily. The Mexican finishes a shared city and drops a farmer with the, with the intention of sneaking it in through here. And will Illusions drop a farmer? For now, she just finishes her city. She's thinking about it, decides against it wants to enjoy the temporary meeple majority a little bit longer Pichan tries to start a road illusions now probably going to place a monastery no decides to go on a farm so uh <clears throat> not only south but also central american players prefer Farmer games. And now actually, I mean, if she's that into farms, how about we just go over there and drop another farmer? Okay, so this is interesting. She, she try, attempts a block. Pichan just gets a new road. And starts a new road at the bottom. I just have to keep zooming out. Triple city tile for the Guatemalan player. Maybe she goes over here 
and tries to attack this meeple. This is what I would do. But instead, she has a different idea. She wants to isolate this little guy and bully him into staying alone in this corner with only three points. Maybe she gets a tile like this later on, goes over here, takes two points, then gets a city tile, and then voila, this guy's trapped. I think this is the sinister long-term plan. Let's see if she's successful. Pichan draws a crossroads, presumably gonna finish his road. Just finish, just decides on the orientation. Now, 20 points on the scoreboard versus 12 for uh, illusions. It's probably time at some point to either start a new city or she decides to really go in on the field. But is her intent dropping a farmer or does she just want to block this square? This square is not really particularly blockable, that's the thing. No, she, oh, she starts a new city. This is interesting, this could actually work. Pichan probably, well, could actually go over here, drop a farmer, get a monastery. But maybe the more traditional move is to go over here and create a monastery hole where three monasteries still fit. Let's see how the Mexican player moves. Another option is to go over here and make it harder for the Guatemalan to continue her city. Certainly all these moves are being considered, I'm pretty sure. It is also nice to see that the viewership is increasing for uh, Guatemala's games. I just need to remind you to meeple the like button. It is important for the algorithm. And of course, subscribe in case you're here for the first time and when you want to see more of this. <clears throat> And for the most dedicated of you, there is the super thanks button. For those of you can, who can afford this, this is also very, very much appreciated. Pichan gets the monastery. As the Guatemalan player tries to harass this green city a little bit, just pure seven points for the Mexican. But this was preventable. I think um, it's simply because the play with the red meeples should have been a little bit more patient, wait, waiting for better tiles, trying to restrict that square. Maybe like for a quadruple city or something like this. Now she has some climbing back to do. Still, two of these tiles that fit into the city could very much help her. Ooh, this move I'm not a huge fan of. She's making it harder for her city. And Pichan doesn't quite get the tile to punish that. So, what are some possible moves for illusions? Maybe here to annoy the city. Maybe here to protect her own city. Maybe here to slightly annoy the monastery. I think she chooses the more effective one. Oh, and now Pichan. I don't like this. I think. This city should have been curved downwards because this would have been completely protected. Because all the three tiles with uh, the city cap and the crossroads are still in the deck. But now, with the right tile run out, illusions can score massively. Check this out. She goes here, blocks the city. Then... She gets a triple, a triple crossroads with a city cap. Goes here. And then she gets this, which I think should have gone here. Well, but now it's his P-Chan who takes advantage of quick points. Okay, but now. Will she go over here? Pre-build the long road. This is exactly what happens. Just don't meeple anything. Great choice. Excellent choice. The Guatemalan player is fighting back as P-Chan is trying to block the square. Presumably we're going to see a blocking attack against the city. Just got to calculate which way to turn the curve. 
Still two tiles remaining that fit into this square. Don't meeple anything. Don't meeple anything. And look at this, just in time as the Mexican player was itching to get 12 points on his scoreboard, a meeple back and a meeple on the new loop road. But instead, he gets 9 points for the monastery and a meeple back and could not be happier. And also, there's now only one tile remaining that fits into this square. So it's a coin flip for the game, essentially. Now Illusions scores 4 points for this city. With one meeple, she can really only do quick points and nothing more than that. P-Chan now has a, an annoying move that he can play. If he goes over here, this really messes with this square. Could also go over here as well. But the reason why I like this move, it's because it also blocks the opportunity of this six-point road. An alternative is just forget about all of that and just go here. So... Illusions continues with the blocking attempt up top. Presumably, presumably we're going to see a defense from P-Chan like this. A defense from the Mexican, just as the Guatemalan was going to block. Double city cap, very difficult tile to play with one meeple, you really don't have that much of a choice. You just have to discard it somewhere and not meeple it. An alternative for red, if red really wants to gamble, maybe she's thinking about sacrificing some points and going here. Okay, I like it. The gamble. Just leaving an 8-point city up for grabs and p chance forced to take it so that Illusion doesn't take it. And of course she would have, but instead she takes a 4-point city. But the Mexican gets another city tile. And this will be enough to complete... Ooh, this city or that one uh, chooses to go for the... Um, Highest scoring one, which makes sense. Illusions gets points and prevent her opponent from scoring a six-point road, but instead he chooses to score a four-point city. Still waiting for that starting tile. Without this start... Wait! Yeah, there's still one. Without the starting tile, there is really no game for the Guatemalan player. Again, very difficult to play with one meeple. Where exactly do you deploy this tile? Maybe one idea is to go over here. Like, pre-continue the city, hoping that you're eventually going to get this tile, and then you're going to put it over here, or something like this. No, instead, I think she just decides to discard it. Which is understandable. P-Chan probably going to either score quick points up top or just chooses to continue his City Ruin while Illusions get the tile that she wanted. And immediately P-Chan picks up the quick six points for the road. This is why playing with one meeple is so hard. Illusions can of course can continue her city, but P-Chan now gets the tile that gets him to finish the city up top. More cities, more meeples back into the hand, more field points, more points on the scoreboard. Well, a little bit of something for the Guatemalan, getting five points for the road at the price of expanding Green's field. <coughs> P-Chan probably going to meeple a monastery somewhere. There is a nice six-point spot on the left.
I like that in a game that has virtually been decided, he's still taking his time to decide on the best monastery placement. Or maybe he has doubts whether the, whether the game has been decided, that's another question. Yeah, I don't think there is a path to victory, but he decides to ensure the farm. Well, Illusions gets the tile that she wanted, but too little, too late. The city is nice. But not enough to overcome the point difference, because she will be getting a meeple back, but there's just not enough time to utilize that meeple. She could consider a uh, three-point farmer. And it depends on whether the tiles that are still remaining in the decks are quick point tiles or something else. She does choose to drop the farmer, unlike the previous game. Which could have ended the duel, but it didn't. The green player gets two extra points on the scoreboard and Illusions gets a monastery tile. Maybe there's something that can be done with that. Possibly four quick points here. Or possibly you just meeple it for seven points over here and bring in this guy into this field. I wonder if there's anything else. I'm not seeing it. Oh, maybe a field attack, actually. But this field is only worth 9 points, so I'm not sure if that's even worth it. She does indeed choose to meeple the monastery straight up. Get 10 immediate points, 7 for the monastery, and minus 3 for this guy for merging the fields. <clears throat> The Mexican is about to find his high scoring move off a four point road right here. Ooh, day's record for concurrent viewers. That's a reminder to me, pull the like button. And uh, an extra city points for the Guatemalan, and this will be quite heavily skewed to the favor of the play with the green meeple. Let's just see the exact point difference. Actually, not that much of a point difference. Oh yeah, I forgot about the field up top. But still, who knows if the Guatemalan gets her starting tile a little bit earlier, then uh, who knows how the games would have panned out. But plus 23 for the Mexican and the duel goes to Pichan. So that's already two points for Mexico. Let's have a look at how the others were doing. So, um, Elias won two times against King Oscar. So this means that Mexico wins the match at least 3-0. Whoops, I did it wrong. How were the other Guatemalans doing? Oh, so Fort Castero won against Samuel Arroche. So Guatemala does get on the scoreboard, which could be important for tiebreakers. And Rene Bulsara is the one remaining Guatemalan. Who uh, just, just lost against uh, Vapula 2-7.
so 4-1 Guatemala wins, but Guatemala not without its chances. First of all, a clean dual win for uh, for Castera, and on top of that, uh, we we saw that Lake Lakos had their chances against Manorori. Illusions had their chances against uh, to put the duel away against uh, P Chan 19. So certainly, it seems that uh, with a bit of brushing up on end game taxes, ta tactics, <laughs> Guatemala has a bright future in international competitive Carcassonne. But we will be moving to our other match, Argentina versus Cuba. Let's see how they're doing. Oh, thanks for pointing out, Glovier, that Red City on the right was nearly completable. Um, yeah, that was certainly a nice idea. How Illusions could have come back. But anyway, so let's look at Argentina. Let's see if they even finished. Okay, we don't have the Argentinian result just yet, which means that the match is still underway. So. Uh, wait, is... The Argentinian player playing their first game? Still? Oh, is the idea that they actually are starting an hour later? Did they change that? Uh, we might watch them. Okay, did the Argenti did Argentina's match even start? This is interesting. Uh, who else was on the lineup? Fugaz was on the lineup. Yeah, no, I think it's just that one jewel which started late. So we're gonna have a look at this. And let's have a look at the decider between uh, Faron, CU, and Fugaza. So uh, the Cuban player won the first game. Oh, nice, rating 4 415. But here it does look that the Argentinian player has the edge, at least on the scoreboard, at least immediately. Well, let's have a look what's going on here. So. Plus 27 on the scoreboard, but a lot of volatility in this position. First of all, Black is threatening the completion of this city for like 18-something points. And there are still two Taws remaining that could help Black do that. But he needs to get them, but they need to get them soon enough. Well, this counts as soon enough. Two quick points for the road. And how many points for the city? I'm too lazy to count. 20 points for the city. Now, this is something. But, of course, still difficult position here for the play with the Black Meeples. As Fugaza has 11 extra points on the scoreboard. Farmer over here. Extra farmer over here. Black still has to make his way into the field while not allowing this guy into the field and then also black has to hope that blue does not equalize this road which at the same time would also let blue into the field in the meantime blue managed to expand his field from six to nine points with this dorito tile and now we realize that this tile is kind of useless for Pharaoh on CU because he will unfortunately have a meeple surplus. Uh, so he waited for this tile just a little bit too long and he will not be able to use his huge meeple advantage. Even though it, the game looks actually pretty close. Because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. This is an 11 point ruin. This ain't nothing. Pharaon gets a very useful tile, which I think goes over here to farm. Oh, but instead he separates the roads, but this also means that the blue farmer gets his way into the main field. And he also doesn't meeple anything, and I believe that... Things are difficult. For the play with black meeples. For the player with five black meeples and not enough time to use them. 
well, let's see how they handle the situation. Maybe Meeple Road somewhere, continue their city. They can technically still enjoy their scoreboard lead, but uh, Argentinian agriculture in this game is unparalleled. Oh, got it. Uh, it seems to me that we will have uh, an extra treat because of the delay of Lord Trooper's game. Don't forget to meeple the road. Yes, of course. Still a massive, massive meeple surplus. Fugazi meeple is the farm and Farion is the last one to draw the city cap to prevent devastation. And what he's gonna do? I mean, could score three points maybe. That's not nothing. And actually, because of this big city ruin, the result is going to be reasonably close. Taking their time, taking three points for the road, and now the points will be counted in this exciting, exciting game. So it looks like the Cuban player will be just a little bit short. Uh, if only this tile was drawn a little bit earlier so that there was time for the play with the Black Meeples to take advantage of his meeple majority but there wasn't and with only three field points Farion CU loses this game with a 16 point difference and we congratulate Argentina on their first or at least as we know, first, sort of, kind of, match point in this duel. So, um, let's do some updates. Argentina versus Cuba. So far it's 1-0. We're going to need to look at the other ones. Guatemala versus Mexico, 1 against 4. Not one against 40, that wasn't that one-sided. Next, 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 who was next? Uh, yeah, Hernan was not playing this one. Let's have a look at J and Z and R. Interesting, somebody who has only consonants in their screen name. J and Z and R, yeah? Uh, am I wrong? Let me just copy this. Okay, this is weird. Uh, let me try another one. Yeah, let me try check his opponents. Okay, so... J and N Z R. Okay, there's a typo. So, very narrowly, they won their first game and they're now playing their second... And no, that's the decider, I think. Because, ah, yeah, look at this, look at this. Three point difference for the Cuban, three point difference for the Argentinian. And now this is the decider, this is the dessert. So, no meeples for neither of the players. Very different picture from last game. And it does look like this one's going to be a point for Cuba, unless I'm heavily mistaken about something. So there's a big field fight going on, but six extra points for the on the scoreboard for uh, the player who, by the way, has 
hitherto won the only ever duel that Cuba has won internationally. So that's a big, big event for them. And that was early on against uh, one of the Mexican players. So presumably this tall goes here. Uh, but uh, let's see. Let's see what's going on. Okay, so red has four point road, uh, eight point monetary. That's 12. So that's plus 18. And then another eight. So that's 26. And then there's some more field invasions. I do believe that green has now the field control with these three meeples. Yeah, look at this. And this guy was trying to invade for this square unsuccessfully because there are no tiles remaining that fit into this square. So it looks like there are a lot of red, red farmers on the boards, but they just don't fit. Well, red has still a chance to conquer the field if only there's a straight line remaining. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are no straight lines remaining. So this meeple will also remain stranded. And JN drew the tile that uh, Deathy Kid would have wanted. I presume we can see, well, one of two moves, either a three point move that just simply. Oh, wait, 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 wait! That's a field entry. I missed that somehow. <laughs> Oh, that is beautiful! And I think that is enough for the Cuban player to win. Th this guy, look at this, this is so sneaky. Instead of getting this um, straight line, he got this back-to-back -back sequence of this triangle and this tile and snuck in all the way right here. Oh, but did he lose in the last move? Because JNCR finished the big city. And of course, the correct move for Deathy Kid was to try and go here instead. So who won this after all? Oh, no. Oh, this is heartbreaking. Due to your last move mistake, the Argentinian won this game by one point. And after this brilliant way of sneaking into the field, through back-to-back -back three tile sequences like this, all the red player had to do was just calculate a little bit, or maybe even not calculate, just realize that he was winning, and simply place a tile over here to prevent the completion of this city. And JNZR just got the right city caps to finish the city up top, and that was enough to steal this game away from the Cuban player. Absolutely heartbreaking, but Carcassonne is a brutal, brutal game. Yes, Elias, Red could have also blocked the farmer as well, so there was another opportunity how uh, Red could have gone with the Dorito tile here and basically prevented the entry of this blue, of this uh, green farmer. That was also another opportunity to win. But it is what it is. You don't get points for almost winning. And it says Argentina 2, Cuba 0. So will uh, Cuba be able to come back from this? It is possible. It is possible. Still possible. So who else is playing? Let's have a look at Big Nacho. Which is actually, uh, I think it's, uh, I think his name is Ignacio. So it's like quite uh, a neat screen name. And uh, it seems to me that they won quite confidently against Do HC. 
So we're congratulating Argentina with a win over Cuba and very good chances of qualifying to the playoffs. But let's see if there are any other games underway. We also need to remember that tiebreakers are important, so it's also so the score matters, not only the overall results. Oh, LP24 is playing against Yoni Stark. Or they were playing uh, and they won their two games against Yoni Stark. So it is 4 0 for Argentina. Convincing performance, but one jewel still left to play. You're asked for Lord Trooper games, and we're getting them. Yeah, so they have already star. No, they haven't. So... I'm not sure what we do here. Do we have any info from the organizers when the Cuban player might be able to show up? Because they are online. I mean, I would want to show their game, but I also want to have a little break as well. <laughs> Oh, cheers. Thanks so much for watching, Ramses, and the, ki and the kind words. <laughs> yes, Craft Giraffe, exactly. The comeback of the day to the losing move of the day. I mean, it's... Uh... Clarkistan is like that. Like, sometimes you gotta learn the hard way. All right. See, we have more Argentinian fans in the chat. I will be. Yeah, I would really want some info. I'm gonna check also the tournament Discord server. Um, okay, Ramses is saying that they have been problems uh, f uh, with electricity for quite a while. I'm very sorry to hear that. So it's. Uh, Hopefully that Mercury is able to join in time. Or not in time, but at some point before the start of the next round. So, what I'm going to do, I know what we're going to do. I really need a break. I'm going to take a break for like 10 minutes. And then see if they started their game or not. And uh, if not, we can just like talk about something. So I'm going to set up the thing for the breaky thing. Let's say 23, 23, 20. Let's make it an eight minute break for starters. Whoops. Let me also make something nice here. Yeah, this is what we're gonna show during break. Okay, that kind of looks pretty, I think. Like this. No. Alrighty, see y'all 
in a few minutes.
I wish good things to you who are still watching this. <clears throat> I'm still Alexi and we're still in round four of uh, Copa America. So here's the situation. Guatemala has finished their match against Mexico, losing one against four. And Argentina has already secured the win against C Cuba, four against zero. The, we're only waiting for the start of um, the fifth duel which has between Lord Trooper and Mercury, which has been delayed due to some electricity issues. So we're just doing some temporary, some temporary um, checks whether whether the actually game is going to start. But I have a suggestion: instead of just monitoring the game for the start of the game. Let's do a bit of uh, game analysis to fill in the time. There's still more than half an hour until the next round. And there was, I heard there was an interesting game between Complex VNH and King Oscar, so we could analyze that. Although, actually, uh, wait a bit. Yeah, was that the first game or the second game? Do let me know though. Yes, removing the overlay, removing the overlay. I know, I know. Um, I'm gonna just assume that is what I'm gonna, gonna be the second game, unless you tell me, unless you tell me otherwise. Against the um, Guatemalan, Guatemalan player with the screen name King Oscar, and the idea is that it was some sort of interesting end game. Very curious to see that. All right, so the Mexican player is to go second, so King Oscar meeples the road. It's usually better to meeple the Mamashu because it just simply gives you more points in the long term. So, for example, now Complex meeples the new city, and this Mamashu would have gotten three more points instead of two. And then now uh, the player with the red meeples can could have meepled this city instead, oh no, this this road instead, and then you can have your cake and eat it too, have both the monastery and the road, so that was uh, a possible idea. Did I remove all the overlays? I think I removed all the overlays. All right, let's go further. Let's not look at the opening too much, mostly at the ending, so the play with the green meeples just drops a farmer early on uh but in uh in the western hemisphere which is which is this is done pretty frequently oh interesting so so green chooses to start a monastery in a way that controls the road simply to not compromise the integrity of his own city an alternative move which i also like would be for green to go over here and um to make his city more vulnerable, but at the same time make Red's city more vulnerable and score more immediate points. So Red presumably now finishes the road. Green finishes the city. Ah! Uh, the first game. So, that not, so we're looking at the wrong game. Okay. Uh, good that we realized that soon uh, enough. So that was the first game. So we need to look at the second game. Also, we just got news that because... So unfortunately, we'll be not able to witness the fifth game because due to the electricity issues, Mercury is not going to be able to attend. So a win by default has been declared for the Argentinian player, which gives Argentina a clean sweep. 5-0. Even though we saw that uh, in one of the duels, a Cuban player came really, really close to scoring another win. Right, Argentina 5 and Cuba 0. Already. But let's keep watching. So, oh wait, no, 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 that's, that's not, that's the wrong game. That's the wrong game. That's the whole point. 
This is the right game. So, the Mexican player here with red meeples, starting with the road pointing upwards, which is the standard opening. And the standard responds by King Oscar. Nice find, but of course, the first city tile goes to red and a, a now equalization of the road by green at the same time creating another attack on the city but a fantastic tile for the play with the red meeples oh let me just actually turn this on and then of course continuing his own city green starts a new city elsewhere and uh, red finishes a city for 12 points. That's an easy advantage. Green tries to build the city up top. Red gets the first monastery. This is, of course, just so um, difficult to play for the play with the green meeples. And presumably that red will now go over here, up top, trying to break green city, which is the canonical move here. Yep, now requiring it not one, but two city caps for King Oscar. However, it's still possible to go over here, start a new city, which is exactly what the play with the green meeples does. Uh, red is now trying to attack another city. And here, let's see. So as green, I think the strongest move is to go over here, create a four point road, create a weak point next to red city. Uh, oh, but connecting to this road is also quite decent. So the idea is that we get a straight line, straight line, curve, and we get this nice long road. So there's actually a very nice find here by the Guatemalan player so far. But we see now how Red managed to very quickly to restrict Green City. There are now only two tiles remaining that prevent uh, its... Uh, uh, there are oh, no, no, only two tiles remaining that allow Green to finish the city. At the same time, while making these all blocking moves, Red was actually gaining points himself. So none of these moves were wasted. King Oscar, of course, gets the connection. Now, presumably, Red's going to go over here to mess with this road. And this is exactly, exactly what Red does. If Green's going to get the points, at the very least, Green's not going to get the meeple back. So uh, green equalizes the city on the right. And red now chooses to try and both harass this meeple. But the real purpose is, of course, to try and block this square. There's really not that much that King Oscar can do about this. So the best move is probably to start a monastery here at the bottom. Uh, and this is exactly what they do, equalizing Black's monastery. After this tile is drawn, only one tile remaining that fits into this square. Now, several options for a Guatemalan here. Could just continue his road or the move which I prefer going over here, making it harder to block the city completely and at the same time creating some sort of an attacking platform against this red meeple. And the one point for the road is the chosen move while red gets a tile that gives him seven points for the road. And at this point, as the green player, I probably go over here trying to preserve the chances of completing my city. Oh, and I think this has to be a mistake. It's not really worth doing that, especially, uh, especially since you're giving uh, red an easy opportunity to get a curve and then another curve and then uh, a five point, five point move. So if I were red, I would just always go here and meeple this road. Whereas if you go over here, then not only do you protect your city, but also if you complete your city, then, you, you, then you're getting these extra three points for the road. And given 12 points behind, it's probably a good idea to bet on the 50-50 that you're gonna get the starting tile. And even if you don't, just having this extra 50% chance is actually uh, quite strong. But anyway, let's continue. Red is starting a new road. Ah, and immediately um, green is taking two points just to shorten red's road slightly and create a sensitive uh, square, basically create a blocking threat. 
next to Red's monasteries, but Red cannot do anything about it. Instead, it starts a new monastery, which makes sense. And now King Oscar has a choice. Either we go here and continue the road, or go here and block the monastery, or go here and um, take back the city meeple. I probably prefer making the monastery block move. But let's see what the Guatemalan player chooses. They start a new city. Ooh, but the but the meeple on the city is what makes it dangerous. Because immediately, of course, this is so easily threatened. There's like four big tiles. No, six big tiles, like loads of Doritos. And basically ten tiles that like end the game right there. So red, of course, going to go over here and block three green meeples with one move and this is exactly what the experienced mexican player does but um now the situation becomes a little bit difficult because king oscar doesn't have a meeple so they need to find a way to get meeples back they do eventually get a meeple back and uh now <laughs> uh yeah elias here decides to block the city after all and maybe leave this... Oh, it doesn't leave this empty. That's interesting. So, a meeple is the city cap. While suddenly it is the Guatemalan player who has the meeples. Unlike the play with the red meeples. On the other hand, still two places where red can get his meeples back. Also, uh, a curve can be drawn. There are still four curves remaining that go into this square. That will give nine points for the scoreboard. And a meeple back to red. And plenty of uh, productive ways to use uh, tiles elsewhere. So uh, King Oscar is now deploying his last meeple to try and uh, connect to this place. It's not quite working out as he does not draw the triangle just yet. Instead, he continues the monastery at the bottom. Red, in fact, was the one to draw the second starting tile in any case, so this city over here would not have finished anyway. King Oscar just keeps building, building. And that's the problem of not having meeples, because you just uh, end up gaining zero points. We could have scored four points, but uh, fortunately for the Guatemalan, the triangle is drawn, and now both sides have one meeple more, and eight and 18 points more. The Mexican gets a meeple back and even scores another road. Alright, see. So, doo -doo -doo, King Oscar scores quick points, which are natural moves. Ah, and now, actually, I mean, if you are the player with the red meeples, you might want to go here and simply attack the city. I think it's not a, such a bad idea at all, and the idea is that we just create threats and force our opponents to run after us. I do think this would be pretty strong, but let's see what the player... Yes, and this is exactly what they do. Wait. Huh. I, hmm. I don't know. I mean... The, the, there, there are two meeples, 23 points extra on the scoreboard. I think it's worth the investment of a meeple just to force uh, the play with the green meeples to chase around. And because there's still three tiles that fit into this square, and this city is really lucrative. So the Guatemalan keeps scoring quick points just to catch up a little bit on the scoreboard. But four points on the scoreboard for the city cap go to the Mexican. King Oscar now continues their road just to prevent Red from invading this road. It was always a threat. Red could have placed a tile over here, then connected with a curve, and then all this effort that has been built uh, by Yellow on this 12-point road would have gone to waste. So that was a nice way to protect it. King Oscar now probably needs to find something really, really radical. And honestly, like a move that I kind of like is just going here and like YOLOing it, hoping for the triple city tile and 
and and uh, and one of the Doritos, or maybe asking Oscar just in order to cook at least something. We just put this towel over here and drop it, and just leave this alone. And the idea that we will be first waiting for a Dorito to place our last meeple on, and then we won the triple city tile. But given that we're 25 point behind, we want some sort of, um, not miracle, but well, well, something uh, really, really special. As we see the play with the red meeple scores nine points at the top near the field. And as, uh, oh, so Green decides to start a city with his last people, which of course is very easily punished. I, I, like the thing why playing with the last people is so hard, it just requires extreme, extreme patience. So you basically stay with one meeple and you gain quick points for crossroads or city caps. And then if you're really desperate, sometimes you might just like drop stuff like this. Um, hoping to get a sequence of good tiles so we could have just gone over here as green and then just kept this tile over there and once we draw a city cap then we place our last meeple because it's a big difference then uh at that point we would have our city which is one tile away from completion instead of two tiles away from completion and the point is while we wait for the city cap uh, with which to start such a new city, we could be scoring quick points for like roads or well, there's a monastery, but that's also a road tile. So when we have one meeple, we really, really want to milk all the possible value out of this. However, let's see. So uh, King Oscar does really seem to just keep building up the city and racking in some points. Uh, it's just the um, meeple trouble which is the main issue as. It's not an issue for Red at all as he scores another city cap for 4 points and extra 3 points on the field making 7 in total. And another quick point move for a 5 point road. This also a nice sequence for quick point tiles as well. King Oscar keeps adding point by point whereas again 3 point road for complex making the difference plus 40. Yeah, I mean, uh, at, at this point, of course, uh, green is uh, making the highest scoring moves every turn, but it just becomes not enough. Oh, so, oh, there we go. That's the cute moment. So now green finishes a shared feature in order to give him back a meeple. Of course, since this finishes both greens and red monasteries, red is also getting a meeple, but Red cannot use the meeple because the only legal move, the only place on the board where one can place this quadruple tile is this city which is owned by Green, so basically Red is forced to help Green and add Green extra si uh, two extra city points. So that's uh, a bit of a consolation actually. Nine point field for uh, King Oscar, that's actually really a nice find the highest scoring move uh, and uh, just to make sure that red doesn't score that field in the future i mean we know obviously that uh, with the tile counter that there were no tiles remaining to fit into that square but it's not something uh, that is so obvious during the game and actually well this is no this is still a very good move because like if we don't score these nine point now we can score them later so this was in fact the highest scoring sequence uh, by the Guatemalan player. Yeah, uh, quite a funny situation where you have so many meeples in hand and yet the only legal move doesn't give you points but it gives the opponent points. As for what we can learn from this game, I think the main part is meeple management and building in risky places. So. Uh, the play with the Red Meeples had quite a good start with the city over here, but Green found a great find with stealing a long road. And the main issue that decided the game was this little piece of greed here. Green started the city in such a vulnerable place that Red was able to use this tile to block three Meeples of Green. 
uh, in one place and at that point simply converting the meeple majority so another win for uh, team Mexico and hopefully this game analysis was somewhat instructive all right I might be streaming with a one minute delay so I'm only now reading the chat uh, yeah, thank you for the kind word, Juan Nazaro. Oh yes, now your screen name makes perfect sense. Ah, oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, right, yeah, you were on the winning side of this, because we're just so focused on the, uh, on the way the Cuban player connected, yeah. Um... Oh, uh, but uh, the, th the thing is, like, I also missed that field connection. Uh, I, well, at least I missed the field connection until he did it. But I think there was no way for you to block that connection anyway. So you kind of had to go for the city, actually. Uh, thank you for pointing out about the mic. Is it better now? Alrighty, uh, well, I hope it's better, but do let me know. It should be. Like, sometimes the sound just acts out. I mean, it was fine for, for a long time. Well, anyway, the next round starts in 15 minutes, and I'm going to make a, another break before that just to prepare the scoreboard and stretch my legs a little bit. If you have any questions about game analysis, do let me know. Also, in case you're new here, do subscribe for more Carcassonne content like this and meeple the like button for the algorithm so that as many people as possible find out about Copa America and competitive Carcassonne in general. This actually works. The algorithm actually works when you do this. Alrighty, so... Mike is fixed. Good to know. On that pleasant note, I am going to go for another break. See y'all in 11 minutes.
I wish good things to those of you who are still watching this. I'm still Alexi and we are now in round five of Copa America, a tournament in which nine teams will decide who is the best Carcassonne country in the Western Hemisphere. We are well into our ninth hour of the stream, which I think is going to be the longest ever. And this is the last series of matches, so who will decide who is going to play in the semifinals tomorrow, last match of the group stage. You can see the standings on the screen. So in Group A, Argentina has guaranteed qualifications, and it actually will be between USA and Mexico who is going to... Well, it's probably going to be USA or Mexico to qualify, but... If Guatemala wins heavily against Cuba, then maybe it is possible for Guatemala to qualify. I think it actually is. If Guatemala wins against Cuba 5-0, ah, uh, no, I think, I think it's just a couple of points short. So anyway, so it's going to be either USA or Mexico, basically the winner of the match, USA or Mexico, qualifies for the semifinals, and we'll be watch following that much very closely. Um, and in Group B, basically anybody can qualify, which makes it so interesting. So Chile, I think, has like almost guaranteed with two wins, but they could lose if Brazil wins heavily against Chile. Brazil will have two points, and if Colombia wins heavily against Peru, then Brazil and Colombia will overtake Chile. On the other hand, if Chile wins against Brazil heavily, and if Peru wins against Colombia heavily, then there will be three teams with one victory, and then Peru will qualify together with, um, with Chile to the playoffs. So all the Peruvians should be rooting not only for Peru, but also for Chile. And as for Brazil and Colombia, everything is in their hands. If Brazilia wins against Chile, then they should qualify, unless Colombia wins heavily against Peru, in which case if Brasilia wins narrowly against Chile, then Brazil could still be out. So it's not just the result, but also the game difference that matter. Basically, everybody should uh, not only try and win this game, win their game but also root against somebody else and that's what makes group b so convoluted and this is why we're following group b first and foremost but we will be looking at uh, mexico versus usa match the next thing uh, after the group b matches let me now remove everything extra from the screen I'm sure you've had seen the standings and we're going to jump into the games. Who are we going to watch first? Oh yeah, so as for Brazil, interesting lineups Peru against Brazil. So in Peru, uh, Sparkle, Horsey, Spacuni and RBVS are kind of core players all experts uh Flipawa and Nari I haven't played against I haven't no, haven't got much info against them and Brazil has um well um uh, Teos Gladiador who was the former champion and who actually participated in the world championship in Essen uh two years ago so very strong, achieved master level, probably the strongest on their lineup. Uh, Rodrigo Amorim and Fausto Baral. Uh, Besson, oh, by the way, the captain of um, the team in which I was playing in the Brazilian team championship. That's another story. So quite a strong lineup from Brazil. I think they're a bit stronger on paper. However, everything can happen. I'd expect a narrow fight. And I actually want to uh, start with the most even of the matchup with a victory with Besson 0, zero against RBVS. So, when I say even, I mean rating-wise. Mm. 
they've started the game just three minutes ago. I think they're both quite fast players. Uh, well, uh, Victor does uh, tend, that's Besson, does tend to think for a little bit longer than I think most Brazilian players. But here we can see some easy move for both, both opponents. Quick points here, quick points there. And as a result, it is the Brazilian player with the uh, Black Maples, former captain of um, the Brazilian team Piratas de Carcasson, who has 12 points on the scoreboard, on the scoreboard versus RBVS's 8 points on the scoreboard. Now the play with the Black Meeples, Meeples and Monastery controlling RBVS's road. And um, overall quite a favorable position for the player with the Black Meeples. Let's actually close all of that. We're not going to need most of that. So. Uh, what's going on over here? Only one meeple in hand for Besson. But the other meeples have been quite well deployed. So this guy now looking to get some sort of straight line to connect to this guy and equalize this road. This person on the three-point road is looking to get something like this to place over here uh, to finish the four-point road and maybe score some city points. Now this is a tricky situation for Besson. Ah, just chooses to place a meeple place a tile near the shared monastery while the Peruvian player sl makes it slightly harder to continue Black's monastery. Actually a very annoying move. Then another problem for the play with the Black Meeples. We now see a lot of problems with Meeple management actually for Black. So I even start doubting this road move now. Maybe instead it was a good idea to wait for a blocking tile like this one and put this over here and try and make this red meeple suffer over here. So the problems for Besson uh, start first of all with meeple management. It will take some time for this monastery to develop. And as we see, speaking of meeple management, the player of the black meeples chooses to place the last one of the black meeples and but gets away with it for now. It gets four points on the scoreboard and the meeple back. So what are we gonna do? Continue the monastery and of course prevent a blocking attack. Oh, but a big tile for the play with the red meeple separating the two roads but as soon as i said that besson got a tile that gave him a meeple back as well plus 10 for the play with the black meeples and somehow this monastery is still surviving now six points and absolutely live rbvs however with the extra meeple advantage and already he has an early farmer over here which is worth six points and quite a lot of potential city here City here, there's one tile that fits into this square, city here, and this could become a 15 point field in no time, but just as RBVS was going to increase the number of the cities in the field by one, the Black Pirates immediately decided to leech from the efforts of this meeple and share all the city points. RBVS. Meeple demolish you for 8 points in a risky way, but in a respectable way. Risky because if Besson were to draw something like this, he could place it over here and make it sure that there are no tile that's left to fit into the square. But respectable because, hey, I mean, it's 8 points and if you can get a Meeple back, it can really make a difference in this game. And also now that I think about this, this meeple is not that risky because if black gets a curve, then black is kind of forced to go over here. But this would mean that red would have more time whilst this black meeple is stranded here. Uh, red would have more time to enjoy his temporary meeple advantage and to maybe try and build around this meeple like this, given that the quadruple crossroads has already been used up 
trying to block the square and making sure that this guy stays on a three-point road forever. Besson continues his city and RBVS does something interesting. That's certainly an unusual block and I think it has something to do with the types of tile that have already been used up. Because all of, th all of these three guys have been out and cannot be used on that square. So that was the unconventional uh, move by a Peruvian player, but can see the intent behind this. Behind this, And very interesting move was over here, where Red was trying to protect this square to basically prevent Besson from drawing a tile like this, scoring six points for the road and also blocking his monastery. Black get quick points, red get quick points, and f and Besson gets a city cap and also tries to complete a city. Well, surely RBVS will try to block, but there's still tiles that go into the square. Three tiles to be exact. Black now gets more city points, frees up his road meeple, makes his scoreboard advantage almost obscene, but still all is not lost if you're RBVS because uh, at the very least there is one more city tile that Red can use over here to gain um, his monastery meeple back and maybe even score a six point field. Red is dropping farmers left and right and this certainly makes sense because this farm is getting quite big, already 15 points, could get to 18 points, this farm is no joke, probably unlikely to be enough to beat uh, the scoreboard lead by Besson but still red is fighting and farming is one of the ways to do this we can see that the black uh, player still hasn't drawn the tile that fits uh, over here because he was forced to use the tile that fits over here to a more important spot in the city so this actually makes this block really really neat even though there is still one more dagger tile that fits into the square. But at this point, the Peruvian just basically has to hope that um, Besson doesn't draw that dagger. Besson starts a ruin for six points. RBVS discards the tile and Besson wins the coin flip, gets four points for the city, four points for the road meeple back and this should be the win now. I can't really see what the Peruvian can do. Well, that's something. That is an eight point move. Four points for the city, three points for the field, one point for the monastery. Then maybe if there's a straight line remaining, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, one straight line remaining, we go over here, we meeple the road for five points. And we finish the monastery, so that is doable. Maybe RBVS should have even considered placing this tile over here and meepling this ruin just so that they can really hope for very good tiles and they get to spend a meeple on every move. So there's still a lot of points that Red can gain. We go over here, we finish a feature, place a meeple on the road, that's plus five. We go over here, finish a feature, place a meeple on the field. That's plus seven. Surely this is what RBVS is going to do. So that's a very neat sequence. And then, uh, of course, there are probably going to be some other ideas here. Besson actually could go over here and just prevent this idea altogether. Because from the uh, black meepled player's perspective, he's not, he does not really need to gain any points. He just needs to prevent his opponent from gaining points. But he chooses the simple approach of simply adding one more point to his road up top. RBVS meeples the ruin. Could have done that a little bit earlier with this tile to have two points more. But this uh, probably won't end up mattering that much. Besson with a divider tile, uh, with a giraffe neck tile. Probably going to meeple a new city, that makes sense, being extra greedy. 
hmm, our BVS can go here and then hope for a straight line. So that would be an interesting move, kind of temporarily adding a point to your opponent, but in reality that would be pre-building a road for yourself. Of course, hoping for a unique tile, but with minus 32 on the, uh, on the scoreboard, what choice do you have? Oh, did I not update the score for Argentina versus Cuba? Uh, no, I, I updated it as 5-0. Uh, the reason why it's 4 versus 0 is because... Um, It's because one of the players, unfortunately, couldn't show up due to electricity issues. Well, oh, RBVS was trying the thing. That was very, very noble of them. Uh, yeah, but they just didn't draw the uh, straight line that would have fit into their square. And uh, despite the Peruvians' best efforts, it seems to me that there wasn't really much that RBVS could have done. And the first game is going to go to my teammates from the Brazilian team, from the Brazilian championship, Piratas de Carcassonne, which scored, which placed third in the National League. Alrighty, what's the final score? Scoring still fields and plus 22 for the Brazilian and Besson puts Brazil on the scoreboard and a step closer to qualifying. Actually, it was only 15 minutes. It was a very quick game. I think we should stick with that if you ask me. Have they already started the second match? Oh, yes, they have. So RBVS is the first one to draw a city tile. Bessons tries to start a city of his own, but the red player responds to that with a farmer. Besson tries scoring a road and uh, RBVS starts a new city, trying to harass Black City, but just in time this tube is quite handy for the Brazilian player. And now he gets a city cap and four points. This is also very useful. The Peruvian creates an attacking platform against Black and also continues a city of his own, but not so fast, says the Brazilian pirate and makes it sure that this useless city tile is connected in the end to this very very useful city tile over here it's quite aggressively is uh, the brazilian player's approach to scoring as he has two open roads this looks like something what uh, the brazilian player melvin Coresma would do but not the majority of brazilian players who are generally quite conservative with roads, but not me, says Besson, and added yet another road tile, this time sticking into RBVS's city, creating an interesting tension point. Oh, this is a big, big tile for Victor, as he will definitely see a farmer. Uh, six points on the scoreboard, completed city, pre-continued road over here, and also a way to invade the field, but a fantastic tile for the Peruvian as well. Mm, eight points on the scoreboard as he separates him from the city and trying to attack uh, the farm. But now Besson with another great tile for a seven-point monastery and an opportunity to re-attack the field later. RBVS continues his city, but at the same time continues Besson's road. But Besson continues his other road and look at how many road points can you have? Yes says the Brazilian player. 
two points for RBVS and the obstruction of the square. It is a combo waiting to happen. Um, Red wants to draw a curve so that he connects to the field and at the same time blocks the square. Marks my word, this is exactly what's going to happen. But now Red is trying to block Black's meeple, but Black says not so fast, trying to defend. The city is still alive and well, only three towers away from waiting to finish. Um... But change of plans. Now Bison is trying to not finish the city, but just expand this a little bit further. Gets two city points, two road points. Decides to not finish his road, keep his road open. In the meantime, two monasteries out of nowhere are appearing for Red. Red's about to get a boatload of points on the scoreboard, but not so fast, is saying Black. He starts a beautiful road again out of nowhere. Like, how are these guys finding these features? That's so smart. That will give him six points in the end. And he was creating a blocking platform against Red's monasteries, but Red just in time drew a tile that enables him to complete one of the monasteries and also start a new city. Besson gets his road points and then some. While I was talking about all of that, RBVS completed the plan of connecting to the field and then, and then making it harder for Besson to finish the monastery and now let's have a look at who this player is okay so that's a conservative player or a reasonable player they just indeed choose to finish a road but an alternative move was placing this tile one tile to the left dropping a farmer and hoping to connect through the outside of a curve they decided they're not going to be reckless besson now continues their city prevent uh, now preparing to finish it and i think they're just one tile short as rbvs of course making it so that Besson will not be able to drop a farmer should they choose to complete the city in the future. Now, actually, the situation looks very good for Red because Red has a boatload of points after finishing this city. And Red has ironclad control over this 12-point field. It's actually something that's like very hard to penetrate if you are the black player but if there is any brazilian portuguese um word that i have learned very early on in my carcassonne career that is invasion and this is what they do with fields field invasions they are going to find a way maybe as Bessoni just drop the city cap over here trying to wait for a Dorito tile with the road in an attempt to like finish the city like this. this is exactly what he does and look at this here's what's gonna happen at some point RBVS is going to like well not now now of course he's going to meeple a lovely monastery for uh, seven points but maybe later if RBVS goes with the road tile over here then Besson will be able to get a curve defend the city drop a farmer and connect through the city this looks like this could happen but not now as rbvs doesn't bother even trying to block instead he wants to finish his monasteries but look at this victor drew the one of the two remaining tiles that were fit into that square and managed to somehow finish his monastery and black Despite all these red monasteries and this red city over here and this red city over here, Black is somehow still 10 points ahead on the scoreboard. Still, I massively prefer red in this position just because red has so many threats. Monastery, city, uh, field control. Whereas Black has, of course, the meeple advantage, but still, this meeple advantage has yet to be used. And there are fewer and fewer tiles remaining to find some meaningful features to be scored. RBVS decides to go for a second field, thinks that one is not enough. I want to have more farms, more agriculture. This is what South American players tend to do. And... Uh... Besson gets four quick city points. RBVS now draws one of the tiles that Besson needed. So now only two Doritos with the road remaining here. Maybe the Brazilian players are starting to get a bit anxious, or at least the Brazilian viewers and the Brazilian fans, as they should. Because it seems to me that Black would need to finish the city in order to win the game. Red doesn't have meeples, however. 
chooses to attack the ruin that is interesting with his last meeple uh, the idea is this, he just simply wants to prevent uh, this ruin from growing out of control. Red is recognizing that he has the lead in the field in monasteries. Actually, the number of points that Red had is daunting. Like, it's 15 points for the monasteries and 18 points in total for the fields. And look at what Besson is doing. This is interesting. He just dropped a city cap on his opponent's field with the intention of... Dropping a city cap and a farmer. It's not going to work now, but I think he's going to go here and drop a farmer like this. This is absolutely his intention. Or, ooh, he instead wants to go for the blocking approach. That's interesting, but I don't like it. It seems to me that, that like a bit of a waste of a move. Because there's still the other side how reds can connect. Okay, Besson tries to connect to the field. Red does not get a good tile to block. Probably has to go over here to prevent Black from getting a city cap and dropping yet another farmer. He does not do that. Oh, and Besson now gets a defense tile. He just needs to find the strongest move. You don't go here. But the move is... No, 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 you don't... Ah, there was a stronger move. He needed to place this tile one to the left... And try to wait for one of the two remaining Doritos, so just he could drop yet another farmer and then finish the city. It seems to me that Victor missed a tremendous opportunity. RBVS just finishing his monasteries, and maybe he doesn't even care about this field. Because he has another field for 12 points out of nowhere, I mean... The Peruvian just has no limits. And wait, but actually, now that I think about this, maybe I criticized criticized Victor a little bit too early because there's still one divider left in, into this game, and now there's now a big, big threat. If Besson gets a tile like this, then he's going to go over here, get a boatload of field points, and can even start a new city. For starters, he just finished the city up top, equalizing on the scoreboard, getting another meeple that he can use, but RBVS probably going to go over here, probably going to finish the monastery, and probably going to get a meeple back, and more scoreboard points. Life is great if you're the Peruvian player. Life is difficult if you're the Brazilian player. What do you do here? Well, you draw the fantastic tile, of course. Now we're talking. 14 points for the city, plus 6 on the scoreboard, and the threat to finish yet another 8-point city if there are city caps remaining. I do believe that there are city caps. Ooh, and Red using this new platform to attack the field. This looks like a strong move. Because Victor can't really do anything about this. Let me count. Wait, but a farmer needed to go here, I think. Because uh, there are these Doritos still remaining, there's two of those. He could have farmed this. He can still farm this, he can go here. He can go here and drop a farmer from the outside. And there's still two Doritos with the road. He can actually win this big field, he just needs to find this. Again, the move is, you go over here, and you drop a farmer. This guy can't connect anymore, really. And then, you get the Dorito with the road. One of the two Doritos with the road. And then you connect through the outside. And win an 18-point field. And then the game. This is the sequence that the Brazilian needs to find. And there are two minutes, which is enough time to do this. Edgar is saying that Brazil, I like how Brazil can line up maybe three teams of five players and all of them are very competitive. I think that Brazil has the largest number of Carcassonne experts in the world. If we just defined experts purely by board game arena terms. One minute 40, again. It does seem that there's only one move that's going to be reasonably played there. 
Although, I'm not sure what's the third tile remaining. I know that there is these two Doritos with the road. But the third tile is... No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Ah, okay. So, it, there was no way to win after all. Because look at this brilliancy here by RBVS. If Besson were to connect to the field with the Dorito, then RBVS would have drawn this tile and would have reconnected. So, it wasn't really possible to win. And RBVS, just to rub it in, gets a tile that gives him a lot of points. Five points to be exact, and I believe this will be a big advantage for the Peruvian player. Great farmer here at the end, and also so many quick moves and rather good moves. I mean, the red player just found this field with one meeple of 15 points just out of nowhere. I don't know how can they think so fast, but apparently they can, and the equalization of the jewel scored by the Peruvian player will come very, very soon. We only need to count up the points, and it ends up being so close. Only plus four for the Peruvian player. Stunning performance, and it is 1-1. <sighs> Let's take a break and I'll remind you to meeple the like button if you enjoy this video. Subscribe in case you're here for the first time. And if you extra extra enjoy this and you can afford this, then I've enabled the suit I enabled the super thanks button, which I would also appreciate quite a lot. Let's have a look at Nari real quick before we come back to these guys. Actually, no, no. I want to focus. I want to make it different. This is just too intense of a duel. Okay, they haven't started. I want to have a look at this player. Whoa! And these guys are also playing the decider. I... Oof. Shall we? Shall we? I mean, yes, we shall. <laughs> I want to have a look at, at them play too. So, uh, the Peruvian player is lower rated than Tewas, but they're holding their own against them. While in this game, it does look to be pretty one sided as Tewas gets a lot, a lot of quick points. Plus 22 Nari, however, starts building a city over here and uh, Teos is just simply spending a move on creating an attacking platform. He wants to join this later but Nari now finds a fantastic six point road. Excellent board vision here by the Peruvian. Teos now also making another strong move with the idea of bothering Nari city and at the same time attacking this shared city indirectly. Both players really striking hard at each other. Nari continues his road to start a new city. Teos now tries attacking, getting one step closer to eating up all these points. Nari gets six points for the road. I'm Things are happening so fast, I barely have time to update the scoreboard, but I will. Ooh, this is interesting. Divider tile. Nari chooses to equalize the city and invest a meeple. And Teos, of course, also very willing to equalize this city. And um, I think with the equalization of that city, the chances of the Peruvian player are really not that great, especially after Teos drew this monastery for filthy, filthy six points. Well, what are we going to do? Nari. Now probably protecting this connection point and starting a new city. Teos now 
can inflict more pain. Yes, and Meeple the Road, not the city. Oh, he, he knows his stuff. This is just so, so unpleasant. I mean, if you're the Peruvian player, look at this. Look at this. You need a city plus road tile to finish this city cap, this city cap, and this city cap. Few things in Carcassonne are miserable at this as 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 this one especially if there's only one starting tile remaining as three starting tiles have already been used up all three barbed wire tiles have already gone out and okay there are four daggers remaining but it seems that it's going to be quite a bit of a wait and nari will be forced to spend this time with just one tile one meeple i mean Yes, Crafty is saying that Teos will finish in two minutes. Yes, I, I do agree. <laughs> then we can watch the rest. As he gets four more points on the scoreboard. And uh... well, let's have a look if Nari finds a comeback. Actually, I do see a route. I mean, he just needs to get. they just need to get a meeple first. And then they're going to be fine. Well, not anymore. My idea for a comeback was that Nari could get a city cap, go here, and draw an extender tile, and win this big city. But now that Teos has this tile, I think he should go instead here. The Brazilian youngster appears to be seriously considering this. No, he chickens out! Come on, Nari, do this, do this, do this. You go here. This is your chance. No, the but ah, how are you gonna win? Okay, Teos. Teos needs to go here. Like it's so lucrative. There is still one giraffe snack which just crushes your opponent. And if Nari now draws this tile as the next move, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to scream. Okay, I don't have to scream, but Nari gets something, they get a monastery. And maybe they have a comeback route that way, but after this, it's so painful. Not only did Teos drew, draw a dagger which Green needed here, he also made it so that it's harder to complete this city and actually yeah there's only one tile remaining to do so Teos gets four extra points nari now i think should really yolo and okay so, so nari's being patient i was thinking that maybe it was time to try actually and eat up the city and this is the intention of the um peruvian player as they do get a meeple back and win at least some coins of their only minus 30 like the game is still winnable um in order to win the game teos in order to guarantee the win the game he needs to go here simply prevent the idea of this guy eating up all this all these city pieces because there's still one dorito that goes here and there's still um, a triple city tile. And there's still a splitter. So it was actually possible, but not anymore as... The 2022 Brazilian champion finds a move to shut down all the efforts of green completely. Oh, that's another painful coin flip that goes to Teos and out of the hand of the Peruvian player. So now, of course, they would have loved to connect to the city, but it's now no longer possible. Teos meeples a monastery, Nari <laughs> draws the giraffe neck tile I'm talking about. Probably should meeple the six point field now because what else are you gonna do? You should get points from somewhere. Teos gets him not monastery points. The play with the green meeples defends the idea of his city. There's still a tile. There's still a tile that fits there. So 
So he needs to try his best as Tails gets more and more quick points. City cap for Nari. Probably gonna use over here just to drop on his farm. Instead he uses it as a defense tile, which actually was unnecessary because there aren't any blocking tiles here, so... Teos is making it just unseemly, trying to finish yet another city. Well, at least he has some decency not to draw a city cap, but of course he has to draw a monastery in order to expand his field from 6 to 9 points. This is... Um... Nope, he does draw the city cap. He does draw the city cap. Of course he does. Uh, Nari finishes his other city, but Theos' city is worth more points. I mean, honestly, okay, so this was actually on uh, on Nari's conscience because should have blocked from the other side, then this would have actually been blocked. But uh, maybe the Peruvian was already demoralized. Just absolutely clinical, clinical <laughs> delivery from uh, the former Brazilian champion. And um, Brazilian Brazil now on the match scoreboard. Let's see what the exact result is here. Yeah, plus 44. This is something else. Well, let's now run, run, run. to our other decider between RBVS and Besson where 20 tiles remain why are they so slow 20 tiles what are they trying to sleep maybe it is getting a little bit later even in the western hemisphere now it is way past midnight so it is the 24th of March from where I'm streaming Okay, let's try and assess this position. The Peruvian player enjoys a 9-point scoreboard lead, and I see a lot of red farmers on the board, and I see fewer black farmers on the board. Especially this guy looks kind of lonely. I'm not sure how he ended up there. Could have been a misclick even, but who knows. No, I don't think that's a misclick. I think this was a genuine attempt to connect through the outside of a curve. Kind of premature if you ask me, but we're just getting into this position. And overall it seems that <laughs> black has it rough. So now there's a bit of a dilemma here. On one hand, black wants to score quick points, like here, maybe three points. But if we score four points here, it is on our opponent's field. And we would be blocking our own monastery anyway. Two of the road monasteries have gone out, and we will need meeples eventually. And one, two, three, four, five, six, there's still three curves remaining, so we'd rather not restrict that square. <sighs> Ooh, pre-building a... City worth boatload of points. This is so interesting. And he doesn't meeple this. I think he actually he should have meepled this. Yeah, he should have meepled this because look at this. There's still three tiles remaining that go into this square. And it's a good enough um, number to actually invest your last people. And then you would have had three tiles to free up your meeple like this. And three tiles to free up your meeple like this. It's six tiles to free up your meeple. It's like, it's quite a good number of tiles. Okay, so Besson is, now gets his meeple, but instead of having a meeple on this city cap, this will be now a coin flip. Okay, it was RBVS who gets this. Not Besson, I kind of forgot. So presumably he's going to go over here. He has to go over here. He has to. 
Oh, wait. A farmer? Maybe that's the way to go. I don't know, but... Now that Red has four farmers on the board, it's... It seems like a waste of six points. Maybe Beston realizes that he needs both the farm and the quick points, but... Ah, uh, it looks so rough. You almost just feel sympathy for... Uh, these players. For the play with the Black Meeples. Well, maybe... Maybe I'm too soon to speak so fatalistically. So how about we get a curve, we go here, we meeple the road. We get two meeples back. And then maybe we can sneak in a farmer like this through the outside of a curve. That is all doable, all doable. The main challenge is to draw the curve as soon as possible before RBVS draws one of these guys places the tile over here and meeple the road themselves. Timing, timing is of the essence. Not a great tile for Bisson as he's forced to discard and RBVS draws the tile which should win them the game. Getting a monastery and meepling a road. Before Bisson can meeple this. Okay, but all is not lost. All we need to do is go here, meeple the road and just hope beg pray for a curve on the next move so that on the next move we get a curve we get two meeples back we equalize the road and then we try to do something something this is exactly what the portuguese speaking player does not being afraid of risk which is exactly how you should be as a person well as a carcassonne player but also as a person not the best tile for Besson. Presumably gonna go here to eliminate uh, an option to score four quick points for RBVS. But he needs them meeples back soon, like the very, very next move. If he doesn't get the curve in the next move, it's over. Well, instead, Besson adds one point to a field he's currently losing. And as a result, RBVS is able to get these extra points, the four points that I was talking about. Oh, finally, Besson gets to complete his monasteries, but he's still behind on the field. So he's... Basically, he's gonna still need to find a way to sneak into this field, and I'm not sure that's still possible. Well, maybe here from the outside of a curve. And that's why RBVS prevents that opportunity, but Besson doesn't draw the tile anyway. The best that he can do is maybe somewhere here or here. Wherever... Wherever it fits best to numb the pain from this impending loss. Two minutes and 15 seconds approximately still left to recalculate everything. All the points, all the tiles, realize the exact point difference with which you're losing. And then place the tile. And nobly face the inevitable demise of all seven of the black meeples. And especially the three of the black farmers, one farmer is too short. RBVS gets a curvy tile, which also completes him a city on the field and adds him an extra three points. Very strong performance from the Peruvian, especially this move, guaranteeing themselves a 100% win, not allowing Bisson to draw back to back curves and connect from the outside, really recognizing the space and uh, 
just inflicting pain on uh, the Brazilians. So a comeback win for RBVS with a 39 point difference and Peru also gets on the scoreboard much to the chagrin of my Brazilian fans. Also curious by the way who of you are rooting for Peru and who of you are rooting for Brazil? I want to know. Exactly, Edgar. Carcassonne needs to be played f um, with as much caution as if you were flying a plane. It's complicated. Well, other players. There are other players and other duels and we need to look at them. So, the highest rated per Peruvian player, a Sparkle Horsey... Nope, not that one. That one. Has already won two games against Rodrigo Amorim. That's a very quick outcome against somebody as strong as Rodrigo. So Peru is two points ahead over Brazil. How is Free Power doing against Fausto Barral? Who is experienced enough to actually have been on the world team carcass or light ship? online championship team while well, they're playing the decider which we're gonna watch and they're just starting so we're in for a treat uh so fausto here with the higher rated 520 but filipawa with the three point roads equalized city so red is doing slightly slightly better Okay, let's see if they know this. The move here, don't go here, don't go here. Nope, not that one. The strongest move actually, actually, is to place this tile one tile down, go over here and meeple this road. And the idea is so that you build a four point loop and you build a long road at the same time. So it's a um, very, it's, it's a well known, opening tactic at the master level it is quite simple but i seen that like players under the level of like 650 really don't use that often or um but yeah uh philly powell chooses to play in a simpler way more conservative way they still were maintaining their advantage up until the moment that fausto took their first monastery and now I would prefer to be the player with the blue meeples in this position any day of the week. And especially on Saturday slash Sunday, especially in the decisive game, probably for the place in the playoffs. Flipao gets a fantastic tile that gives him three points, put them on the scoreboard, but more importantly delays and possibly shuts down the development of the blue city on the right. There are only two tiles that fit into this square, and even if uh, blue gets them, this city meeple looks now very sad. So that's why uh, blue is trying to look for compensation somewhere else starting a new city next to his monastery, trying to be efficient, but Flipao immediately equalizes the monastery. Also, blue is trying to connect to red's road over here, but this monastery meeple is about to cause some problems. So, let's see if the Peruvian player knows their stuff. There are actually several good moves here. I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking four points over here. But a move that I prefer is going over here and meeping the city cap. The Peruvian player finds it just for the sake of uh, shutting down this road connection, making sure that red stays here with a longer four point road versus one point road by blue. And. Um, Fausto here with an enormously difficult situation because the thing with this tile 
is that it also was one of the tiles that he needed in this square. And this meeple looks like it's not seeing the light of day anytime soon, if ever. So he now found a um, strong move just to prevent himself from getting trapped with even more meeples. Tying together the fate of this guy and this guy. But still, blue is at zero points while red got themselves another monastery. So finally we see a couple of points join four bars scoreboard. And Filippo draws the last tile that was going to fit into the square. Which means that this guy is now deceased. Which actually means that I think... I think Fausto connected the city prematurely because he still could have had hope for a splitter tile. But now in case he's getting a splitter tile, he won't be able to save this meeple. So he better hope that he gets a big tile like this very soon, possibly with a shield, trying to develop the city a little bit further. But it is not happening now, just a regular row tile at the moment. Maybe we can go over here, put some pressure on two of these sensitive squares. Instead he chooses to attack the shared city and... Flipao, maybe not counting tiles, choosing to block the square which was already blocked. Or maybe just acknowledging that there wasn't a particularly productive place for that tile. Fausto again with a straight road. Trying to think where to put it. Okay, there we go. So, somebody's rooting for Peru in my viewers. Hi, Amy. And Glovir saying Brazil all the way up. Well, it does look that... <laughs> If uh, Brazil going up depends on this game, I <laughs> I don't know if I would be that optimistic. It def Brazil definitely requires your most devoted support support at the moment, especially as Flipao drew a tile that secured this monastery square. Fausto using monasteries a row tiles. Oh, and misclicked. I'm pretty sure it was a misclick. I guarantee it was a misclick. He meant to stake three points. It's not the most horrible farmer because this farm is actually good for something. And there is a city here that's three points. There's going to be a city here that's three more points. There's going to be up to two cities here, so that's 9 or 12. So, it is decent, but still, I don't think that was the blue player's intention. A better move is, of course, to score a three-point road. But let's see how the blue player manages to climb out of this. I can see a move which goes here perhaps instead he chooses to make a zero point move but i don't think you can afford that he needs to find something more aggressive with a shielded tile possibly just starting a new city here was all right free power gets three quick points again and fausto gets a tile that would be useful here for a couple of points Splitter for the Peruvian. Probably going to take some quick points and further his lead. Decides to turn it the other way. I can see some reasons for that. Splitter for Mr. Baral. Gets in quick points as well, but there's a negative side effect that 
there's this farmer over here for three points but here a counter field for more points is brewing and we see now a creative move from the peruvian player actually really taking control of the game instead of going for four points for this city which is probably what i would have done they actually make a move which i really really like they go for a city threat and at the same time they continue the monastery of course their intention is to go over here and eat up the city which is why uh, Fausto immediately thwarts that idea, make sure that this red farmer cannot connect to the big city and just take away the advantage. But uh, the Peruvian player is doing just fine. They just get another city cap, Meeple back, a bunch of uh, extra points on the scoreboard. And... Uh, Fausto has all these farmers, so that is going well for him. But the thing with the farmers, these are not permanent points. In the last moment, Flipao will just simply drop a farmer somewhere here and connect. The Peruvian player is just, just having no shame. Starting a city attack in such a way that it could be blocked in one move. But he's saying, I don't care. I just want to distract you. I just want to preserve my lead. Oh, he could actually go here and connect like this. This is pretty neat, but actually I wouldn't have done that. I think I would have preferred uh, just cleaning off this city cap. So now, uh, Fausto's trying to block that square. And this reminds me to zoom out. The idea, of course, is to put something over here, up top, and then maybe on the right and maybe here, so that there's nothing possible that Red can put into the square to combine this guy with all of these guys and gain the 15 points from Bestruin. But doing so will require like four more moves and it's just daunting. It's uh, okay, three more moves. But still, it's a lot of moves that you still need to make. Whereas Red keeps scoring quick points and makes a devastating, devastating move. Not only does he score two points, but also he really severely restricts Fausto's field, which was a misclick in the first place and also makes it so that blue is not able to take advantage of this city cap while red can take advantage of this city cap blue is now getting his monasteries finished and red's monastery is finished and now actually kind of enjoys a lot of field points but all this is only temporary as from flip out we'll see a four point move and then a farmer to equalize all of these guys' farming efforts within the next few moves. But Free Power's thinking maybe they have something else in mind. Nope. Go for the natural move. <laughs> they choose the farmer. I mean, this of course is a mistake, but what does it matter at this point? Maybe it does matter. Let's see. Strong move by Fausto. Trying to not only start a new city, but also restrict the square a little bit. And then the future plan is to draw a city cap, score four points, stick in a straight line, make sure that nothing goes into the square. It's as simple as that. Now a blocking attempt by the Brazilian on this monastery. Worthy effort. Which will going to be quashed by the Peruvian. Ooh, and the... Well, this is filthy. Well, actually, I'm not sure about this farmer because Fausto can now go over here and then strand this farmer with three points, strand this farmer with zero points. I mean, later on, this farm will grow a little bit because this guy will join. No, not here. Oh, no, 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 no. I think that was Blue's player chance. 
I think this is sort of like the natural instinct of a Brazilian player. If my opponent drops a farmer, I also have to drop a farmer to tie the field. And very often this is something that's done instinctively and without actually assessing whether your opponent's farmer was good in the first place. But this farmer by red was not good. But... By validating this farmer and dropping a farmer of your own, you made it good. But Faust is still fighting. His idea is to block the square. And it looks like it could work. There's still there's one tile that fits into the square, only the Dorito, because all the four triple city tiles have gone out. So Flipao can't really defend. But if I'm Flipao, I can probably go. I can go here, and start a new city and just create a threat of a ten-point city. With twenty-three points ahead, like you just need to create threats and you're gonna be just fine. Well, maybe, maybe. The Peruvian player is thinking. There isn't a particular strong move that you can play with this tile. Maybe just two points over here and that's about it. But still, some caution is necessary. Another way how the Brazilian player could win is on time. 242 versus 117. What if the Peruvian gets distracted? Who knows? Chooses to take two quick points. Plus 25 for the Peruvian. If I was to get a curve and now... I think... Well, it it's, looks like it's a good move, and I think it is, because it blocks this uh, connection over here. But maybe it was a little bit... How do you say? A little bit too cautious? Because the scoreboard lead is the most important part, and maybe what uh, the player with the blue meeples needed to do is first score these six points for the road first. Because if red scores six points for the road first, that is going to be tragic. And since there is only one tile that remains into the square anyway, maybe we don't even have to care that much about blocking it. As blue, we can just hope that we're going to draw the Dorito tile. Two quick points for the road for blue. Filipao gets a divider tile. Not a very good way, good place to deploy it. Maybe here. Yeah, exactly. Trying to create a city threat. And now as Faust, you need to start just chasing around. It's so annoying. And he chooses not to. He just simply takes four points, as he should. And just hope that Red does not draw a city cap, which he doesn't. Presumably red will go here, connecting the farmers. Or maybe here, Meepling Monastery. The monastery is the choice by the red player, and now difficult decision for the Brazilian. Either we connect to this field, no, it wouldn't be connecting to the field. It would be just scoring six points, then uh, temporarily losing to this field, but then later we could reconnect it from here. Or we go here and do some sort of blocking move if that is deemed necessary. It kind of depends on how many 
city cap there are remaining and what kind. And now I see that there are three vanilla city caps remaining and we kind of have to try and block this. As unpleasant as it may seem, in this case it's actually good to spend a move on blocking if you ask me. Okay, there are two vanilla city caps, but this still does not change my intuition about this. But my intuition doesn't matter. What's Fausto's intuition about this? Chooses to simply take the road points. I can empathize with greed. Oh, but Flipa would have finished their city anyway, because there were many city caps remaining. 10 points extra on the scoreboard. So painful. Plus 23 for Fausto. Okay, now connect with the farm. There is a farm which is worth 12 points, which is shared. So maybe Fausto can still attack it somehow. And keep all these 12 points for himself. Flipao finishes a joint city and drops a farmer which is actually quite a sneaky farmer because it has an idea of sneaking like all the way through here I do believe there are a couple of road tiles remaining to accomplish that actually no I don't think so because there is one curve and all straight lines have gone out. Oh, actually, no, there's not even one curve. So that move by, f well, okay, okay, okay. Let's see, let's see, let's see what can be done here. Just a one point move by the Peruvian. Oh, there is this kind of road tile. And Fausto can probably score some points here or score some points here. It doesn't matter that much. But it will not help him mitigate such a big score difference on the scoreboard. I'm starting to yawn. We are already in the 10th hour of our stream and it's way past midnight on my side of the pond. The Peruvian player is being quite careful with the last move. They don't want to lose by accident. I don't think that's possible for them to lose by accident, but let's see. One and a half minutes on the clock. What are they going to do? Hopefully not lose on time. That will be the most anticlimactic bust out of a tournament ever. Maybe just a modest city point on the right. Or a cheeky field invasion attempt on the bottom. The field invasion won't work mathematically, but at least that could scare your opponent. Oh! That's a nice calculation. So he knew that this sort of tile were remaining. And then they decided to basically try and... Huh. Get um, some city points quickly.
Fausto gets a four point throw at the bottom. And Flippo gets two extra city points. At the bottom or on the right. Chooses to do so on the right. And I believe we're about to congratulate the new Peruvian player with quite the upset against their more experienced Brazilian rival. Fausto will indeed have more field points. But this early misclick, this early misclick here by the player with the blue meeples that puts him so much into the meeple disadvantage, this is what ended up costing him the game. Not such a huge difference, 11 points. But uh, that what happens with accidental early farmers. So certainly a painful loss for Fausto, painful loss for Brazil. And um, as we could see, looks like they've gone immediately offline. Uh, possibly to reel and to heal. But such is Carcassonne. Carcassonne is sometimes cruel and all I need to do is just update the score so it's three for Peru one for Brazil and we just need to have a look at how the final duel has gone because it could matter for the standing still Brazil now needs to hope basically that Colombia lost very badly to Chile but Peru needs to hope that what does Peru needs to hope for? Actually, yeah, Peru needs to hope for the same thing, basically. Okay, so it was actually... So the, we just witnessed a decider for the entire match because actually Kawe won against their against the Peruvian player with screen name Spock Kuhn. So the narrowest of margins. I'm not sure how the tiebreakers are. We're going to look at this um, in a second. So between Peru and Brazil, honestly, like I don't even remember who would qualify. I think, given the narrow win of Peru over Brazil, I think it's actually Brazil that would still qualify if Colombia loses badly to Chile. So it all comes down to Chile versus Colombia. Okay, Victor is saying Ch <laughs> Viva Chile. Obviously, this is exactly what uh, Brazilian fans need. Well, let's have a look. Actually, I need to have the lineup somewhere here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make it slow and deliberate. Claudio Jorquera versus Kilminati Warrior. Oh, that's quite the matchup. Claudio Jorquera won two versus one, so that's one point for Chile. I'm gonna update the score as we speak. So Peru, Brazil, three versus two. Chile versus Colombia, so far one versus zero. Okay, next we have, I'm just gonna look, is the match even underway? I think the match is still underway, so somebody's still playing, I think. Anyway, doesn't matter. Next one, next one, next one we have. Uh, Adan Laceras versus Pechitos. Okay, they're still playing. Perfect, 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 perfect. They're playing their decider and they're about to finish. Two players off similar ratings and the scoreboard looks favorites for looks very good for chile as it does for brazil <gasps> and uh look at this 
The chillin' player is going for a power trip. He's actually trying to connect to the field with the road monastery and moreover he's gonna get it. Uh, just, just look at that. I mean, he was winning anyway, but this is just extra. Ah, uh, I think he was winning anyway. Yeah, they were, they were. What a neat field invasion and completely impossible to prevent. In addition to equalizing the field, they also have the monasteries, they also have the nine point field at the bottom. Yeah, and they didn't even have to equalize the field. The point difference is that great. Plus 42. Plus 42. What's up with these high-scoring games today? So, Chile versus Colombia at least 2-0, which is looking quite hopeful for Brazil. What's next? Next we have GDLK versus D. Well, uh, GDLK is a very strong player. I mean, they are the favorite against almost anybody, and they, in fact, won against Tat and D, so that's at least 3 0. Then uh, Tito Arce. won against the Taliban, so that's 4 0. Well, I didn't expect this. And Vineria. The 2023 Mind Sports Olympia champion lost. So, Colombia got one point, but because they lost 1 4 instead of 3 2, they have the worst tiebreakers. And I believe that it is Brazil who qualifies for uh, the semifinals. So, Chile, three out of three wins, dominant performance. And Brazil, Peru, Colombia all have one win each and Brazil has the slightly better tiebreaker. So at least everybody should be happy that they got at least one win and Brazil should probably be extra happy more than anyone else on the planet at this point for managing to squeak into the semifinals to be in the top four. That is uh, certainly a massive, massive achievement. So... Score updates Chile versus Colombia 4 versus 1. But let's now look at group A. Because Mexico and USA were battling it out for. Uh, battling it out for. Uh, yeah, yeah, the place in the semifinal as well. So who's playing for the United States? Let's have a look. Actually, there's super interesting lineups. It's unfortunate that we weren't able to witness both of these matches, but it is what it is. Manorori versus Wizard Chess. So basically, the battle of two national champions. And Manorori managed to take care of this pretty quickly. Strong performance today. That's one point for Mexico over the United States. I want to do this one by one. So next we have IMD5 versus LEU against strong Mexican player. I think slightly higher rated than their American counterpart. And they, oh, they lost. Again, very quickly, so that's 1-1. One, one. Ali puts the United States on the scoreboard. Then we have, this is interesting, Daniel Ayala versus Mingo. So the former US champion who is playing for Team Mexico now. Well, it has to be a very principled duel. So they were playing against the United States captain and... Look at this, they're playing the decider still. Started 20 minutes ago. 
Oh, and they now have an equal rating. And almost equal on the scoreboard. This is as tight as it possibly can get. 49 for Mingo, 47 for Daniel, but an extra meeple. Mingo just started a new city on the right. She's probably going to finish it. Daniel started a city of his own. Still, the situation looks pretty good for the American, I have to say, based on these farms, which are worth 9 points. Okay, the blue farm here is also worth 9 points, but then this farm is also worth 9 points, so Mingo does have the 9 points extra on the farm. She's now going to get her city, get to Meeple back, but Daniel's attacking this farm, is trying to join. Moreover, if Daniel gets... And Daniel will get the farm. He gets four points. And oh, I actually believe yeah, blue has the advantage. What am I talking about? Well, Mingo does successfully connect to the city. Oh, he chooses not. She chooses not to do it. She must have had her reasons. Daniel. Either gonna go over here, try to block this connection, or maybe go over here, just get three extra points for himself. Or maybe go over here, make it harder for Black to finish her city. Mango gets a monetary, not much use will be getting out of that. Well, perhaps here, protecting her little city piece would be an option. This is exactly what she does. Now, will Daniel go over here and attack Black City anyway? Or will he just go over here in order to finish his six-point road and get a meeple back? Two appealing options. Blue does seem to be in control of this. Just needs to win a couple of crucial coin flips. Chooses to go for the blocking move. Mingo with the monastery. Cannot get a city cap, cannot get his uh, meeple back in any other ways. I noticed that there's still one triple city tile remaining. And this is something that the black player would absolutely love to draw to get the meeple back, but also to neutralize the extra six points advantage that Daniel has in this mini battle. But at the same time, she also needs this tall over here. Ah, no, but it's a different kind of tri triple city. Oh, that's a big draw for Daniel as Minko really, really needed this tile, but instead Daniel draws it and he'll probably put it to some good use. Who knows? Maybe here for just one point, or here for five points. Maybe just drop it in his farm if there are indeed city caps remaining. Uh, so that he could take advantage of said city cap and expand his field. Just choose the five point city, and I think that looks like a good idea. Mingo can't really do much with this tile because it's the wrong kind of dagger needed to get the dagger that fits here, but it doesn't. If only we were, to, we were just to get a mirror image of that, like with a curve pointing like this, would have been perfect. But now, it seems that the only thing that can reasonably be done is some sort of graceful exception of a defeat. Because black needs meeples to score points, and black does not have the meeples.
Daniel decides to rub it in by drawing the tile that can give him a meeple back and a scoring opportunity later. Or he actually might decide to go here if there is indeed a chance uh, for him to finish the city with a Dorito. And there is... Maybe did I, did I miscount the tiles or something? No, I mean the one remaining tile should be the triple C that goes here. So... Daniel should have gone over here, just got an meeple back. I don't get this. Oh, it's a Dorito after all. I must have missed something. But I, I don't see it. Where's that triple city? Why am I so... One, two, three. Where's the fourth one? Oh, okay. Where they're on the left. Yeah, it's uh, a bit of a harder spot. Uh, sorry, it's getting a little bit late, but uh, spectacular finish by Daniel. I mean, he had the game won anyway. Just trying to get that extra Dorito and uh, a boatload of points. It looked like it was equalish for a while and even Mingo had the scoreboard lead for a time. But when we took a deeper look in the position, it turned out there was a very, very difficult position for the player with the Black Meeples. I think the main uh, issue was, ma was mainly with this move with the City Cap. Um, maybe if Mingo were to get a Meeple back sooner, there was a way to somehow come back into this, maybe we attack this field, maybe we attack the other field on the left. Daniel is saying, OMG, this has been so nail-biting, which is completely true. Mingo is saying, sorry guys, which probably means that Mexico won the match, but let's just have a real uh, quick look by... Um, How okay, I, I, I just lost track of my train of thought. I just want to update the score and just have a very quick look at the other matches. Don't worry, we're gonna look at the tournament standings later. Let's just kind of proceed one by one. Plus 25 win for the former US champion who is now playing for Mexico. I'm sure that the Team USA has certain sentiments about it. I'm pretty sure they were trying to recruit him for themselves. Okay. So, Mexico 2, USA 1. How did the two other duels go? We had Complex versus KB and Leechy versus Sturgeon. So, first of all, let's have a look at... Sturgeon. Leechy won against Sturgeon, so Mexico 3, USA 1. So Mexico already is advancing to the playoffs and Complex won against KB, so it's a convincing 4 versus 1 win. Well, congratulations to Mexico, Chile, Peru, and... Argentina. Yeah, because Argentina even was sitting this one out. Argentina, Argentina didn't even care. Because they had guaranteed uh, the qualification. But before we look at any other tournament standings in Group B, I, I will show you the updates. I just want to read the chat and then we're going to look at our final match, what happened in Cuba versus Guatemala. Alfonso is saying attacking the top city with the vanilla cap was quite risky. Yes, I agree. I think that was the deal breaker actually. Okay, yes, it is exactly how I said. Brazil beats Peru by one game. Everything is concerned. We congratulate Brazil as the second semifinalist from Group B and express our deepest commiserations to Colombia and Peru. 
we will check the standings later okay first of all first of all Uh, let's just go over all the Cuba versus Guatemala games. So, because this is also quite important for the championship standings. Oh, look at this. The uh, Guatemalan captain and the highest rated player. I think they're, the Lakos is the captain lost against uh, Faron CU of Cuba. So that's one Cuba, Guatemala zero. Next, we are going to see uh, what else we have. Illusions, the Guatemalan player whom we paid the most attention to today against Yoni Stork. Oh, a clean win, uh, two wins against Yoni Stark, so that's Cuba 1, Guatemala 1. I mean, that was probably such an exciting match, but it's such a shame we can't watch all of them. Staggered starting times. This is what I suggest for next year. Alrighty, but let's keep going. Uh, Folkesteros versus Du HC, and here, oh, this one actually was a bit tighter. And look at this; it had a tie, where the Guatemalan, t where the Guatemalan player had to save the game and then the win in round three oh that's a shame we didn't get to watch that but guatemala gets another point and and then two more kingo star versus mercury oh kingo scar sorry Hmm, two wins and both with exactly 101 points. So this means that Guatemala wins the match. And actually, Guatemala has two wins. And given that USA now lost to Mexico, so both USA and Guatemala have two wins. But does this mean, does Guatemala have the better tiebreakers? That's a good question. So do let me know, do, does, does Cuba or Guatemala has the better tiebreakers? Because this would mean a lot for the championship because... If Guatemala has the better tiebreakers than tiebreakers than the US, that places them fifth in the continent. Just uh, the first uh, team after the semi-finalists. And the final duel. Uh, Deathy Kid 9-7 against uh, Doko GT. And here the duel goes to Cuba. Both of the games go to Cuba. So narrow loss for Cuba. Narrow win for Guatemala. And we'll check, I'll check this final standing in a second. But first of all, we'll have to congratulate the four semifinalists, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, and Chile. Tomorrow, the time... Um, mm. Tomorrow at 1600 UTC, I will be streaming the semifinals, hopefully with a special guest. I'll try to arrange that. There were some technical difficulties today where I had to stream alone. Technical difficulties on my side, of course, as is usually the case. Uh, so Argentina will be playing Brazil and Chile will be playing Mexico. Uh, and then the final at 1900 UTC, that's going to be a separate stream link. Alrighty. 
So final positions, I'm gonna put them up on the screen in about a few seconds. So, here they are. In Group B, Chile, clean sweep with three wins. Uh, and Brazil, Peru, Colombia with one win each. But Brazil with one extra dual win as a result. Their game difference is plus one. And uh, Peru's game difference is minus one. So, turns out that... The tiebreakers ended up really maturing, and uh, uh, this is how it is. And in Group A, the USA is in fact slightly ahead out of Guatemala, and Argentina and Mexico both with three wins out of five. No, out of four. Yeah, three wins out of four. Each lost only uh, one game. But Argentina with a slightly better tiebreakers, ever so slightly better tiebreakers, just one extra point in the game difference. And uh, USA with considerably better tiebreakers over Guatemala. I think Guatemala had one heavy loss against somebody. I don't remember against whom exactly. So Guatemala came with two wins. So on 50%. And they ended up being fourth. So then I think that makes them overall sixth in the tournament, if I'm not mistaken. With two out of four. Uh, the final standings we'll find out soon after the tournament ends, but these are the group standings, and again, the first two teams will be qualifying. Alright, uh, yes, thanks for watching the mega stream, uh, Juan Nazaro and everybody who are here. Uh, so, um, that was almost 10 hours. Uh, what can I say? I'll see you all tomorrow for the semifinals. Just remember to meeple the like button before you leave. And